Section 20 of Lourdes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lourdes by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Visitelli. The Fourth Day. Five. Cradle and Grave. Immediately afterwards, as they descended the steps, Dr. Chassaigne said to Pierre, you have just seen the triumph. I will now show you two great injustices. And he conducted him into the Rue des Petits Fossés to visit Bernadette's room, that low, dark chamber whence she set out on the day the Blessed Virgin appeared to her. The Rue des Petits Fossés starts from the former Rue des Bois, now the Rue de la Grotte, and crosses the Rue du Tribunal. It is a winding lane, slightly sloping and very gloomy. The passers-by are few. It is skirted by long walls, wretched-looking houses, with mournful façades in which never a window opens. All its gaiety consists in an occasional tree in a courtyard. Here we are, at last, said the doctor. At the part where he had halted, the street contracted, becoming very narrow, and the house faced the high grey wall of a barn. Raising their heads, both men looked up at the little dwelling, which seemed quite lifeless with its narrow casements and its coarse violet pargeting, displaying the shameful ugliness of poverty the entrance passage down below was quite black an old light iron gate was all that closed it and there was a step to mount which in rainy weather was immersed in the water of the gutter go in my friend go in said the doctor you have only to push the gate the passage was long and pierre kept on feeling the damp wall with his hand for fear of making a false step it seemed to him as if he were descending into a cellar in deep obscurity, and he could feel a slippery soil impregnated with water beneath his feet. Then at the end, in obedience to the doctor's direction, he turned to the right. Stoop, or you may hurt yourself, said Monsieur Chassaigne. The door is very low. There, here we are. The door of the room, like the gate in the street, stood wide open, as if the place had been carelessly abandoned and Pierre, who had stopped in the middle of the chamber, hesitating, his eyes still full of the bright daylight outside, could distinguish absolutely nothing. He had fallen into complete darkness, and felt an icy chill about the shoulders similar to the sensation that might be caused by a wet towel. But, little by little, his eyes became more accustomed to the dimness. Two windows of unequal size opened onto a narrow interior courtyard, where only a greenish light descended as at the bottom of a well and to read there in the middle of the day it would be necessary to have a candle. Measuring about fifteen feet by twelve, the room was flagged with large uneven stones, while the principal beam and the rafters of the roof, which were visible, had darkened with time and assumed a dirty, sooty hue. Opposite the door was the chimney, a miserable plaster chimney, with a mantelpiece formed of a rotten old plank. There was a sink between this chimney and one of the windows. The walls, with their decaying plaster falling off by bits, were stained with damp, full of cracks, and turning a dirty black like the ceiling. There was no longer any furniture there. The room seemed abandoned. You could only catch a glimpse of some confused, strange objects, unrecognizable in the heavy obscurity that hung about the corners. After a spell of silence, the doctor exclaimed, Yes, this is the room. All came from here. Nothing has been changed, with the exception that the furniture has gone. I have tried to picture how it was placed. The beds certainly stood against this wall, opposite the windows. There must have been three of them at least, for the Subirus were seven. The father, mother, two boys and three girls. Think of that. Three beds filling this room. Seven persons living in this small space. All of them buried alive, without air, without light, almost without bread. What frightful misery. What lowly, pity-awaking poverty. But he was interrupted. A shadowy form, which Pierre at first took for an old woman, entered. It was a priest, however, the curate of the parish, who now occupied the house. He was acquainted with the doctor. "'I heard your voice, Monsieur Chassaigne, and came down,' said he. "'So there you are, showing the room again.' "'Just so, Monsieur l'abbé. I took the liberty. It does not inconvenience you?' "'Oh, not at all, not at all. Come as often as you please, and bring other people.' He laughed in an engaging manner and bowed to Pierre, who, astonished by this quiet carelessness, observed, The people who come, however, must sometimes plague you. The curate, in his turn, seemed surprised. 
indeed no nobody comes you see the place is scarcely known everyone remains over there at the grotto i leave the door open so as not to be worried but days and days often pass without my hearing even the sound of a mouse pierre's eyes were becoming more and more accustomed to the obscurity and among the vague perplexing objects which filled the corners he ended by distinguishing some old barrels remnants of foul cages and broken tools a lot of rubbish such as is swept away and thrown to the bottom of cellars hanging from the rafters moreover were some provisions a salad basket full of eggs and several bunches of big pink onions and from what i see resumed pierre with a slight shudder you have thought that you might make use of the room the curate was beginning to feel uncomfortable of course that's it said he what can one do the house is so small i have so little space and then you can't imagine how damp it is here it is altogether impossible to occupy the room and so mon dieu little by little all this has accumulated here by itself contrary to one's own desire it has become a lumber room concluded pierre oh no hardly that an unoccupied room and yet in truth if you insist on it it is a lumber room his uneasiness was increasing mingled with a little shame dr chassaigne remained silent and did not interfere but he smiled and was visibly delighted at his companion's revolt against human ingratitude pierre unable to restrain himself now continued you must excuse me monsieur l'abbé if i insist but just reflect that you owe everything to bernadette but for her lourdes would still be one of the least known towns of france and really it seems to me that out of mere gratitude the parish ought to have transformed this wretched room into a chapel oh a chapel interrupted the curate it is only a question of a human creature the church could not make her an object of worship well we won't say a chapel then but at all events there ought to be some lights and flowers bouquets of roses constantly renewed by the piety of the inhabitants and the pilgrims in a word i should like some little show of affection a touching souvenir a picture of bernadette something that would delicately indicate that she ought to have a place in all hearts this forgetfulness and desertion are shocking it is monstrous that so much dirt should have been allowed to accumulate the curate a poor thoughtless nervous man at once adopted pierre's views in reality you are a thousand times right said he but i myself have no power i can do nothing whenever they ask me for the room to set it to rights i will give it up and remove my barrels although i really don't know where else to put them only i repeat it does not depend on me i can do nothing nothing at all then under the pretext that he had to go out he hastened to take leave and run away again saying to dr chassaigne remain remain as long as you please you are never in my way when the doctor once more found himself alone with pierre he caught hold of both his hands with effusive delight ah my dear child said he how pleased you have made me how admirably you expressed to him all that has been boiling in my own heart so long like you i thought of bringing some roses here every morning i should have simply had the room cleaned and would have contented myself with placing two large bunches of roses on the mantelpiece for you know that i have long felt deep affection for bernadette and it seemed to me that those roses would be like the very flowering and perfume of her memory only only and so saying he made a despairing gesture only courage failed me yes i say courage no one having yet dared to declare himself openly against the fathers of the grotto one hesitates and recoils in the fear of stirring up a religious scandal fancy what a deplorable racket all this would create and so those who are as indignant as i am are reduced to the necessity of holding their tongues and preferring a continuance of silence to anything else then by way of conclusion he added the ingratitude and rapacity of man my dear child are sad things to see each time i come here into this dim wretchedness my heart swells and i cannot restrain my tears he ceased speaking and neither of them said another word both being overcome by the extreme melancholy which the surroundings fostered they were steeped in gloom the dampness made them shudder as they stood there amidst the dilapidated walls and the dust of the old rubbish piled up on either side and the idea returned to them that without bernadette none of the prodigies which had made lourdes a town unique in the world would have existed it was at her voice that the miraculous spring had gushed forth that the grotto bright with candles had opened immense works were executed new churches rose from the ground giant-like causeways led up to god 
an entire new city was built as if by enchantment with its gardens walks quays bridges shops and hotels and people from the uttermost parts of the earth flocked thither in crowds and the rain of millions fell with such force and so abundantly that the young city seemed likely to increase indefinitely to fill the whole valley from one to the other end of the mountains if bernadette had been suppressed none of those things would have existed the extraordinary story would have relapsed into nothingness old unknown lord would still have been plunged in the sleep of ages at the foot of its castle bernadette was the sole labourer and creatress and yet this room whence she had set out in the day she beheld the virgin this cradle indeed of the miracle and of all the marvellous fortune of the town was disdained left a prey to vermin good only for a lumber room where onions and empty barrels were put away then the other side of the question vividly appeared in pierre's mind and he again seemed to see the triumph which he had just witnessed the exultation of the grotto and basilica while marie dragging her little car ascended behind the blessed sacrament amidst the clamour of the multitude but the grotto especially shone out before him it was no longer the wild rocky cavity before which the child had formerly knelt on the deserted bank of the torrent it was a chapel adorned and enriched a chapel illumined by a vast number of candles where nations marched past in procession all the noise all the brightness all the adoration all the money burst forth there in a splendour of constant victory here at the cradle in this dark icy hole there was not a soul not a taper not a hymn not a flower of the infrequent visitors who came thither none knelt or prayed all that a few tender-hearted pilgrims had done in their desire to carry away a souvenir had been to reduce to dust between their fingers the half-rotten plank serving as a mantel-shelf the clergy ignored the existence of this spot of misery which the processions ought to have visited as they might visit a station of glory it was there that the poor child had begun her dream one cold night lying in bed between her two sisters and seized with a fit of her ailment while the whole family was fast asleep it was thence too that she had set out unconsciously carrying along with her that dream which was again to be born within her in the broad daylight and to flower so prettily in a vision like those of the legends and no one now followed in her footsteps the manger was forgotten and left in darkness that manger where had germed the little humble seed which over yonder was now yielding such prodigious harvests reaped by the workmen of the last hour amidst the sovereign pomp of ceremonies pierre whom the great human emotion of the story moved to tears at last summed up his thoughts in three words saying in a low voice it is bethlehem yes remarked dr chassaigne in his turn it is the wretched lodging the chance refuge where new religions are born of suffering and pity and at times i ask myself if all is not better thus if it is not better that this room should remain in its actual state of wretchedness and abandonment it seems to me that bernadette has nothing to lose by it for i love her all the more when i come to spend an hour here he again became silent and then made a gesture of revolt but no no i cannot forgive it this ingratitude sets me beside myself i told you i was convinced that bernadette had freely gone to cloister herself at nevers but although no one smuggled her away what a relief it was for those whom she had begun to inconvenience here and they are the same men so anxious to be the absolute masters who at the present time endeavour by all possible means to wrap her memory in silence ah my dear child if i were to tell you all little by little he spoke out and relieved himself those fathers of the grotto who showed such greed in trading on the work of bernadette dreaded her still more now that she was dead than they had done whilst she was alive so long as she had lived their great terror had assuredly been that she might return to lourdes to claim a portion of the spoil and her humility alone reassured them for she was in no wise of a domineering disposition and had herself chosen the dim abode of renunciation where she was destined to pass away but at present their fears had increased at the idea that a will other than theirs might bring the relics of the visionary back to lourdes that thought had indeed occurred to the municipal council immediately after her death the town had wished to raise a tomb and there had been a talk of opening a subscription the sisters of nevers however formally refused to give up the body which they said belonged to them everyone felt that the sisters were acting under the influence of the fathers who were very uneasy and energetically bestirred themselves to prevent by all means in their power the return of those venerated ashes 
in whose presence at lourdes they foresaw a possible competition with the grotto itself could they have imagined some such threatening occurrence as this a monumental tomb in the cemetery pilgrims proceeding thither in procession the sick feverishly kissing the marble and miracles being worked there amidst a holy fervour this would have been disastrous rivalry a certain displacement of all the present devotion and prodigies and the great the sole fear still and ever returned to them that of having to divide the spoils of seeing the money go elsewhere should the town now taught by experience know how to turn the tomb to account the fathers were even credited with a scheme of profound craftiness they were supposed to have the secret idea of reserving bernadette's remains for themselves the sisters of nevers having simply undertaken to keep it for them within the peaceful precincts of their chapel only they were waiting and would not bring it back until the affluence of the pilgrims should decrease what was the use of a solemn return at present when crowds flocked to the place without interruption and in increasing numbers whereas when the extraordinary success of our lady of lourdes should decline like everything else in this world one could imagine what a reawakening of faith would attend the solemn resounding ceremony at which christendom would behold the relics of the chosen one take possession of the soil when she had made so many marvels spring and the miracles would then begin again on the marble of her tomb before the grotto or in the choir of the basilica you may search continued dr chassaigne but you won't find a single official picture of bernadette at lourdes her portrait is sold but it is hung nowhere in no sanctuary it is systematic forgetfulness the same sentiment of covert uneasiness as that which has wrought silence and abandonment in this sad chamber where we are in the same way as they are afraid of worship at her tomb so are they afraid of crowds coming and kneeling here should two candles burn or a couple of bouquets of roses bloom upon this chimney and if a paralytic woman were to rise shouting that she was cured what a scandal would arise how disturbed would be those good traders of the grotto on seeing their monopoly seriously threatened they are the masters and the masters they intend to remain they will not part with any portion of the magnificent farm that they have acquired and are working nevertheless they tremble yes they tremble at the memory of the workers of the first hour of that little girl who is still so great in death and for whose huge inheritance they burn with such greed that after having sent her to live at nevers they dare not even bring back her corpse but leave it imprisoned beneath the flagstones of a convent ah how wretched was the fate of that poor creature who had been cut off from among the living and whose corpse in its turn was condemned to exile and how pierre pitied her that daughter of misery who seemed to have been chosen only that she might suffer in her life and in her death even admitting that an unique persistent will had not compelled her to disappear still guarding her even in her tomb what a strange succession of circumstances there had been how it seemed as if some one uneasy at the idea of the immense power she might grasp had jealously sought to keep her out of the way in pierre's eyes she remained the chosen one the martyr and if he could no longer believe if the history of this unfortunate girl sufficed to complete within him the ruin of his faith it none the less upset him in all his brotherly love for mankind by revealing a new religion to him the only one which might still fill his heart the religion of life of human sorrow just then before leaving the room dr chassaigne exclaimed and it's here that one must believe my dear child do you see this obscure hole do you think of the resplendent grotto of the triumphant basilica of the town built of the world created the crowds that flock to lourdes and if bernadette was only hallucinated only an idiot would not the outcome be more astonishing more inexplicable still what an idiot's dream would have sufficed to stir up nations like this no no the divine breath which alone can explain prodigies passed here pierre was on the point of hastily replying yes it was true a breath had passed there the sob of sorrow the inextinguishable yearning towards the infinite of hope if the dream of the suffering child had sufficed to attract multitudes to bring about a reign of millions and raise a new city from the soil was it not because this dream in a measure appeased the hunger of poor mankind its insatiable need of being deceived and consoled she had once more opened the unknown doubtless at a favourable moment both socially and historically and the crowds had rushed towards it oh to take refuge in mystery when reality is so hard to abandon oneself to the miraculous since cruel nature seems merely one long injustice but although you may organize the unknown reduce it to dogmas make revealed religions of it 
there is never anything at the bottom of it beyond the appeal of suffering the cry of life demanding health joy and fraternal happiness and ready to accept them in another world if they cannot be had on earth what use is it to believe in dogmas does it not suffice to weep and love pierre however did not discuss the question he withheld the answer that was on his lips convinced moreover that the eternal need of the supernatural would cause eternal faith to abide among sorrowing mankind the miraculous which could not be verified must be a food necessary to human despair besides had he not vowed in all charity that he would not wound any one with his doubts what a prodigy isn't it repeated the doctor certainly pierre ended by answering the whole human drama has been played all the unknown forces have acted in this poor room so damp and dark they remained there a few minutes more in silence they walked round the walls raised their eyes towards the smoky ceiling and cast a final glance at the narrow greenish yard truly it was a heart-rending sight this poverty of the cobweb level with its dirty old barrels its worn-out tools its refuse of all kinds rotting in the corners in heaps and without adding a word they at last slowly retired feeling extremely sad it was only in the street that dr chassaigne seemed to awaken he gave a slight shudder and hastened his steps saying it is not finished my dear child follow me we are now going to look at the other great iniquity he referred to abbe Pierre-Amal and his church they crossed the place du porche and turned into the rue saint pierre a few minutes would suffice them but their conversation had again fallen on the fathers of the grotto on the terrible merciless war waged by father saint pé against the former cure of lourdes the latter had been vanquished and had died in consequence overcome by feelings of frightful bitterness and after thus killing him by grief they had completed the destruction of his church which he had left unfinished without a roof open to the wind and to the rain with what a glorious dream had that monumental edifice filled the last year of the cure's life since he had been dispossessed of the grotto driven from the work of our lady of lourdes of which he with bernadette had been the first artisan his church had become his revenge his protestation his own share of the glory the house of the lord where he would triumph in his sacred vestments and whence he would conduct endless processions in compliance with the formal desire of the blessed virgin man of authority and domination as he was at bottom a pastor of the multitude a builder of temples he experienced a restless delight in hurrying on the work with the lack of foresight of an eager man who did not allow indebtedness to trouble him but was perfectly contented so long as he always had a swarm of workmen busy on the scaffoldings and thus he saw his church rise up and pictured it finished one bright summer morning all new in the rising sun ah that vision constantly evoked gave him courage for the struggle amidst the underhand murderous designs by which he felt himself to be enveloped his church towering above the vast square at last rose in all its colossal majesty he had decided that it should be in the romanesque style very large very simple its nave nearly three hundred feet long its steeple four hundred and sixty feet high it shone out resplendently in the clear sunlight freed on the previous day of the last scaffolding and looking quite smart in its newness with its broad courses of stone disposed with perfect regularity and in thought he sauntered around it charmed with its nudity its stupendous candour its chasteness recalling that of a virgin child for there was not a piece of sculpture not an ornament that would have uselessly loaded it the roofs of the nave transept and apse were of equal height above the entablature which was decorated with simple mouldings in the same way the apertures in the aisles and nave had no other adornments than archivolts with mouldings rising above the piers he stopped in thought before the great coloured glass windows of the transept whose roses were sparkling and passing round the building he skirted the semicircular apse against which stood the vestry building with its two rows of little windows and then he returned never tiring of his contemplation of that regal ordonnance those great lines standing out against the blue sky those superposed roofs that enormous mass of stone whose solidity promised to defy centuries but when he closed his eyes he above all else conjured up with rapturous pride a vision of the façade and steeple down below the three portals the roofs of the two lateral ones forming terraces while from the central one in the very middle of the façade the steeple boldly sprang here again columns resting on piers supported archivolts with simple mouldings 
against the gable at a point where there was a pinnacle and between the two lofty windows lighting up the nave was a statue of our lady of lourdes under a canopy up above were other bays with freshly painted luffer boards buttresses started from the ground at the four corners of the steeple base becoming less and less massive from story to story till they reached the spire a bold tapering spire in stone flanked by four turrets and adorned with pinnacles and soaring upward till it vanished in the sky and to the parish priest of lourdes it seemed as if it were his own fervent soul which had grown and flown aloft with this spire to testify to his faith throughout the ages there on high quite close to god at other times another vision delighted him still more he thought he could see the inside of his church on the day of the first solemn mass he would perform there the coloured windows threw flashes of fire brilliant like precious stones the twelve chapels the aisles were beaming with lighted candles and he was at the high altar of marble and gold and the fourteen columns of the nave in single blocks of pyrenean marble magnificent marble purchased with money that had come from the four corners of christendom rose up supporting the vaulted roof while the sonorous voices of the organs filled the whole building with a hymn of joy a multitude of the faithful was gathered there kneeling on the flags in front of the choir which was screened by ironwork as delicate as lace and covered with admirably carved wood the pulpit the regal present of a great lady was a marvel of art cut in massive oak the baptismal fonts had been hewn out of hard stone by an artist of great talent pictures by masters ornamented the walls crosses pyxes precious monstrances sacred vestments similar to suns were piled up in the vestry cupboards and what a dream it was to be the pontiff of such a temple to reign there after having erected it with passion to bless the crowds who hastened to it from the entire earth while the flying peals from the steeple told the grotto and basilica that they had over there in old lourdes a rival a victorious sister in whose great nave god triumphed also after following the rue saint pierre for a moment dr chassaigne and his companion turned into the little rue de l'angèle we are coming to it said the doctor but though pierre looked around him he could see no church there were merely some wretched hovels a whole district of poverty littered with foul buildings at length however at the bottom of a blind alley he perceived a remnant of the half-rotten palings which still surrounded the vast square site bordered by the rue saint pierre the rue de bagnères the rue de l'angèle and the rue des jardins we must turn to the left continued the doctor who had entered a narrow passage among the rubbish here we are and the ruin suddenly appeared amidst the ugliness and wretchedness that masked it the whole great carcass of the nave and the aisles the transept and the apse was standing the walls rose on all sides to the point where the vaulting would have begun you entered as into a real church you could walk about at ease identifying all the usual parts of an edifice of this description only when you raised your eyes you saw the sky the roofs were wanting the rain could fall and the wind blow there freely some fifteen years previously the works had been abandoned and things had remained in the same state as the last workman had left them what struck you first of all were the ten pillars of the nave and the four pillars of the choir those magnificent columns of pyrenean marble each of a single block which had been covered with a casing of planks in order to protect them from damage the bases and capitals were still in the rough awaiting the sculptors and these isolated columns thus cased in wood had a mournful aspect indeed moreover a dismal sensation filled you at the sight of the whole gaping enclosure where grass had sprung up all over the ravaged bumpy soil of the aisles and the nave a thick cemetery grass through which the women of the neighbourhood had ended by making paths they came in to spread out their washing there and even now a collection of poor people's washing thick sheets shirts in shreds and babies swaddling clothes was fast drying in the last rays of the sun which glided in through the broad empty bays slowly without speaking pierre and dr chassaigne walked around the inside of the church the ten chapels of the aisles formed a species of compartments full of rubbish and remnants the ground of the choir had been cemented doubtless to protect the crypt below against infiltrations but unfortunately the vaults must be sinking there was a hollow there which the storm of the previous night had transformed into a little lake however it was these portions of the transept and the apse which had the least suffered not a stone had moved the great central rose windows above the triforium seemed to be awaiting their coloured glass 
while some thick planks forgotten atop the walls of the apse might have made any one think that the workmen would begin covering it the next day but when pierre and the doctor had retraced their steps and went out to look at the façade the lamentable woefulness of the young ruin was displayed to their gaze on this side indeed the works had not been carried forward to anything like the same extent the porch with its three portals alone was built and fifteen years of abandonment had sufficed for the winter weather to eat into the sculptures the small columns and the archivolts with a really singular destructive effect as though the stones deeply penetrated destroyed had melted away beneath tears the heart grieved at the sight of the decay which had attacked the work before it was even finished not yet to be and nevertheless to crumble away in this fashion under the sky to be arrested in one's colossal growth and simply strew the weeds with ruins they returned to the nave and were overcome by the frightful sadness which this assassination of a monument provoked the spacious plot of waste ground inside was littered with the remains of scaffoldings which had been pulled down when half rotten in fear lest their fall might crush people and everywhere amidst the tall grass were boards putlogs moulds for arches mingled with bundles of old cord eaten away by damp there was also the long narrow carcass of a crane rising up like a gibbet spade handles pieces of broken wheelbarrows and heaps of greenish bricks speckled with moss and wild convolvuli in bloom were still lying about among the forgotten materials in the beds of nettles you here and there distinguished the rails of a little railway laid down for the trucks one of which was lying overturned in a corner but the saddest sight in all this death of things was certainly the portable engine which had remained in the shed that sheltered it for fifteen years it had been standing there cold and lifeless a part of the roof of the shed had ended by falling in upon it and now the rain drenched it through great holes at every shower a bit of the leather harness by which the crane was worked hung down and seemed to bind it like a thread of some gigantic spider's web and its metalwork its steel and copper was also decaying as if rusted by lichens covered with the vegetation of old age whose yellowish patches made it look like a very ancient grass-grown machine which the winters had preyed upon this lifeless engine this cold engine with its empty firebox and its silent boiler was like the very soul of the departed labour vainly awaiting the advent of some great charitable heart whose coming through the eglantine and the brambles would awake this sleeping church in the wood from its heavy slumber of ruin at last dr chassaigne spoke ah he said when one thinks that fifty thousand francs would have sufficed to prevent such a disaster with fifty thousand francs the roof could have been put on the heavy work would have been saved and one could have waited patiently but they wanted to kill the work just as they had killed the man with a gesture he designated the fathers of the grotto whom he avoided naming and to think he continued that their annual receipts are eight hundred thousand francs thirty two thousand pounds however they prefer to send presents to rome to propitiate powerful friends there in spite of himself he was again opening hostilities against the adversaries of curé peramal the whole story caused a holy anger of justice to haunt him face to face with those lamentable ruins he returned to the facts the enthusiastic curé starting on the building of his beloved church and getting deeper and deeper into debt whilst father saint pierre ever on the lookout took advantage of each of his mistakes discrediting him with the bishop arresting the flow of offerings and finally stopping the works then after the conquered man was dead had come interminable lawsuits lawsuits lasting fifteen years which gave the winters time to devour the building and now it was in such a woeful state and the debt had risen to such an enormous figure that all seemed over the slow death the death of the stones was becoming irrevocable the portable engine beneath its tumbling shed would fall to pieces pounded by the rain and eaten away by the moss i know very well that they chant victory resumed the doctor that they alone remain it is just what they wanted to be the absolute masters to have all the power all the money for themselves alone i may tell you that their terror of competition has even made them intrigue against the religious orders that have attempted to come to lourdes jesuits dominicans benedictines capuchins and carmelites have made applications at various times and the fathers of the grotto have always succeeded in keeping them away they only tolerate the female orders and will only have one flock and the town belongs to them they have opened shop there and sell god there wholesale and retail 
walking slowly he had while speaking returned to the middle of the nave amidst the ruins and with a sweeping wave of the arm he pointed to all the devastation surrounding him look at this sadness this frightful wretchedness over yonder the rosary and basilica cost them three millions of francs a hundred and twenty thousand pounds then as in bernadette's cold dark room pierre saw the basilica rise before him radiant in its triumph it was not here that you found the realization of the dream of cure peramal officiating and blessing kneeling multitudes while the organs resounded joyfully the basilica over yonder appeared vibrating with the pealing of its bells clamorous with the superhuman joy of an accomplished miracle all sparkling with its countless lights its banners its lamps its hearts of silver and gold its clergy attired in gold and its monstrance akin to a golden star it flamed in the setting sun it touched the heavens with its spire amidst the soaring of the milliards of prayers which caused its walls to quiver here however was the church that had died before being born the church placed under interdict by a mandamus of the bishop the church falling into dust and open to the four winds of heaven each storm carried away a little more of the stones big flies buzzed all alone among the nettles which had invaded the nave and there were no other devotees than the poor women of the neighbourhood who came to turn their sorry linen spread upon the grass it seemed amidst the mournful silence as though a low voice was sobbing perhaps the voice of the marble columns weeping over their useless beauty under their wooden shirts at times birds would fly across the deserted apse uttering a shrill cry bands of enormous rats which had taken refuge under bits of the lowered scaffoldings would fight and bite and bound out of their holes in a gallop of terror and nothing could have been more heart-rending than the sight of this predetermined ruin face to face with its triumphant rival the basilica which beamed with gold again dr chassaigne curtly said come they left the church and following the left aisle reached a door roughly fashioned out of a few planks nailed together and when they had passed down a half demolished wooden staircase the steps of which shook beneath their feet they found themselves in the crypt it was a low vault with squat arches on exactly the same plan as the choir the thick stunted columns left in the rough also awaited their sculptors materials were lying about pieces of wood were rotting on the beaten ground the whole vast hall was white with plaster in the disorderly abandonment in which unfinished buildings are left at the far end three bays formerly glazed but in which not a pane of glass remained threw a clear cold light upon the desolate bareness of the walls and there in the middle lay cure peramal's corpse some pious friends had conceived the touching idea of thus burying him in the crypt of his unfinished church the tomb stood on a broad step and was all marble the inscriptions in letters of gold expressed the feelings of the subscribers the cry of truth and reparation that came from the monument itself you read on the face this tomb has been erected by the aid of pious offerings from the entire universe to the blessed memory of the great servant of our lady of lourdes on the right side were these words from a brief of pope pius the ninth you have entirely devoted yourself to erecting a temple to the mother of god and on the left was these words from the new testament happy are they who suffer persecution for justice's sake did not these inscriptions embody the true plaint the legitimate hope of the vanquished man who had fought so long in the sole desire of strictly executing the commands of the virgin as transmitted to him by bernadette she our lady of lourdes was there personified by a slender statuette standing above the commemorative inscription against the naked wall whose only decorations were a few bead wreaths hanging from nails and before the tomb as before the grotto were five or six benches in rows for the faithful who desired to sit down but with another gesture of sorrowful compassion dr chassaigne had silently pointed out to pierre a huge damp spot which was turning the wall at the far end quite green pierre remembered the little lake which he had noticed up above on the cracked cement flooring of the choir quite a quantity of water left by the storm of the previous night infiltration had evidently commenced a perfect stream ran down invading the crypt whenever there was heavy rain and they both felt a pang at their hearts when they perceived that the water was trickling along the vaulted roof in narrow threads and thence falling in large regular rhythmical drops upon the tomb the doctor could not restrain a groan now it rains he said it rains on him pierre remained motionless in a kind of awe 
in the presence of that falling water at the thought of the blasts which must rush at winter time through the glassless windows that corpse appeared to him both woeful and tragic it acquired a fierce grandeur lying there alone in its splendid marble tomb amidst all the rubbish at the bottom of the crumbling ruins of its own church it was the solitary guardian the dead sleeper and dreamer watching over the empty spaces open to all the birds of night it was the mute obstinate eternal protest and it was expectation also cure peramal stretched in his coffin having all eternity before him to acquire patience there without weariness awaited the workmen who would perhaps return thither some fine april morning if they should take ten years to do so he would be there and if it should take them a century he would be there still he was waiting for the rotten scaffoldings up above among the grass of the nave to be resuscitated like the dead and by the force of some miracle to stand upright once more along the walls he was waiting too for the moss-covered engine to become all at once burning hot recover its breath and raise the timbers for the roof his beloved enterprise his gigantic building was crumbling about his head and yet with joined hands and closed eyes he was watching over its ruins watching and waiting too in a low voice the doctor finished the cruel story telling how after persecuting cure peramal and his work they persecuted his tomb there had formerly been a bust of the cure there and pious hands had kept a little lamp burning before it but a woman had one day fallen with her face to the earth saying that she had perceived the soul of the deceased and thereupon the fathers of the grotto were in a flutter were miracles about to take place there the sick already passed entire days there seated on the benches before the tomb others knelt down kissed the marble and prayed to be cured and at this a feeling of terror arose supposing they should be cured supposing the grotto should find a competitor in this martyr lying all alone amidst the old tools left there by the masons the bishop of tarbes informed and influenced thereupon published the mandamus which placed the church under interdict forbidding all worship there and all pilgrimages and processions to the tomb of the former priest of lourdes as in the case of bernadette his memory was proscribed his portrait could be found officially nowhere in the same manner as they had shown themselves merciless against the living man so did the fathers prove merciless to his memory they pursued him even in his tomb they alone again nowadays prevented the works of the church from being proceeded with by raising continual obstacles and absolutely refusing to share their rich harvest of arms and they seemed to be waiting for the winter rains to fall and complete the work of destruction for the vaulted roof of the crypt the walls the whole gigantic pile to crumble down upon the tomb of the martyr upon the body of the defeated man so that he might be buried beneath them and at last pounded to dust ah murmured the doctor i who knew him so valiant so enthusiastic in all noble labour now you see it it rains it rains on him painfully he set himself on his knees and found relief in a long prayer pierre who could not pray remained standing compassionate sorrow was overflowing from his heart he listened to the heavy drops from the roof as one by one they broke on the tomb with a slow rhythmical pitter-pat which seemed to be numbering the seconds of eternity amidst the profound silence and he reflected on the eternal misery of this world on the choice which suffering makes in always falling on the best the two great makers of our lady of lourdes bernadette and cure peramal rose up in the flesh again before him like woeful victims tortured during their lives and exiled after their deaths that alone indeed would have completed within him the destruction of his faith for the bernadette whom he had just found at the end of his researches was but a human sister loaded with every dolor but none the less he preserved a tender brotherly veneration for her and two tears slowly trickled down his cheeks. End of section 20。section 21 of Lourdes。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please contact librivox.org。Lourdes by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Vizitelli. The Fifth Day. 1. Egotism and Love. Again that night, Pierre, at the Hotel of the Apparitions, 
was unable to obtain a wink of sleep. After calling at the hospital to inquire after Marie, who, since her return from the procession, had been soundly enjoying the delicious, restoring sleep of a child, he had gone to bed himself feeling anxious at the prolonged absence of Monsieur de Garcin. He had expected him at latest at dinner-time, but probably some mischance had detained him at Gavarny, and he thought how disappointed Marie would be if her father were not there to embrace her the first thing in the morning. With a man like Monsieur de Garcin, so pleasantly heedless and so hare-brained, everything was possible, every fear might be realised. Perhaps this anxiety had at first sufficed to keep Pierre awake in spite of his great fatigue, but afterwards the nocturnal noises of the hotel had really assumed unbearable proportions. The morrow, Tuesday, was the day of departure, the last day which the national pilgrimage would spend at Lourdes, and the pilgrims no doubt were making the most of their time, coming from the grotto and returning thither in the middle of the night, endeavouring as it were to force the grace of heaven by their commotion, and apparently never feeling the slightest need of repose. The doors slammed, the floors shook, the entire building vibrated beneath the disorderly gallop of a crowd. Never before had the walls reverberated with such obstinate coughs, such thick husky voices. Thus Pierre, a prey to insomnia, tossed about on his bed and continually rose up, beset with the idea that the noise he heard must have been made by Monsieur de Garcin, who had returned. For some minutes he would listen feverishly, but he could only hear the extraordinary sounds of the passage, amid which he could distinguish nothing precisely. Was it the priest, the mother and her three daughters, or the old married couple on his left, who were fighting with the furniture? Or was it rather the larger family, or the single gentleman, or the young single woman on his right, whom some incomprehensible occurrences were leading into adventures? At one moment he jumped from his bed, wishing to explore his absent friend's empty room, as he felt certain that some deeds of violence were taking place in it. But although he listened very attentively when he got there, the only sound he could distinguish was the tender caressing murmur of two voices. Then a sudden recollection of Madame Volmar came to him, and he returned shuddering to bed. At length, when it was broad daylight and Pierre had just fallen asleep, a loud knocking at his door awoke him with a start. This time there could be no mistake. A loud voice broken by sobs was calling, Monsieur l'abbé, Monsieur l'abbé, for heaven's sake, wake up. Surely it must be Monsieur de Garcin who had been brought back dead at least. Quite scared, Pierre ran and opened the door in his nightshirt and found himself in the presence of his neighbour, Monsieur Vigneron. Oh, for heaven's sake, Monsieur l'abbé, dress yourself at once exclaimed the assistant head clerk. Your holy ministry is required. And he began to relate that he had just got up to see the time by his watch on the mantelpiece, when he had heard the most frightful sighs issuing from the adjoining room where Madame Chaise slept. She had left the communicating door open in order to be more with them, as she pleasantly expressed it. Accordingly, he had hastened in and flung the shutters open so as to admit both light and air. And what a sight, Monsieur l'abbé, he continued. Our poor aunt lying on her bed, nearly purple in the face already, her mouth wide open in a vain effort to breathe, and her hands fumbling with the sheet. It's her heart complaint, you know. Come, come at once, Monsieur l'abbé, and help her, I implore you. Pierre, utterly bewildered, could find neither his breeches nor his cassock. Of course, of course I'll come with you, said he, but I have not what is necessary for administering the last sacraments. Monsieur Vigneron had assisted him to dress, and was now stooping down looking for his slippers. Never mind, he said, the mere sight of you will assist her in her last moments, if heaven has this affliction in store for us. Here, put these on your feet, and follow me at once, oh, at once. He went off like a gust of wind and plunged into the adjoining room. All the doors remained wide open. The young priest, who followed him, noticed nothing in the first room, which was in an incredible state of disorder beyond the half-naked figure of little Gustave, who sat on the sofa serving him as a bed, motionless, very pale, forgotten, and shivering amid this drama of inexorable death. Open bags littered the floor, the greasy remains of supper soiled the table, the parents' bed seemed devastated by the catastrophe, its coverlets torn off and lying on the ground. And almost immediately afterwards he caught sight of the mother, who had hastily enveloped herself in an old yellow dressing-gown, standing with a terrified look in the inner room. Well, my love, well, my love, repeated Monsieur Vigneron in stammering accents. With a wave of her hand and without uttering a word, Madame Vigneron drew their attention to Madame Chaise, who lay motionless, with her head sunk in the pillow and her hands stiffened and twisted. She was blue in the face, and her mouth gaped, as though with the great last gasp that had come from her. Pierre bent over her. Then in a low voice he said, 
she is dead dead the word rang out in that more tidy room where a heavy silence reigned and the husband and wife looked at each other in amazement bewilderment so it was over the aunt had died before gustave and the youngster inherited her five hundred thousand francs how many times had they dwelt on that dream whose sudden realization dumbfounded them how many times had despair overcome them when they feared that the poor child might depart before her dead good heavens was it their fault had they really prayed to the blessed virgin for this she had shown herself so good to them that they trembled at the thought that they had not been able to express a wish without its being granted in the death of the chief clerk so suddenly carried off so that they might have his place they had already recognized the powerful hand of our lady of lourdes had she again loaded them with favors listening even to the unconscious dreams of their desire yet they had never desired any one's death they were worthy people incapable of any bad action loving their relations fulfilling their religious duties going to confession partaking of the communion like other people without any ostentation whenever they thought of those five hundred thousand francs of their son who might be the first to go and of the annoyance it would be to them to see another and far less worthy nephew inherit that fortune it was merely in the innermost recesses of their hearts in short quite innocently and naturally certainly they had thought of it when they were at the grotto but was not the blessed virgin wisdom itself did she not know far better than ourselves what she ought to do for the happiness of both the living and the dead then madame vigneron in all sincerity burst into tears and wept for the sister whom she loved so much ah monsieur l'abbé she said i saw her expire she passed away before my eyes what a misfortune that you were not here sooner to receive her soul she died without a priest your presence would have consoled her so much a prey also to emotion his eyes full of tears vigneron sought to console his wife your sister was a saint said he she communicated again yesterday morning and you need have no anxiety concerning her her soul has gone straight to heaven no doubt if monsieur l'abbé had been here in time she would have been glad to see him but what would you death was quicker i went at once and really there is nothing for us to reproach ourselves with then turning towards the priest he added monsieur l'abbé it was her excessive piety which certainly hastened her end yesterday at the grotto she had a bad attack which was a warning and in spite of her fatigue she obstinately followed the procession afterwards i thought then that she could not last long yet out of delicacy one did not like to say anything to her for fear of frightening her pierre gently knelt down and said the customary prayers with that human emotion which was his nearest approach to faith in the presence of eternal life and eternal death both so pitiful then as he remained kneeling a little longer he overheard snatches of the conversation around him little gustave forgotten on his couch amid the disorder of the other room must have lost patience for he had begun to cry and call out mamma 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 at length madame vigneron went to quiet him and it occurred to her to carry him in her arms to kiss his poor aunt for the last time but at first he struggled and refused crying so much that monsieur vigneron was obliged to interfere and try to make him ashamed of himself what he who was never frightened of anything who bore suffering with the courage of a grown-up man and to think it was a question of kissing his poor aunt who had always been so kind whose last thought must most certainly have been for him give him to me said he to his wife he's going to be good gustave ended by clinging to his father's neck he came shivering in his night-shirt displaying his wretched little body devoured by scrofula it seemed indeed as though the miraculous water of the piscinas far from curing him had freshened the sore on his back whilst his scraggy leg hung down inertly like a dry stick kiss her resumed monsieur vigneron the child leant forward and kissed his aunt on the forehead it was not death which upset him and caused him to struggle since he had been in the room he had been looking at the dead woman with an air of quiet curiosity he did not love her he had suffered on her account so long he had the ideas and feelings of a man and the weight of them was stifling him as they developed and became more acute at the same time as his complaint he felt full well that he was too little that children ought not to understand what only concerns their elders however his father seating himself out of the way kept him on his knee whilst his mother closed the window and lit the two candles on the mantelpiece ah my poor dear murmured monsieur vigneron feeling that he must say something it's a cruel loss for all of us our trip is now completely spoilt this is our last day for we start this afternoon 
and the blessed virgin too was showing herself so kind to us however seeing his son's surprised look a look of infinite sadness and reproach he hastened to add yes of course i know that she hasn't yet quite cured you but we must not despair of her kindness she loves us so well she shows us so many favors that she will certainly end by curing you since that is now the only favor that remains for her to grant us madame vigneron who was listening drew near and said how happy we should have been to have returned to paris all three hale and hearty nothing is ever perfect i say suddenly observed monsieur vigneron i shan't be able to leave with you this afternoon on account of the formalities which have to be gone through i hope that my return ticket will still be available tomorrow they were both getting over the frightful shock feeling a sense of relief in spite of their affection for madame chaise and in fact they were already forgetting her anxious above all things to leave lourdes as soon as possible as though the principal object of their journey had been attained a decorous unavowed delight was slowly penetrating them when i get back to paris there will be so much for me to do continued monsieur vigneron i who now only long for repose all the same i shall remain my three years at the ministry until i can retire especially now that i am certain of the retiring pension of chief clerk but afterwards oh afterwards i certainly hope to enjoy life a bit since this money has come to us i shall purchase the estate of les Billot, that superb property down at my native place which i have always been dreaming of and i promise you that i shan't find time hanging heavy on my hands in the midst of my horses my dogs and my flowers little gustave was still on his father's knee his nightshirt rucked up his whole wretched misshapen body shivering and displaying the thinness of a slowly dying child when he perceived that his father now full of his dream of an opulent life no longer seemed to notice that he was there he gave one of his enigmatical smiles in which melancholy was tinged with malice but what about me father he asked monsieur vigneron started like one aroused from sleep and did not at first seem to understand you little one you'll be with us of course but gustave gave him a long straight look without ceasing to smile with his artful though woeful lips oh do you think so he asked of course i think so you'll be with us and it will be very nice to be with us uneasy stammering unable to find the proper words monsieur vigneron felt a chill come over him when his son shrugged his skinny shoulders with an air of philosophical disdain and answered oh no i shall be dead and then the terrified father was suddenly able to detect in the child's deep glance the glance of a man who was very aged very knowing in all things acquainted with all the abominations of life through having gone through them what especially alarmed him was the abrupt conviction that this child had always seen into the innermost recesses of his heart even farther than the things he dared to acknowledge to himself he could recall that when the little sufferer had been but a baby in his cradle his eyes would frequently be fixed upon his own and even then those eyes had been rendered so sharp by suffering endowed too with such an extraordinary power of divination that they had seemed able to dive into the unconscious thoughts buried in the depths of his brain and by a singular counter-effect all the things that he had never owned to himself he now found in his child's eyes he beheld them read them there against his will the story of his cupidity lay unfolded before him his anger at having such a sorry son his anguish at the idea that madame chaise's fortune depended upon such a fragile existence his eager desire that she might make haste and die while the youngster was still there in order that he might finger the legacy it was simply a question of days this duel as to which should go off first and then at the end it still meant death the youngster must in his turn disappear whilst he the father alone pocketed the cash and lived joyfully to a good old age and these frightful things shone forth so clearly from the keen melancholy smiling eyes of the poor condemned child passed from son to father with such evident distinctness that for a moment it seemed to them that they were shouting them aloud however monsieur vigneron struggled against it all and averting his head began energetically protesting how you'll be dead what an idea it's absurd to have such ideas as that meantime madame vigneron was sobbing you wicked child she gasped how can you make us so unhappy when we already have such a cruel loss to deplore gustave had to kiss them and to promise them that he would live for their sakes yet he did not cease smiling conscious as he was that a lie is necessary when one does not wish to be too miserable and quite prepared moreover to leave his parents happy behind him since even the blessed virgin herself was powerless to grant him in this world the little happy lot to which each creature should be born 
his mother took him back to bed and pierre at length rose up just as monsieur vigneron had finished arranging the chamber of death in a suitable manner you'll excuse me won't you monsieur l'abbé said he accompanying the young priest to the door i'm not quite myself well it's an unpleasant time to go through i must get over it somehow however when pierre got into the passage he stopped for a moment listening to a sound of voices which was ascending the stairs he had just been thinking of monsieur de guersin again and imagined that he could recognize his voice however whilst he stood there waiting an incident occurred which caused him intense discomfort the door of the room next to monsieur de guersin softly opened and a woman clad in black slipped quickly into the passage as she turned she found herself face to face with pierre in such a fashion that it was impossible for them to pretend not to recognize each other the woman was madame volmar six o'clock had not yet struck and she was going off hoping that nobody would notice her with the intention of showing herself at the hospital and there spending this last morning in order in some measure to justify her journey to lourdes when she perceived pierre she began to tremble and at first could only stammer oh monsieur l'abbé monsieur l'abbé then noticing that the priest had left his door wide open she seemed to give way to the fever consuming her to a need of speaking out explaining things and justifying herself with her face suffused by a rush of blood she entered the young man's room whither he had to follow her greatly disturbed by this strange adventure and as he still left the door open it was she who in her desire to confide her sorrow and her sin to him begged that he would close it oh i pray you monsieur l'abbé said she do not judge me too harshly he made a gesture as though to reply that he did not allow himself the right to pass judgment upon her but yes but yes she responded i know very well that you are acquainted with my misfortune you saw me once in paris behind the church of la trinite and the other day you recognized me on the balcony here you were aware that i was there in that room but if you only knew oh if you only knew her lips were quivering and tears were welling into her eyes as he looked at her he was surprised by the extraordinary beauty transfiguring her face this woman invariably clad in black extremely simple with never a jewel now appeared to him in all the brilliancy of her passion no longer drawing back into the gloom no longer seeking to bedim the lustre of her eyes as was her wont she who at first sight did not seem pretty but too dark and slender with drawn features a large mouth and long nose assumed as he now examined her a troubling charm a powerful irresistible beauty her eyes especially her large magnificent eyes whose braziers she usually sought to cover with a veil of indifference were flaring like torches and he understood that she should be loved adored to madness if you only knew monsieur l'abbé she continued if i were only to tell you all that i have suffered doubtless you have suspected something of it since you are acquainted with my mother-in-law and my husband on the few occasions when you have called on us you cannot but have understood some of the abominable things which go on in my home though i have always striven to appear happy in my little silent corner but to live like that for ten years to have no existence never to love never to be loved no no it was beyond my power and then she related the whole painful story her marriage with the diamond merchant a disastrous though it seemed an advantageous one her mother-in-law with the stern soul of a jailer or an executioner and her husband a monster of physical ugliness and mental villainy they imprisoned her they did not even allow her to look out of a window they had beaten her they had pitilessly assailed her in her tastes her inclinations in all her feminine weaknesses she knew that her husband wandered in his affections and yet if she smiled to a relative if she had a flower in her corsage on some rare day of gaiety he would tear it from her enter into the most jealous rage and seize and bruise her wrists whilst shouting the most fearful threats for years and years she had lived in that hell hoping hoping still having within her such a power of life such an ardent need of affection that she continued waiting for happiness ever thinking at the faintest breath that it was about to enter i swear to you monsieur l'abbé said she that i could not do otherwise than i have done i was too unhappy my whole being longed for someone who would care for me and when my friend the first time told me that he loved me it was all over i was his for ever ah to be loved to be spoken to gently to have someone near you who is always solicitous and amiable to know that in absence he thinks of you that there is a heart somewhere in which you live ah if it be a crime monsieur l'abbé i cannot cannot feel remorse for it i will not even say that i was urged to it i simply say that it came to me as naturally as my breath 
because it was as necessary to my life she had carried her hand to her lips as though to throw a kiss to the world and pierre felt deeply disturbed in presence of this lovely woman who personified all the ardor of human passion and at the same time a feeling of deep pity began to arise within him poor woman he murmured it is not to the priest that i am confessing she resumed it is to the man that i am speaking to a man by whom i should greatly like to be understood no i am not a believer religion has not sufficed me it is said that some women find contentment in it a firm protection even against all transgressions but i have ever felt cold in church weary unto death oh i know very well that it is wrong to feign piety to mingle religion with my heart affairs but what would you i am forced to it if you saw me in paris behind the trinite it was because that church is the only place to which i am allowed to go alone and if you find me here at lourdes it is because in the whole long year i have but these three days of happiness and freedom again she began to tremble hot tears were coursing down her cheeks a vision of it all arose in pierre's mind and distracted by the thought of the ardent earthly love which possessed this unhappy creature he again murmured poor woman and monsieur l'abbé she continued think of the hell to which i am about to return for weeks and months i live my life of martyrdom without complaint another year another year must go by without a day an hour of happiness ah i am indeed very unhappy monsieur l'abbé yet do you not think all the same that i am a good woman he had been deeply moved by her sincere display of mingled grief and passion he felt in her the breath of universal desire a sovereign flame and his compassion overflowed from his heart and his words were words of pardon madame he said i pity you and respect you infinitely then she spoke no further but looked at him with her large tear-blurred eyes and suddenly catching hold of both his hands she grasped them tightly with her burning fingers and then she went off vanishing down the passage as light as ethereal as a shadow however pierre suffered from her presence in that room even more acutely after she had departed he opened the window wide that the fresh air might carry off the breath of passion which she had left there already on the sunday when he had seen her on the balcony he had been seized with terror at the thought that she personified the revenge of the world and the flesh amidst all the mystical exaltation of immaculate lourdes and now his terror was returning to him love seemed stronger than faith and perhaps it was only love that was divine to love to belong to one another to create and continue life was not that the one sole object of nature outside of all social and religious policies for a moment he was conscious of the abyss before him his chastity was his last prop the very dignity of his spoilt life and he realized that if after yielding to his reason he also yielded to his flesh he would be utterly lost all his pride of purity all his strength which he had placed in his professional rectitude thereupon returned to him and he again vowed that he would never be a man since he had voluntarily cut himself off from among men seven o'clock was striking and pierre did not go back to bed but began to wash himself thoroughly enjoying the cool water which ended by calming his fever as he finished dressing the anxious thought of monsieur de guersin recurred to him on hearing a sound of footsteps in the passage these steps stopped outside his room and someone knocked with a feeling of relief he went to open the door but on doing so exclaimed in great surprise what it's you how is it that you're already up running about to see people marie stood on the threshold smiling whilst behind her was sister hyacinthe who had come with her and who also was smiling with her lovely candid eyes ah my friend said the girl i could not remain in bed i sprang out directly i saw the sunshine i had such a longing to walk to run and jump about like a child and i begged and implored so much that sister was good enough to come with me i think i should have got out through the window if the door had been closed against me pierre ushered them in and an indescribable emotion oppressed him as he heard her jest so gaily and saw her move about so freely with such grace and liveliness she good heavens she whom he had seen for years with lifeless legs and colourless face since he had left her the day before at the basilica she had blossomed into full youth and beauty one night had sufficed for him to find again developed it is true the sweet creature whom he had loved so tenderly the superb radiant child whom he had embraced so wildly in the bygone days behind the flowering hedge beneath the sun-flecked trees how tall and lovely you are marie he said in spite of himself then sister hyacinthe interposed hasn't the blessed virgin done things well monsieur l'abbé 
when she takes us in hand you see she turns us out as fresh as roses and smelling quite as sweet ah resumed marie i'm so happy i feel quite strong and well and spotless as though i had just been born all this was very delicious to pierre it seemed to him that the atmosphere was now truly purified of madame volmar's presence marie filled the room with her candour with the perfume and brightness of her innocent youth and yet the joy he felt at the sight of pure beauty and life reflowering was not exempt from sadness for after all the revolt which he had felt in the crypt the wound of his wrecked life must forever leave him a bleeding heart as he gazed upon all that resuscitated grace as the woman he loved thus reappeared before him in the flower of her youth he could not but remember that she would never be his that he belonged no longer to the world but to the grave however he no longer lamented he experienced a boundless melancholy a sensation of utter nothingness as he told himself that he was dead that this dawn of beauty was rising on the tomb in which his manhood slept it was renunciation accepted resolved upon amidst all the desolate grandeur attaching to those lives which are led contrary to nature's law then like the other woman the impassioned one marie took hold of pierre's hands but hers was so soft so fresh so soothing she looked at him with some little confusion and a great longing which she dared not express after a while however she summoned up her courage and said will you kiss me pierre it would please me so much he shuddered his heart crushed by this last torture ah the kisses of other days those kisses which had ever lingered on his lips never since had he kissed her and to-day she was like a sister flinging her arms around his neck she kissed him with a loud smack on both his cheeks and offering her own insisted on his doing likewise to her so twice in his turn he embraced her i too marie said he am pleased very pleased i assure you and then overcome by emotion his courage exhausted whilst at the same time filled with delight and bitterness he burst into sobs weeping with his face buried in his hands like a child seeking to hide its tears come come we must not give way said sister hyacinthe gaily monsieur l'abbé would feel too proud if he fancied that we had merely come on his account monsieur de garcin is about isn't he marie raised a cry of deep affection ah my dear father after all it's he who'll be most pleased thereupon pierre had to relate that monsieur de garcin had not returned from his excursion to gavarny his increasing anxiety showed itself while he spoke although he sought to explain his friend's absence surmising all sorts of obstacles and unforeseen complications marie however did not seem afraid but again laughed saying that her father never could be punctual still she was extremely eager for him to see her walking to find her on her legs again resuscitated in the fresh blossoming of her youth all at once sister hyacinthe who had gone to lean over the balcony returned to the room saying here he comes he's down below just alighting from his carriage ah cried marie with the eager playfulness of a schoolgirl let's give him a surprise yes we must hide and when he's here we'll show ourselves all of a sudden with these words she hastily dragged sister hyacinthe into the adjoining room almost immediately afterwards monsieur de garcin entered like a whirlwind from the passage the door communicating with which had been quickly opened by pierre and shaking the young priest's hand the belated excursionist exclaimed here i am at last ah my friend you can't have known what to think since four o'clock yesterday when you expected me back eh but you have no idea of the adventures we have had to begin with one of the wheels of our landau came off just as we reached gavarny then yesterday evening though we managed to start off again a frightful storm detained us all night long at saint sauveur i wasn't able to sleep a wink then breaking off he inquired and you are you all right i wasn't able to sleep either said the priest they made such a noise in the hotel but monsieur de garcin had already started off again all the same it was delightful i must tell you you can't imagine it i was with three delightful churchmen abbe de hermoise is certainly the most charming man i know oh we did laugh we did laugh then he again stopped to inquire and how's my daughter thereupon a clear laugh behind him caused him to turn round and he remained with his mouth wide open marie was there and was walking with a look of rapturous delight upon her face which was beaming with health he had never for a moment doubted the miracle and was not in the least surprised that it had taken place for he had returned with the conviction that everything would end well and that he would surely find her cured but what so utterly astounded him was the prodigious spectacle which he had not foreseen his daughter looking so beautiful so divine in her little black gown his daughter who had not even brought a hat with her 
and merely had a piece of lace tied over her lovely fair hair his daughter full of life blooming triumphant similar to all the daughters of all the fathers whom he had envied for so many years oh my child oh my child he exclaimed and as she had flown into his arms he pressed her to his heart and then they fell upon their knees together everything disappeared from before them in a radiant effusion of faith and love this heedless hare-brained man who fell asleep instead of accompanying his daughter to the grotto who went off to gavarni on the day the blessed virgin was to cure her overflowed with such paternal affection with such christian faith so exalted by thankfulness that for a moment he appeared sublime oh jesus oh mary let me thank you for having restored my child to me oh my child we shall never have breath enough soul enough to render thanks to mary and jesus for the great happiness they have vouchsafed us oh my child whom they have resuscitated oh my child whom they have made so beautiful again take my heart to offer it to them with your own i am yours i am theirs eternally oh my beloved child my adored child kneeling before the open window they both with uplifted eyes gazed ardently on heaven the daughter had rested her head upon her father's shoulder whilst he had passed an arm round her waist they had become one tears slowly trickled down their enraptured faces which were smiling with superhuman felicity whilst they stammered together disconnected expressions of gratitude o oh, jesus we give thee thanks o oh, holy mother of jesus we give thee thanks we love you we adore you both you have rejuvenated the best blood in our veins it is yours it circulates only for you o oh, all-powerful mother o oh, divine and well-beloved son behold a daughter and a father who bless you who prostrate themselves with joy at your feet so affecting was this mingling of two beings happy at last after so many dark days this happiness which could but stammer as though still tinged with suffering that pierre was again moved to tears but this time there were soothing tears which relieved his heart ah poor pitiable humanity how pleasant it was to see it somewhat consoled and enraptured and what did it matter after all if its great joys of a few seconds duration sprang from the eternal illusion was not the whole of humanity pitiable humanity saved by love personified by that poor childish man who suddenly became sublime because he found his daughter resuscitated standing a little aside sister hyacinthe was also weeping her heart very full full of human emotion which she had never before experienced she who had known no other parents than the almighty and the blessed virgin silence had now fallen in this room full of so much tearful fraternity and it was she who spoke the first when the father and the daughter overcome with emotion at length rose up now mademoiselle said she we must be quick and get back to the hospital but they all protested monsieur de garcin wished to keep his daughter with him and marie's eyes expressed an eager desire a longing to enjoy life to walk and ramble through the whole vast world oh no no said the father i won't give her back to you we'll each have a cup of milk for i'm dying of thirst then we'll go out and walk about yes yes both of us she shall take my arm like a little woman sister hyacinthe laughed again very well said she i'll leave her with you and tell the ladies that you've stolen her from me but for my own part i must be off you've no idea what an amount of work we have to get through at the hospital if we are to be ready in time to leave there are all the patients and things to be seen to and all is in the greatest confusion so today's really tuesday and we leave this afternoon asked monsieur de garcin already absent-minded again of course we do and don't forget the white train starts at three forty and if you're sensible you'll bring your daughter back early so that she may have a little rest marie walked with the sister to the door saying be easy i will be very good besides i want to go back to the grotto to thank the blessed virgin once more when they found themselves all three alone in the little room full of sunshine it was delicious pierre called the servant and told her to bring them some milk some chocolate and cakes in fact the nicest things he could think of and although marie had already broken her fast she ate again so great an appetite had come upon her since the night before they drew the table to the window and made quite a feast amidst the keen air from the mountains whilst the hundred bells of lourdes proclaimed with flying peals the glory of that radiant day they chattered and laughed and the young woman told her father the story of the miracle with all the oft-repeated details she related too how she had left her box at the basilica and how she had slept twelve hours without stirring then monsieur de garcin on his side wished to relate his excursion but got mixed and kept coming back to the miracle finally it appeared that the cirque de gavarni was something colossal only when you looked at it from a distance it seemed small for you lost all sense of proportion 
the gigantic snow-covered tiers of cliffs the topmost ridge standing out against the sky with the outlines of some cyclopean fortress with raised keep and jagged ramparts the great cascade whose ceaseless jet seemed so slow when in reality it must have rushed down with a noise like thunder the whole immensity the forests on right and left the torrents and the landslips looked as though they might have been held in the palm of one's hand when one gazed upon them from the village marketplace and what had impressed him most what he repeatedly alluded to were the strange figures described by the snow which had remained up there amongst the rocks among others was a huge crucifix a white cross several thousand yards in length which you might have thought had been thrown across the amphitheatre from one end to the other however all at once monsieur de guersin broke off to inquire by the way what's happening at our neighbours as i came upstairs a little while ago i met monsieur vigneron running about like a madman and through the open doorway of their room i fancied i saw madame vigneron looking very red has their son gustave had another attack pierre had quite forgotten madame chaise lying dead on the other side of the partition he seemed to feel a cold breath pass over him no no he answered the child is all right and he said no more preferring to remain silent why spoil this happy hour of new life and reconquered youth by mingling it with the image of death however from that moment he himself could not cease thinking of the proximity of nothingness and he thought too of that other room where madame volmar's friend was now alone stifling his sobs with his lips pressed upon a pair of gloves which he had stolen from her all the sounds of the hotel were now becoming audible again the coughs the sighs the indistinct voices the continual slamming of doors the creaking of the floors beneath the great accumulation of travellers and all the stir in the passages along which flying skirts were sweeping and families galloping distractedly amidst the hurry scurry of departure on my word you'll do yourself an injury all at once cried monsieur de guersin on seeing his daughter take up another cake marie was quite merry too but at a sudden thought tears came into her eyes and she exclaimed ah how glad i am but also how sorry when i think that everybody is not as pleased as myself end of section twenty one Section twenty two of Lourdes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Lourdes by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Visatelli. The fifth day. Two. Pleasant hours. It was eight o'clock, and Marie was so impatient that she could not keep still, but continued going to the window as if she wished to inhale all the air of the vast expanse and the immense sky ah what a pleasure to be able to run about the streets across the squares to go everywhere as far as she might wish and to show how strong she was to have the pride of walking leagues in the presence of every one now that the blessed virgin had cured her it was an irresistible impulsion a flight of her entire being her blood and her heart however just as she was setting out she made up her mind that her first visit with her father ought to be to the grotto where both of them had to thank our lady of lourdes then they would be free they would have two long hours before them and might walk wherever they chose before she returned to lunch and pack up her few things at the hospital well is everyone ready repeated monsieur de garcin shall we make a move pierre took his hat and all three went downstairs talking very loud and laughing on the staircase like boisterous schoolboys going for their holidays they had almost reached the street when at the doorway madame majesté rushed forward she had evidently been waiting for them to go out ah mademoiselle ah gentlemen allow me to congratulate you she said we have heard of the extraordinary favour that has been granted you we are so happy so much flattered when the blessed virgin is pleased to select one of our customers her dry harsh face was melting with amiability and she observed the miraculously healed girl with the fondest of eyes then she impulsively called her husband who was passing look my dear it's mademoiselle it's mademoiselle majesté's clean-shaven face puffed out with yellow fat assumed a happy and grateful expression really mademoiselle i cannot tell you how honoured we feel said he we shall never forget that your papa put up at our place it has already excited the envy of many people while he spoke madame majesté stopped the other travellers who were going out and with a sign summoned the families already seated in the dining-room 
indeed she would have called in the whole street if they had given her time to show that she had in her house the miracle at which all lourdes had been marvelling since the previous day people ended by collecting there a crowd gathered little by little while she whispered in the ear of each look that's her the young party you know the young party who but all at once she exclaimed i'll go and fetch apolline from the shop i must show mademoiselle to apolline thereupon however majesté in a very dignified way restrained her no he said leave apolline she has three ladies to serve already mademoiselle and these gentlemen will certainly not leave lourdes without making a few purchases the little souvenirs that one carries away with one are so pleasant to look at later on and our customers make a point of never buying elsewhere than here in the shop which we have annexed to the hotel i have already offered my services added madame majesté and i renew them apolline will be so happy to show mademoiselle all our prettiest articles at prices too which are incredibly low oh there are some delightful things delightful marie was becoming impatient at being detained in this manner and pierre was suffering from the increasing curiosity which they were arousing as for monsieur de garcin he enjoyed this popularity and triumph of his daughter immensely and promised to return certainly said he we will purchase a few little knick-knacks some souvenirs for ourselves and some presents that we shall have to make but later on when we come back at last they escaped and descended the avenue de la grotte the weather was again superb after the storms of the two preceding nights cooled by the rain the morning air was delicious amidst the gaiety which the bright sun shed around a busy crowd well pleased with life was already hurrying along the pavements and what pleasure it all was for marie to whom everything seemed new charming inappreciable in the morning she had had to allow raymond to lend her a pair of boots for she had taken good care not to put any in her portmanteau superstitiously fearing that they might bring her bad luck however raymond's boots fitted her admirably and she listened with childish delight to the little heels tapping merrily on the flagstones and she did not remember having ever seen houses so white trees so green and passers-by so happy all her senses seemed holiday-making endowed with a marvellously delicate sensibility she heard music smelt distant perfumes savoured the air greedily as though it were some delicious fruit but what she considered above all so nice so charming was to walk along in this wise on her father's arm she had never done so before although she had felt the desire for years as for one of those impossible pleasures with which people occupy their minds when invalided and now her dream was realized and her heart beat with joy she pressed against her father and strove to walk very upright and look very handsome so as to do him honour and he was quite proud as happy as she was showing exhibiting her overcome with joy at the thought that she belonged to him that she was his blood his flesh his daughter henceforth beaming with youth and health as they were all three crossing the plateau de la merlasse already obstructed by a band of candle and bouquet sellers running after the pilgrims monsieur de garcin exclaimed we are surely not going to the grotto empty-handed pierre who was walking on the other side of marie himself brightened by her merry humour thereupon stopped and they were at once surrounded by a crowd of female hawkers who with eager fingers thrust their goods into their faces my beautiful young lady my good gentleman buy of me of me of me such was the onslaught that it became necessary to struggle in order to extricate oneself monsieur de garcin ended by purchasing the largest nosegay he could see a bouquet of white marguerites as round and hard as a cabbage of a handsome fair-haired well-developed girl of twenty who was extremely bold both in look and manner it only cost twenty sous and he insisted on paying for it out of his own little purse somewhat abashed meantime by the girl's unblushing effrontery then pierre in his turn settled for the three candles which marie had taken from an old woman candles at two francs each a very reasonable price as she repeatedly said and on being paid the old creature who had an angular face covetous eyes and a nose like the beak of a bird of prey returned profuse and mellifluous thanks may our lady of lourdes bless you my beautiful young lady may she cure you of your complaints you and yours this enlivened them again and they set out once more all three laughing amused like children at the idea that the good woman's wish had already been accomplished at the grotto marie wished to enter at once in order to offer the bouquet and candles herself before even kneeling down there were not many people as yet and having gone to the end of the line their turn came after waiting some three or four minutes 
and with what enraptured glances did she then examine everything the altar of engraved silver the harmonium organ the votive offerings the candle holders streaming with wax blazing in broad daylight she was now inside that grotto which she had hitherto only seen from her box of misery she breathed there as in paradise itself steeped rapturously in a pleasant warmth and odour which slightly oppressed her when she had placed the tapers at the bottom of the large basket she had raised herself on tiptoe to fix the bouquet on one of the spears of the iron railing she imprinted a long kiss upon the rock below the statue of the blessed virgin at the very spot indeed which millions of lips had already polished and the stone received a kiss of love in which she put forth all the strength of her gratitude a kiss with which her heart melted when she was once more outside marie prostrated and humbled herself in an almost endless act of thanksgiving her father also had knelt down near her and mingled the fervour of his gratitude with hers but he could not remain doing the same thing for long little by little he became uneasy and ended by bending down to his daughter's ear to tell her that he had a call to make which he had previously forgotten assuredly the best course would be for her to remain where she was praying and wait for him while she completed her devotions he would hurry along and get his troublesome errand over and then they might walk about at ease wheresoever they liked she did not understand him did not even hear him but simply nodded her head promising that she would not move and then such tender faith again took possession of her that her eyes fixed on the white statue of the virgin filled with tears when monsieur de garcin had joined pierre who had remained a little distance off he gave him the following explanation my dear fellow he said it's a matter of conscience i formally promised the coachman who drove us to gavarny that i would see his master and tell him the real cause of our delay you know whom i mean the hairdresser on the place du marcadal and besides i want to get shaved pierre who felt uneasy at this proposal had to give way in the face of the promise that they would be back within a quarter of an hour only as the distance seemed long he on his side insisted on taking a trap which was standing at the bottom of the plateau de la Merlasse it was a sort of greenish cabriolet and its driver a fat fellow of about thirty with the usual basque cap on his head was smoking a cigarette whilst waiting to be hired perched sideways on the seat with his knees wide apart he drove them on with the tranquil indifference of a well-fed man who considers himself the master of the street we will keep you said pierre as he alighted when they had reached the place du marcadal very well very well monsieur l'abbé i'll wait for you and then leaving his lean horse in the hot sun the driver went to chat and laugh with a strong dishevelled servant girl who was washing a dog in the basin of the neighbouring fountain casabon as it happened was just then on the threshold of his shop the lofty windows and pale green painting of which enlivened the dull place which was so deserted on weekdays when he was not pressed with work he delighted to triumph in this manner standing between his two windows which pots of pomatum and bottles of perfumery decorated with bright shades of colour he at once recognised the gentleman very flattered very much honoured pray walk in i beg of you he said then at the first words which monsieur de garcin said to him to excuse the man who had driven him to gavarny he showed himself well disposed of course it was not the man's fault he could not prevent wheels coming to pieces or storms falling so long as the travellers did not complain all was well oh thereupon exclaimed monsieur de garcin it's a magnificent country never to be forgotten well monsieur as our neighbourhood pleases you you must come and see us again we don't ask anything better said casabin and on the architect seating himself in one of the armchairs and asking to be shaved he began to bustle about his assistant was still absent running errands for the pilgrims whom he lodged a whole family who were taking a case of chaplets plaster virgins and framed engravings away with them you heard a confused tramping of feet and violent bursts of conversation coming from the first floor all the helter-skelter of people whom the approaching departure and the packing of purchases lying hither and thither drove almost crazy in the adjoining dining-room the door of which had remained open two children were draining the dregs of some cups of chocolate which stood about amidst the disorder of the breakfast service the whole of the house had been let entirely given over and now had come the last hours of this invasion which compelled the hairdresser and his wife to seek refuge in the basement in a narrow cellar where they slept on a small camp bed while casabin was rubbing monsieur de garcin's cheeks with soap suds the architect questioned him well are you satisfied with the season 
certainly monsieur i can't complain as you hear my travellers are leaving today but i am expecting others tomorrow morning barely sufficient time for a sweep out it will be the same up to october then as pierre remained standing walking about the shop and looking at the walls with an air of impatience he turned round politely and said pray be seated monsieur l'abbé take a newspaper it will not be long the priest having thanked him with a nod and refusing to sit down the hairdresser whose tongue was ever itching to talk continued oh as for myself i am always busy my house is renowned for the cleanliness of the beds and the excellence of the fare only the town is not satisfied ah no i may even say that i have never known so much discontent here he became silent for a moment and shaved his customer's left cheek then again pausing in his work he suddenly declared with a cry wrung from him by conviction the fathers of the grotto are playing with fire monsieur that is all i have to say from that moment however the vent plug was withdrawn and he talked and talked and talked again his big eyes rolled in his long face with prominent cheekbones and sunburnt complexion sprinkled with red while the whole of his nervous little body continued on the jump agitated by his growing exuberance of speech and gesture he returned to his former indictment and enumerated all the many grievances that the old town had against the fathers the hotel keepers complained the dealers in religious fancy articles did not take half the amount they ought to have realized and finally the new town monopolized both the pilgrims and the cash there was now no possibility for any one but the keepers of the lodging houses hotels and shops open in the neighborhood of the grotto to make any money whatever it was a merciless struggle a deadly hostility increasing from day to day the old city losing a little of its life each season and assuredly destined to disappear to be choked assassinated by the young town ah their dirty grotto he would rather have his feet cut off than tread there wasn't it heart-rending that knick-knack shop which they had stuck beside it a shameful thing at which a bishop had shown himself so indignant that it was said he had written to the pope he casabon who flattered himself with being a free thinker and a republican of the old days who already under the empire had voted for the opposition candidates assuredly had the right to declare that he did not believe in the dirty grotto and that he did not care a fig for it look here monsieur he continued i am going to tell you a fact my brother belongs to the municipal council and it's through him that i know it i must tell you first of all that we now have a republican municipal council which is much worried by the demoralization of the town you can no longer go out at night without meeting girls in the streets you know those candle hawkers they gad about with the drivers who come here when the season commences and swell the suspicious floating population which comes no one knows whence and i must also explain to you the position of the fathers towards the town when they purchased the land at the grotto they signed an agreement by which they undertook not to engage in any business there well they have opened a shop in spite of their signature is not that an unfair rivalry unworthy of honest people so the new council decided on sending them a deputation to insist on the agreement being respected and enjoining them to close their shop at once what do you think they answered monsieur oh what they have replied twenty times before what they will always answer when they are reminded of their engagements very well we consent to keep them but we are masters at our own place and we'll close the grotto he raised himself up his razor in the air and repeating his words his eyes dilated by the enormity of the thing he said we'll close the grotto pierre who was continuing his slow walk suddenly stopped and said in his face well the municipal council had only to answer close it at this casabon almost choked the blood rushed to his face and he was beside himself and stammered out close the grotto close the grotto certainly as the grotto irritates you and rends your heart as it's a cause of continual warfare injustice and corruption everything would be over we should hear no more about it that would really be a capital solution and if the council had the power it would render you a service by forcing the fathers to carry out their threat as pierre went on speaking casabon's anger subsided he became very calm and somewhat pale and in the depths of his big eyes the priest detected an expression of increasing uneasiness had he not gone too far in his passion against the fathers many ecclesiastics did not like them perhaps this young priest was simply at lourdes for the purpose of stirring up an agitation against them then who knows it might possibly result in the grotto being closed later on but it was by the grotto that they all lived 
if the old city screeched with rage at only picking up the crumbs it was well pleased to secure even that windfall and the freethinkers themselves who coined money with the pilgrims like everyone else held their tongues ill at ease and even frightened when they found people too much of their opinion with regard to the objectionable features of new lord it was necessary to be prudent casabon thereupon returned to monsieur de guersin whose other cheek he began shaving murmuring the while in an off-hand manner oh what i say about the grotto is not because it troubles me much in reality and besides every one must live in the dining-room the children amidst deafening shouts had just broken one of the bowls and pierre glancing through the open doorway again noticed the engravings of religious subjects and the plaster virgin with which the hairdresser had ornamented the apartment in order to please his lodgers and just then too a voice shouted from the first floor that the trunk was ready and that they would be much obliged if the assistant would cord it as soon as he returned however casabon in the presence of these two gentlemen whom as a matter of fact he did not know remained suspicious and uneasy his brain haunted by all sorts of disquieting suppositions he was in despair at the idea of having to let them go away without learning anything about them especially after having exposed himself if he had only been able to withdraw the more rabid of his biting remarks about the fathers accordingly when monsieur de guersin rose to wash his chin he yielded to a desire to renew the conversation have you heard talk of yesterday's miracle the town is quite upside down with it more than twenty people have already given me an account of what occurred yes it seems they obtained an extraordinary miracle a paralytic young lady got up and dragged her invalid carriage as far as the choir of the basilica Monsieur de Guersin, who was about to sit down after wiping himself, gave a complacent laugh. "'That young lady is my daughter,' he said. Thereupon, under this sudden and fortunate flash of enlightenment, Casabon became all smiles. He felt reassured and combed Monsieur de Guersin's hair with a masterly touch, amid a returning exuberance of speech and gesture. "'Ah, monsieur, I congratulate you. I am flattered at having you in my hands. Since the young lady your daughter is cured, your father's heart is at ease.' am i not right and he also found a few pleasant words for pierre then when he had decided to let them go he looked at the priest with an air of conviction and remarked like a sensible man desirous of coming to a conclusion on the subject of miracles there are some monsieur l'abbé which are good fortunes for everybody from time to time we require one of that description outside monsieur de guersin had to go and fetch the coachman who was still laughing with the servant girl while her dog dripping with water was shaking itself in the sun in five minutes the trap brought them back to the bottom of the plateau de la merlasse the trip had taken a good half hour pierre wanted to keep the conveyance with the idea of showing marie the town without giving her too much fatigue so while the father ran to the grotto to fetch his daughter he waited there beneath the trees the coachman at once engaged in conversation with the priest he had lit another cigarette and showed himself very familiar he came from a village in the environs of toulouse and did not complain for he earned good round sums each day at lourdes you fed well there said he you amused yourself it was what you might call a good neighbourhood he said these things with the abandon of a man who was not troubled with religious scruples but yet did not forget the respect which he owed to an ecclesiastic at last from the top of his box where he remained half lying down dangling one of his legs he allowed this remark to fall slowly from his lips ah yes monsieur l'abbé lourdes has caught on well but the question is whether it will all last long pierre who was very much struck by the remark was pondering on its involuntary profundity when monsieur de guersin reappeared bringing marie with him he had found her kneeling on the same spot in the same act of faith and thankfulness at the feet of the blessed virgin and it seemed as if she had brought all the brilliant light of the grotto away in her eyes so vividly did they sparkle with divine joy at her cure she would not consent to keep the trap no no she preferred to go on foot she did not care about seeing the town so long as she might for another hour continue walking on her father's arm through the gardens the streets the squares anywhere they pleased and when pierre had paid the driver it was she who turned into a path of the esplanade garden delighted at being able to saunter in this wise beside the turf and the flower beds under the great trees the grass the leaves the shady solitary walks where you heard the everlasting rippling of the garve were so sweet and fresh but afterwards she wished to return by way of the streets among the crowd that she might find the agitation noise and life the need of which possessed her whole being in the rue saint joseph 
on perceiving the panorama where the former grotto was depicted with bernadette kneeling down before it on the day of the miracle of the candle the idea occurred to pierre to go in marie became as happy as a child and even monsieur de guersin was full of innocent delight especially when he noticed that among the batch of pilgrims who dived at the same time as themselves into the depths of the obscure corridor several recognized in his daughter the girl so miraculously healed the day before who was already famous and whose name flew from mouth to mouth up above on the circular platform when they came out into the diffuse light filtering through a vellum there was a sort of ovation around marie soft whispers beatifical glances a rapture of delight in seeing following and touching her now glory had come she would be loved in that way wherever she went and it was not until the showman who gave the explanations had placed himself at the head of the little party of visitors and begun to walk round relating the incident depicted on the huge circular canvas nearly five hundred feet in length that she was in some measure forgotten the painting represented the seventeenth apparition of the blessed virgin to bernadette on the day when kneeling before the grotto during her vision she had heedlessly left her hand on the flame of her candle without burning it the whole of the old primitive landscape of the grotto was shown the whole scene was set out with all its historical personages the doctor verifying the miracle watch in hand the mayor the commissary of police and the public prosecutor whose names the showman gave out amidst the amazement of the public following him then by an unconscious transition of ideas pierre recalled the remark which the driver of the cabriolet had made a short time previously lord has caught on well but the question is whether it will all last long that in fact was the question how many venerated sanctuaries had thus been built already at the bidding of innocent chosen children to whom the blessed virgin had shown herself it was always the same story beginning afresh an apparition a persecuted shepherdess who was called a liar next the covert propulsion of human misery hungering after illusion then propaganda and the triumph of the sanctuary shining like a star and afterwards decline and oblivion when the ecstatic dream of another visionary gave birth to another sanctuary elsewhere it seemed as if the power of illusion wore away that it was necessary in the course of centuries to displace it set it amidst new scenery under fresh circumstances in order to renew its force la salette had dethroned the old wooden and stone virgins that had healed lourdes had just dethroned la salette pending the time when it would be dethroned itself by our lady of tomorrow she who will show her sweet consoling features to some pure child as yet unborn only if lourdes had met with such rapid such prodigious fortune it assuredly owed it to the little sincere soul the delightful charm of bernadette here there was no deceit no falsehood merely the blossoming of suffering a delicate sick child who brought to the afflicted multitude her dream of justice and equality in the miraculous she was merely eternal hope eternal consolation besides all historical and social circumstances seem to have combined to increase the need of this mystical flight at the close of a terrible century of positivist inquiry and that was perhaps the reason why lord would still long endure in its triumph before becoming a mere legend one of those dead religions whose powerful perfume has evaporated ah that ancient lord that city of peace and belief the only possible cradle where the legend could come into being how easily pierre conjured it up before him whilst walking round the vast canvas of the panorama that canvas said everything it was the best lesson of things that could be seen the monotonous explanations of the showman were not heard the landscape spoke for itself first of all there was the grotto the rocky hollow beside the gave a savage spot suitable for reverie bushy slopes and heaps of fallen stone without a path among them and nothing yet in the way of ornamentation no monumental quay no garden paths winding among trimly cut shrubs no grotto set in order deformed enclosed with iron railings above all no shop for the sale of religious articles that simony shop which was the scandal of all pious souls the virgin could not have selected a more solitary and charming nook wherein to show herself to the chosen one of her heart the poor young girl who came thither still possessed by the dream of her painful nights even whilst gathering dead wood and on the opposite side of the gave behind the rock of the castle was old lourdes confident and asleep another age was then conjured up a small town with narrow pebble-paved streets black houses with marble dressings and an antique semi-spanish church full of old carvings and peopled with visions of gold and painted flesh communication with other places was only kept up by the bannieres and coterie diligences 
which twice a day forded the la paca to climb the steep causeway of the rue basse the spirit of the century had not breathed on those peaceful roofs sheltering a belated population which had remained childish enclosed within the narrow limits of strict religious discipline there was no debauchery a slow antique commerce sufficed for daily life a poor life whose hardships were the safeguards of morality and pierre had never better understood how bernadette born in that land of faith and honesty had flowered like a natural rose budding on the eglantines of the road it's all the same very curious observed monsieur de garcin when they found themselves in the street again i'm not at all sorry i saw it marie was also laughing with pleasure one would almost think oneself there isn't it so father at times it seems as if the people were going to move and how charming bernadette looks on her knees in ecstasy while the candle flame licks her fingers without burning them let us see said the architect we have only an hour left so we must think of making our purchases if we wish to buy anything shall we take a look at the shops we certainly promised majesty to give him the preference but that does not prevent us from making a few inquiries eh pierre what do you say oh certainly as you like answered the priest besides it will give us a walk and he thereupon followed the young girl and her father who returned to the plateau de la merlasse since he had quitted the panorama he felt as though he no longer knew where he was it seemed to him as if he had all at once been transported from one to another town parted by centuries he had left the solitude the slumbering peacefulness of old lourdes which the dead light of the vellum had increased to fall at last into new lourdes sparkling with brightness and noisy with the crowd ten o'clock had just struck and extraordinary animation reigned on the footways where an entire people was hastening to complete its purchases before breakfast so that it might have nothing but its departure to think of afterwards the thousands of pilgrims of the national pilgrimage streamed along the thoroughfares and besieged the shops in a final scramble you would have taken the cries the jostling and the sudden rushes for those at some fair just breaking up amidst a ceaseless roll of vehicles many providing themselves with provisions for the journey cleared the open-air stalls where bread and slices of sausages and ham were sold others purchased fruit and wine baskets were filled with bottles and greasy parcels until they almost burst a hawker who was wheeling some cheeses about on a small truck saw his goods carried off as if swept away by the wind but what the crowd more particularly purchased were religious articles and those hawkers whose barrows were loaded with statuettes and sacred engravings were reaping golden gains the customers at the shops stood in strings on the pavement the women were belted with immense chaplets had blessed virgins tucked under their arms and were provided with cans which they meant to fill at the miraculous spring carried in the hand or slung from the shoulder some of them quite plain and others daubed over with a lady of lourdes in blue paint these cans held from one to ten quarts apiece and shining with all the brightness of new tin clashing too at times with the sharp jingle of stewpans they added a gay note to the aspect of the noisy multitude and the fever of dealing the pleasure of spending one's money of returning home with one's pockets crammed with photographs and medals lit up all faces with a holiday expression transforming the radiant gathering into a fairfield crowd with appetites either beyond control or satisfied on the plateau de la merlasse monsieur de garcin for a moment felt tempted to enter one of the finest and most patronized shops on the board over which there were these words in large letters soubirou brother of bernadette eh what if we were to make our purchases there it would be more appropriate more interesting to remember however he passed on repeating that they must see everything first of all pierre had looked at the shop kept by bernadette's brother with a heavy heart it grieved him to find the brother selling the blessed virgin whom the sister had beheld however it was necessary to live and he had reason to believe that beside the triumphant basilica resplendent with gold the visionary's relatives were not making a fortune the competition being so terrible if on the one hand the pilgrims left millions behind them at lourdes on the other there were more than two hundred dealers in religious articles to say nothing of the hotel and lodging house keepers to whom the largest part of the spoils fell and thus the gain so eagerly disputed ended by being moderate enough after all along the plateau on the right and left of the repository kept by bernadette's brother other shops appeared an uninterrupted row of them pressing one against the other each occupying a division of a wooden structure a sort of gallery erected by the town which derived from it some sixty thousand francs two thousand four hundred pounds a year 
it formed a regular bazaar of open stalls encroaching on the pavement so as to tempt people to stop as they passed along for more than three hundred yards no other trade was plied a river of chaplets medals and statuettes streamed without end behind the windows and in enormous letters on the boards above appeared the venerated names of saint roche saint joseph jerusalem the immaculate virgin the sacred heart of mary all the names in paradise that were most likely to touch and attract customers really said monsieur de guersin i think it's the same thing all over the place let us go anywhere he himself had had enough of it this interminable display was quite exhausting him but as you promised to make the purchases at majesté's said marie who was not in the least tired the best thing will be to go back that's it let's return to majesté's place but the rows of shops began again in the avenue de la grotte they swarmed on both sides and among them here were jewellers drapers and umbrella makers who also dealt in religious articles there was even a confectioner who sold boxes of pastilles à l'eau de lourdes with a figure of the virgin on the cover a photographer's windows were crammed with views of the grotto and the basilica and portraits of bishops and reverend fathers of all orders mixed up with views of famous sites in the neighboring mountains a bookseller displayed the last catholic publications volumes bearing devout titles and among them the innumerable works published on lourdes during the last twenty years some of which had had a wonderful success which was still fresh in memory in this broad populous thoroughfare the crowd streamed along in more open order their cans jingled every one was in high spirits amid the bright sun rays which enfiladed the road from one end to the other and it seemed as if there would never be a finish to the statuettes the medals and the chaplets one display followed another and indeed there were miles of them running through the streets of the entire town which was ever the same bazaar selling the same articles in front of the hotel of the apparitions monsieur de garcin again hesitated then it's decided we are going to make our purchases there he asked certainly said marie see what a beautiful shop it is and she was the first to enter the establishment which was in fact one of the largest in the street occupying the ground floor of the hotel on the left hand monsieur de guersin and pierre followed her apolline the niece of the majestes who was in charge of the place was standing on a stool taking some holy water vases from a top shelf to show them to a young man an elegant bearer wearing beautiful yellow gaiters she was laughing with the cooing sound of a dove and looked charming with her thick black hair and her superb eyes set in a somewhat square face which had a straight forehead chubby cheeks and full red lips jumping lightly to the ground she exclaimed then you don't think that this pattern would please madame your aunt no no answered the bearer as he went off obtain the other pattern i shall not leave until tomorrow and will come back when apolline learnt that marie was the young person visited by the miracle of whom madame majesté had been talking ever since the previous day she became extremely attentive she looked at her with her merry smile in which there was a dash of surprise and covert incredulity however like the clever saleswoman that she was she was profuse in complimentary remarks ah mademoiselle i shall be so happy to sell to you your miracle is so beautiful look the whole shop is at your disposal we have the largest choice marie was ill at ease thank you she replied you are very good but we have only come to buy a few small things if you will allow us said monsieur de guersin we will choose ourselves very well that's it monsieur afterwards we will see and as some other customers now came in apolline forgot them returned to her duties as a pretty saleswoman with caressing words and seductive glances especially for the gentlemen whom she never allowed to leave until they had their pockets full of purchases Monsieur de Gersin had only two francs left of the louis which Blanche, his eldest daughter, had slipped into his hand when he was leaving, as pocket money, and so he did not dare to make any large selection. But Pierre declared that they would cause him great pain if they did not allow him to offer them the few things which they would like to take away with them from Lourdes. It was therefore understood that they would first of all choose a present for Blanche, and then Marie and her father should select the souvenirs that pleased them best don't let us hurry replied monsieur de guersin who had become very gay come marie have a good look what would be the most likely to please blanche all three looked searched and rummaged but their indecision increased as they went from one object to another with its counters showcases and nests of drawers furnishing it from top to bottom the spacious shop was a sea of endless billows overflowing with all the religious knick-knacks imaginable there were the chaplets 
skeins of chaplets hanging along the walls and heaps of chaplets lying in the drawers from humble ones costing twenty sous a dozen to those of sweet-scented wood agate and lapis lazuli with chains of gold or silver and some of them of immense length made to go twice round the neck or waist had carved beads as large as walnuts separated by death's heads then there were the medals a shower of medals boxes full of medals of all sizes of all metals the cheapest and the most precious they bore different inscriptions they represented the basilica the grotto or the immaculate conception they were engraved repoussé or enamelled executed with care or made by the gross according to the price and next there were the blessed virgins great and small in zinc wood ivory and especially plaster some entirely white others tinted in bright colors in accordance with the description given by bernadette the amiable and smiling face the extremely long veil the blue sash and the golden roses on the feet there being however some slight modification in each model so as to guarantee the copyright and there was another flood of other religious objects a hundred varieties of scapularies a thousand different sorts of sacred pictures fine engravings large chromolithographs in glaring colors submerged beneath a mass of smaller pictures which were colored gilded varnished decorated with bouquets of flowers and bordered with lace paper and there was also jewelry rings brooches and bracelets loaded with stars and crosses and ornamented with saintly figures finally there was the paris article which rose above and submerged all the rest pencil holders purses cigar holders paper weights paper knives even snuff boxes and innumerable other objects on which the basilica grotto and blessed virgin ever and ever appeared reproduced in every way by every process that is known heaped together pell-mell in one of the cases reserved to articles at fifty centimes apiece were napkin rings egg cups and wooden pipes on which was carved the beaming apparition of our lady of lourdes little by little monsieur de guersin with the annoyance of a man who prides himself on being an artist became disgusted and quite sad but all this is frightful frightful he repeated at every new article he took up to look at then he relieved himself by reminding pierre of the ruinous attempt which he had made to improve the artistic quality of religious prints the remains of his fortune had been lost in that attempt and the thought made him all the more angry in presence of the wretched productions with which the shop was crammed had any one ever seen things of such idiotic pretentious complex ugliness the vulgarity of the ideas and the silliness of the expressions portrayed rivalled the commonplace character of the composition you were reminded of fashion plates the covers of confectionery boxes and the wax dolls heads that revolve in the hairdressers windows it was an art of false prettiness painfully childish with no really human touch in it no tone and no sincerity and the architect who was wound up could not stop but went on to express his disgust with the buildings of new lourdes the pitiable disfigurement of the grotto the colossal monstrosity of the inclined ways the disastrous lack of symmetry in the church of the rosary and the basilica the former looking too heavy like a corn market whilst the latter had an anemical structural leanness with no kind of style but the mongrel ah one must really be very fond of god he at last concluded to have courage enough to come and adore him amidst such horrors they have failed in everything spoilt everything as though out of pleasure not one of them has experienced that moment of true feeling of real naturalness and sincere faith which gives birth to masterpieces they are all clever people but all plagiarists not one has given his mind and being to the undertaking and what must they not require then to inspire them since they have failed to produce anything grand even in this land of miracles pierre did not reply but he was very much struck by these reflections which at last gave him an explanation of a feeling of discomfort that he had experienced ever since his arrival at lourdes this discomfort arose from the difference between the modern surroundings and the faith of past ages which it was sought to resuscitate he thought of the old cathedrals where quivered that faith of nations he pictured the former attributes of worship the images the goldsmith's work the saints in wood and stone all of admirable power and beauty of expression the fact was that in those ancient times the workmen had been true believers had given their whole souls and bodies and all the candour of their feelings to their productions just as monsieur de guersin said but nowadays architects built churches with the same practical tranquillity as they erected five-storey houses precisely as the religious articles the chaplets the medals and the statuettes were manufactured by the gross in the populous quarters of paris by merry-making workmen who did not even follow their religion and thus what slop-work what toy-makers ironmongers stuff it all was 
of a prettiness fit to make you cry a silly sentimentality fit to make your heart turn with disgust lourdes was inundated devastated disfigured by it all to such a point as to quite upset persons with any delicacy of taste who happened to stray through its streets it clashed jarringly with the attempted resuscitation of the legends ceremonies and processions of dead ages and all at once it occurred to pierre that the social and historical condemnation of lourdes lay in this that faith is forever dead among a people when it no longer introduces it into the churches it builds or the chaplets it manufactures however marie had continued examining the shelves with the impatience of a child hesitating and finding nothing which seemed to her worthy of the great dream of ecstasy which she would ever keep with her father she said it is getting late you must take me back to the hospital and to make up my mind look i will give blanche this medal with the silver chain after all it's the most simple and prettiest thing here she will wear it it will make her a little piece of jewellery as for myself i will take this statuette of our lady of lourdes this small one which is rather prettily painted i shall place it in my room and surround it with fresh flowers it will be very nice will it not monsieur de guersin approved of her idea and then busied himself with his own choice oh dear oh dear how embarrassed i am said he he was examining some ivory-handled penholders capped with pea-like balls in which were microscopic photographs and while bringing one of the little holes to his eye to look in it he raised an exclamation of mingled surprise and pleasure hallo here's the cirque de gavarnie ah it's prodigious everything is there how can that colossal panorama have been got into so small a space come i'll take this penholder it's curious and will remind me of my excursion pierre had simply chosen a portrait of bernadette the large photograph which represents her on her knees in a black gown with a handkerchief tied over her hair and which is said to be the only one in existence taken from life he hastened to pay and they were all three on the point of leaving when madame majesté entered protested and positively insisted on making marie a little present saying that it would bring her establishment good fortune i beg of you mademoiselle take a scapulary said she look among those there the blessed virgin who chose you will repay me in good luck she raised her voice and made so much fuss that the purchasers filling the shop were interested and began gazing at the girl with envious eyes it was popularity bursting out again around her a popularity which ended even by reaching the street when the landlady went to the threshold of the shop making signs to the tradespeople opposite and putting all the neighbourhood in a flutter let us go repeated marie feeling more and more uncomfortable but her father on noticing a priest come in detained her ah monsieur l'abbé des hermoises it was in fact the handsome abbé clad in a cassock of fine cloth emitting a pleasant odour and with an expression of soft gaiety on his fresh-coloured face he had not noticed his companion of the previous day but had gone straight to apolline and taken her on one side and pierre overheard him saying in a subdued tone why didn't you bring me my three dozen chaplets this morning apolline again began laughing with the cooing notes of a dove and looked at him sideways roguishly without answering they are for my little penitents at toulouse i wanted to place them at the bottom of my trunk and you offered to help me pack my linen she continued laughing and her pretty eyes sparkled however i shall not leave before tomorrow bring them me tonight will you not when you are at liberty it's at the end of the street at duchenne's thereupon with a slight movement of her red lips and in a somewhat bantering way which left him in doubt as to whether she would keep her promise she replied certainly monsieur l'abbé i will go they were now interrupted by monsieur de guersin who came forward to shake the priest's hand and the two men at once began talking again of the cirque de gavarni they had had a delightful trip a most pleasant time which they would never forget then they enjoyed a laugh at the expense of their two companions ecclesiastics of slender means good-natured fellows who had much amused them and the architect ended by reminding his new friend that he had kindly promised to induce a personage at toulouse who was ten times a millionaire to interest himself in his studies on navigable balloons a first advance of a hundred thousand francs would be sufficient he said you can rely on me answered abbe des hermoises you will not have prayed to the blessed virgin in vain however pierre who had kept bernadette's portrait in his hand had just then been struck by the extraordinary likeness between apolline and the visionary it was the same rather massive face the same full thick mouth and the same magnificent eyes 
and he recollected that madame majesté had already pointed out to him this striking resemblance which was all the more peculiar as apolline had passed through a similar poverty-stricken childhood at bartres before her aunt had taken her with her to assist in keeping the shop bernadette apolline what a strange association what an unexpected reincarnation at thirty years distance and all at once with this apolline who was so flightily merry and careless and in regard to whom there were so many odd rumours new lord rose before his eyes the coachmen the candle girls the persons who let rooms and waylaid tenants at the railway station the hundreds of furnished houses with discreet little lodgings the crowd of free priests the lady hospitallers and the simple passers-by who came there to satisfy their appetites then too there was the trading mania excited by the shower of millions the entire town given up to lucre the shops transforming the streets into bazaars which devoured one another the hotels living gluttonously on the pilgrims even to the blue sisters who kept a table d'hote and the fathers of the grotto who coined money with their god what a sad and frightful course of events the vision of pure bernadette in flaming multitudes making them rush to the illusion of happiness bringing a river of gold to the town and from that moment rotting everything the breath of superstition had sufficed to make humanity flock thither to attract abundance of money and to corrupt this honest corner of the earth for ever where the candid lily had formerly bloomed there now grew the carnal rose in the new loam of cupidity and enjoyment bethlehem had become sodom since an innocent child had seen the virgin eh hey, what did i tell you exclaimed madame majesté perceiving that pierre was comparing her niece with the portrait apolline is bernadette all over the young girl approached with her amiable smile flattered at first by the comparison let's see let's see said abbe de hermoise with an air of lively interest he took the photograph in his turn compared it with the girl and then exclaimed in amazement it's wonderful the same features i had not noticed it before really i'm delighted still i fancy she had a larger nose apolline ended by remarking the abbe then raised an exclamation of irresistible admiration oh you are prettier much prettier that's evident but that does not matter any one would take you for two sisters pierre could not refrain from laughing he thought the remark so peculiar ah poor bernadette was absolutely dead and she had no sister she could not have been born again it would have been impossible for her to exist in the region of crowded life and passion which she had made at length marie went off leaning on her father's arm and it was agreed that they would both call and fetch her at the hospital to go to the station together more than fifty people were awaiting her in the street in a state of ecstasy they bowed to her and followed her and one woman even made her infirm child whom she was bringing back from the grotto touch her gown End of section 22section 23 of lourdes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please contact librivox.org lourdes by emil zola translated by ernest visitelli the fifth day three departure at half past two o'clock the white train which was to leave lourdes at three forty was already in the station alongside the second platform for three days it had been waiting on a siding in the same state as when it had come from paris and since it had been run into the station again white flags had been waving from the foremost and hindmost of its carriages by way of preventing any mistakes on the part of the pilgrims whose entraining was usually a very long and troublesome affair moreover all the fourteen trains of the pilgrimage were timed to leave that day the green train had started off at ten o'clock followed by the pink and the yellow train and the others the orange the grey and the blue would start in turn after the white train had taken its departure it was indeed another terrible day's work for the station staff amidst a tumult and a scramble which altogether distracted them however the departure of the white train was always the event of the day which provoked most interest and emotion for it took away with it all the more afflicted patients amongst whom were naturally those loved by the virgin and chosen by her for the miraculous cures accordingly a large serried crowd was collected under the roofing of the spacious platform a hundred yards in length where all the benches were already covered with waiting pilgrims and their parcels 
in the refreshment room at one end of the buildings men were drinking beer and women ordering lemonade at the little tables which had been taken by assault whilst at the other end bearers stood on guard at the goods entrance so as to keep the way clear for the speedy passage of the patients who would soon be arriving and all along the broad platform there was incessant coming and going poor people rushing hither and thither in bewilderment priests trotting along to render assistance gentlemen in frock coats looking on with quiet inquisitiveness indeed all the jumbling and jostling of the most mixed most variegated throng ever elbowed in a railway station at three o'clock however the sick had not yet reached the station and baron suir was in despair his anxiety arising from the dearth of horses for a number of unexpected tourists had arrived at lourdes that morning and hired conveyances for barege cotteret and gavarny at last however the baron espied berteaux and gerard arriving in all haste after scouring the town and when he had rushed up to them they soon pacified him by announcing that things were going splendidly they had been able to procure the needful animals and the removal of the patients from the hospital was now being carried out under the most favourable circumstances squads of bearers with their stretchers and little carts were already in the station yard watching for the arrival of the vans brakes and other vehicles which had been recruited a reserve supply of mattresses and cushions was moreover heaped up beside a lamp-post nevertheless just as the first patients arrived baron suir again lost his head whilst berteaux and gerard hastened to the platform from which the train would start there they began to superintend matters and gave orders amidst an increasing scramble father fourcade was on this platform walking up and down alongside the train on father Massias's arm seeing dr bonhomie approach he stopped short to speak to him ah doctor said he i am pleased to see you father Massias, who was about to leave us was again telling me just now of the extraordinary favour granted by the blessed virgin to that interesting young person mademoiselle marie de garcin there has not been such a brilliant miracle for years it is signal good fortune for us a blessing which should render our labours fruitful all christendom will be illumined comforted enriched by it he was radiant with pleasure and forthwith the doctor with his clean-shaven face heavy peaceful features and usually tired eyes also began to exult yes your reverence it is prodigious prodigious i shall write a pamphlet about it never was cure produced by supernatural means in a more authentic manner ah what a stir it will create then as they had begun walking to and fro again all three together he noticed that father fourcade was dragging his leg with increasing difficulty leaning heavily the while on his companion's arm is your attack of gout worse your reverence he inquired you seem to be suffering a great deal oh don't speak of it i wasn't able to close my eyes all night it is very annoying that this attack should have come on me the very day of my arrival here it might as well have waited but there is nothing to be done so don't let us talk of it any more i am at all events very pleased with this year's result ah yes yes indeed in his turn said father Massias, in a voice which quivered with fervour we may all feel proud and go away with our hearts full of enthusiasm and gratitude how many prodigies there have been in addition to the healing of that young woman you spoke of there is no counting all the miracles deaf women and dumb women have recovered their faculties faces disfigured by sores have become as smooth as the hand moribund consumptives have come to life again and eaten and danced it is not a train of sufferers but a train of resurrection a train of glory that i am about to take back to paris he had ceased to see the ailing creatures around him and in the blindness of his faith was soaring triumphantly then alongside the carriages whose compartments were beginning to fill they all three continued their slow saunter smiling at the pilgrims who bowed to them and at times again stopping to address a kind word to some mournful woman who pale and shivering passed by upon a stretcher they boldly declared that she was looking much better and would assuredly soon get well however the station-master who was incessantly bustling about passed by calling in a shrill voice don't block up the platform please don't block up the platform and on berteaux pointing out to him that it was at all events necessary to deposit the stretchers on the platform before hoisting the patients into the carriages he became quite angry but come come is it reasonable he asked look at that little hand-cart which has been left on the rails over yonder i expect the train to toulouse in a few minutes do you want your people to be crushed to death then he went off at a run to instruct some porters to keep the bewildered flock of pilgrims away from the rails 
many of them old and simple people did not even recognize the color of their train and this was the reason why one and all wore cards of some particular hue hanging from their necks so that they might be led and entrained like marked cattle and what a constant state of excitement it was with the starting of these fourteen special trains in addition to all the ordinary traffic in which no change had been made pierre arrived valise in hand and found some difficulty in reaching the platform he was alone for marie had expressed an ardent desire to kneel once more at the grotto so that her soul might burn with gratitude before the blessed virgin until the last moment and so he had left monsieur de garcin to conduct her thither whilst he himself settled the hotel bill moreover he had made them promise that they would take a fly to the station and they would certainly arrive within a quarter of an hour meantime his idea was to seek their carriage and there rid himself of his valise this however was not an easy task and he only recognized the carriage eventually by the placard which had been swinging from it in the sunlight and the storms during the last three days a square of pasteboard bearing the names of madame de jonquiere and sisters hyacinthe and claire des anges there could be no mistake and pierre again pictured the compartments full of his travelling companions some cushions already marked monsieur sabatier's corner and on the seat where marie had experienced such suffering he still found some scratches caused by the ironwork of her box then having deposited his valise in his own place he remained on the platform waiting and looking around him with a slight feeling of surprise at not perceiving dr chassaigne who had promised to come and embrace him before the train started now that marie was well again pierre had laid his bearer straps aside and merely wore the red cross of the pilgrimage on his cassock the station of which he had caught but a glimpse in the livid dawn amidst the anguish of the terrible morning of their arrival now surprised him by its spacious platforms its broad exits and its clear gaiety he could not see the mountains but some verdant slopes rose up on the other side in front of the waiting rooms and that afternoon the weather was delightfully mild the sky of a milky whiteness with light fleecy clouds veiling the sun whence there fell a broad diffuse light like a nacreous pearly dust maiden's weather as country folk are wont to say the big clock had just struck three and pierre was looking at it when he saw madame des agneaux and madame volmar arrive followed by madame de jonquiere and her daughter these ladies who had driven from the hospital in a landau at once began looking for their carriage and it was raymonde who first recognized the first-class compartment in which she had travelled from paris mamma mamma here here it is she called stay a little while with us you have plenty of time to install yourself among your patients since they haven't yet arrived pierre now again found himself face to face with madame volmar and their glances met however he gave no sign of recognition and on her side there was but a slight sudden drooping of the eyelids she had again assumed the air of a languid indolent black-robed woman who modestly shrinks back well pleased to escape notice her brazier-like eyes no longer glowed it was only at long intervals that they kindled into a spark beneath the veil of indifference the moiré-like shade which dimmed them oh it was a fearful sick headache she was repeating to madame des agneaux and you can see i've hardly recovered the use of my poor head yet it's the journey which brings it on it's the same thing every year however berteau and gerard who had just perceived the ladies were hurrying up to them that morning they had presented themselves at the hospital of our lady of dolour and madame de jonquiere had received them in a little office near the linen room thereupon apologizing with smiling affability for making his request amidst such a hurly-burly berteau had solicited the hand of mademoiselle raymonde for his cousin gerard they at once felt themselves at ease the mother with some show of emotion saying that lourdes would bring the young couple good luck and so the marriage was arranged in a few words amidst general satisfaction a meeting was even appointed for the fifteenth of september at the chateau of berneville near caen an estate belonging to raymond's uncle the diplomatist whom berton knew and to whom he promised to introduce gerard then raymond was summoned and blushed with pleasure as she placed her little hand in those of her betrothed finding her now upon the platform the latter began paying her every attention and asking would you like some pillows for the night don't make any ceremony about it i can give you plenty both for yourself and for these ladies who are accompanying you however raymonde gaily refused the offer no no said she we are not so delicate keep them for the poor sufferers all the ladies were now talking together madame de jonquiere declared that she was so tired so tired that she no longer felt alive 
and yet she displayed great happiness her eyes smiling as she glanced at her daughter and the young man she was engaged to but neither berthaud nor gerard could remain there they had their duties to perform and accordingly took their leave after reminding madame de jonquiere and raymond of the appointed meeting it was understood was it not on september fifteen at the chateau of berneville yes yes it was understood and then came fresh smiles and handshakes while the eyes of the newly engaged couple caressing delighted eyes added all that they dared not say aloud in the midst of such a throng what exclaimed little madame des agneaux you will go to berneville on the fifteenth but if we stay at trouville till the twentieth as my husband wishes to do we will go to see you and then turning towards madame von Mar, who stood there silent she added you ought to come as well my dear it would be so nice to meet there altogether but with a slow wave of the hand and an air of weary indifference madame volmar answered oh my holiday is all over i am going home just then her eyes again met those of pierre who had remained standing near the party and he fancied that she became confused whilst an expression of indescribable suffering passed over her lifeless face the sisters of the assumption were now arriving and the ladies joined them in front of the cantine van Ferrand, who had come with the sisters from the hospital, got into the van, and then helped Sister Saint-François to mount upon the somewhat high footboard. Then he remained standing on the threshold of the van, transformed into a kitchen and containing all sorts of supplies for the journey, such as bread, broth, milk and chocolate, while Sister Hyacinthe and Sister Claire des Anges, who were still on the platform, passed him his little medicine chest and some small articles of luggage. "'You are sure you have everything?' Sister Hyacinthe asked him. "'All right.' Well, now you only have to go and lie down in your corner and get to sleep, since you complain that your services are not utilised. Ferrand began to laugh softly. I shall help Sister Saint-François, said he. I shall light the oil stove, wash the crockery, carry the cups of broth and milk to the patients whenever we stop, according to the timetable hanging yonder. And if all the same you should require a doctor, you will please come to fetch me. Sister Hyacinthe had also begun to laugh. But we no longer require a doctor since all our patients are cured she replied and fixing her eyes on his with her calm sisterly air she added good-bye monsieur ferrand he smiled again whilst a feeling of deep emotion brought moisture to his eyes the tremulous accents of his voice expressed his conviction that he would never be able to forget this journey his joy at having seen her again and the souvenir of divine and eternal affection which he was taking away with him good-bye sister said he then madame de jonquiere talked of going to her carriage with sister claire des anges and sister hyacinthe but the latter assured her that there was no hurry since the sick pilgrims were as yet scarcely arriving she left her therefore taking the other sister with her and promising to see to everything moreover she even insisted on ridding the superintendent of her little bag saying that she would find it on her seat when it was time for her to come thus the ladies continued walking and chatting gaily on the broad platform where the atmosphere was so pleasant Pierre, however, his eyes fixed upon the big clock, watched the minutes hasten by on the dial, and began to feel surprised at not seeing Marie arrive with her father. It was to be hoped that Monsieur de Gersin would not lose himself on the road. The young priest was still watching when, to his surprise, he caught sight of Monsieur Vigneron, in a state of perfect exasperation, pushing his wife and little Gustave furiously before him. Oh, Monsieur l'abbé, he exclaimed, tell me where our carriage is. Help me to put our luggage and this child in it. I am at my wit's end. They have made me altogether lose my temper. Then, on reaching the second-class compartment, he caught hold of Pierre's hands, just as the young man was about to place little Gustave inside, and quite an outburst followed. Could you believe it? They insist on my starting. They tell me that my return ticket will not be available if I wait here till tomorrow. It was of no use my telling them about the accident. As it is, it's by no means pleasant to have to stay with that corpse, watch over it, see it put in a coffin and remove it tomorrow within the regulation time. But they pretend that it doesn't concern them, that they already make large enough reductions on the pilgrimage tickets, and that they can't enter into any questions of people dying. Madame Vigneron stood all of a tremble listening to him, whilst Gustave, forgotten, staggering on his crutch with fatigue, raised his poor inquisitive suffering face. But at all events, continued the irate father, as I told them, it's a case of compulsion. What do they expect me to do with that corpse? I can't take it under my arm and bring it them today like an article of luggage. I am therefore absolutely obliged to remain behind. But no, ah, oh, how many stupid and wicked people there are. 
have you spoken to the station master asked pierre the station master oh he's somewhere about in the midst of the scramble they were never able to find him how could you have anything done properly in such a bear garden still i mean to rout him out and give him a bit of my mind then perceiving his wife standing beside him motionless glued as it were to the platform he cried what are you doing there get in so that we may pass you the youngster and the parcels with these words he pushed her in and threw the parcels after her whilst the young priest took gustave in his arms the poor little fellow who was as light as a bird seemingly thinner than before consumed by sores and so full of pain raised a faint cry oh my dear child have i hurt you asked pierre no no monsieur l'abbé but i've been moved about so much to-day and i'm very tired this afternoon as he spoke he smiled with his usual intelligent and mournful expression and then sinking back into his corner closed his eyes exhausted indeed done for by this fearful trip to lourdes as you can very well understand now resumed monsieur vigneron it by no means amuses me to stay here kicking my heels while my wife and my son go back to paris without me they have to go however for life at the hotel is no longer bearable and besides if i kept them with me and the railway people won't listen to reason i should have to pay three extra fares and to make matters worse my wife hasn't got much brains i'm afraid she won't be able to manage things properly then almost breathless he overwhelmed madame vigneron with the most minute instructions what she was to do during the journey how she was to get back home on arriving in paris and what steps she was to take if gustave should have another attack somewhat scared she responded in all docility to each recommendation yes yes dear of course dear of course but all at once her husband's rage came back to him after all he shouted what i want to know is whether my return ticket be good or not i must know for certain they must find that station master for me he was already on the point of rushing away through the crowd when he noticed gustave's crutch lying on the platform this was disastrous and he raised his eyes to heaven as though to call providence to witness that he would never be able to extricate himself from such awful complications and throwing the crutch to his wife he hurried off distracted and shouting there take it you forget everything the sick pilgrims were now flocking into the station and as on the occasion of their arrival there was endless disorderly carting along the platform and across the lines all the abominable ailments all the sores all the deformities went past once more neither their gravity nor their number seeming to have decreased for the few cures which had been effected were but like a faint inappreciable gleam of light amidst the general mourning they were taken back as they had come the little carts laden with helpless old women with their bags at their feet grated over the rails the stretchers on which you saw inflated bodies and pale faces with glittering eyes swayed amidst the jostling of the throng there was wild and senseless haste indescribable confusion questions calls sudden running all the whirling of a flock which cannot find the entrance to the pen and the bearers ended by losing their heads no longer knowing which direction to take amidst the warning cries of the porters who at each moment were frightening people distracting them with anguish take care take care over there make haste no no don't cross the toulouse train the toulouse train retracing his steps pierre again perceived the ladies madame de jonquiere and the others still gaily chatting together lingering near them he listened to berteau whom father fourcade had stopped to congratulate him on the good order which had been maintained throughout the pilgrimage the ex-public prosecutor was now bowing his thanks feeling quite flattered by this praise is it not a lesson for their republic your reverence he asked people get killed in paris when such crowds as these celebrate some bloody anniversary of their hateful history they ought to come and take a lesson here he was delighted with the thought of being disagreeable to the government which had compelled him to resign he was never so happy as when women were just saved from being knocked over amidst the great concourse of believers at lourdes however he did not seem to be satisfied with the results of the political propaganda which he came to further there during three days every year fits of impatience came over him things did not move fast enough when did our lady of lourdes mean to bring back the monarchy you see your reverence said he the only means the real triumph would be to bring the working classes of the towns here en masse i shall cease dreaming i shall devote myself to that entirely ah if one could only create a catholic democracy father fourcade had become very grave his fine intelligent eyes filled with a dreamy expression and wandered far away how many times already had he himself made the creation of that new people the object of his efforts 
but was not the breath of a new messiah needed for the accomplishment of such a task yes yes he murmured a catholic democracy ah the history of humanity would begin afresh but father Marcias interrupted him in a passionate voice saying that all the nations of the earth would end by coming whilst dr bonami who already detected a slight subsidence of fervour among the pilgrims wagged his head and expressed the opinion that the faithful ones of the grotto ought to increase their zeal to his mind success especially depended on the greatest possible measure of publicity being given to the miracles and he assumed a radiant air and laughed complacently whilst pointing to the tumultuous defile of the sick look at them said he don't they go off looking better there are a great many who although they don't appear to be cured are nevertheless carrying the germs of cure away with them of that you may be certain ah the good people they do far more than we do all together for the glory of our lady of lourdes however he had to check himself for madame de la fay was passing before them in her box lined with quilted silk she was deposited in front of the door of the first-class carriage in which a maid was already placing the luggage pity came to all who beheld the unhappy woman for she did not seem to have awakened from her prostration during her three days sojourn at lourdes what she had been when they had removed her from the carriage on the morning of her arrival that she also was now when the bearers were about to place her inside it again clad in lace covered with jewels still with the lifeless imbecile face of a mummy slowly liquefying and indeed you might have thought that she had become yet more wasted that she was being taken back diminished shrunken more and more to the proportions of a child by the march of that horrible disease which after destroying her bones was now dissolving the softened fibres of her muscles inconsolable bowed down by the loss of their last hope her husband and sister their eyes red were following her with abbe Juden, even as one follows a corpse to the grave no no not yet said the old priest to the bearers in order to prevent them from placing the box in the carriage she will have time enough to roll along in there let her have the warmth of that lovely sky above her till the last possible moment then seeing pierre near him he drew him a few steps aside and in a voice broken by grief resumed ah i am indeed distressed again this morning i had a hope i had her taken to the grotto i said my mass for her and came back to pray till eleven o'clock but nothing came of it the blessed virgin did not listen to me although she cured me a poor useless old man like me i could not obtain from her the cure of this beautiful young and wealthy woman whose life ought to be a continual fete undoubtedly the blessed virgin knows what she ought to do better than ourselves and i bow myself and bless her name nevertheless my soul is full of frightful sadness he did not tell everything he did not confess the thought which was upsetting him simple childish worthy man that he was whose life had never been troubled by either passion or doubt but his thought was that those poor weeping people the husband and the sister had too many millions that the presents they had brought were too costly that they had given far too much money to the basilica a miracle is not to be bought the wealth of the world is a hindrance rather than an advantage when you address yourself to god assuredly if the blessed virgin had turned a deaf ear to their entreaties had shown them but a stern cold countenance it was in order that she might the more attentively listen to the weak voices of the lowly ones who had come to her with empty hands with no other wealth than their love and these she had loaded with grace flooded with the glowing affection of her divine motherhood and those poor wealthy ones who had not been heard that sister and that husband both so wretched beside the sorry body they were taking away with them they themselves felt like pariahs among the throng of the humble who had been consoled or healed they seemed embarrassed by their very luxury and recoiled awkward and ill at ease covered with shame at the thought that our lady of lourdes had relieved beggars whilst never casting a glance upon that beautiful and powerful lady agonizing unto death amidst all her lace all at once it occurred to pierre that he might have missed seeing monsieur de garcin and marie arrive that they were perhaps already in the carriage he returned thither but there was still only his valise on the seat sister hyacinthe and sister claire des anges however had begun to install themselves pending the arrival of their charges and as gerard just then brought up monsieur sabatier in a little handcart pierre helped to place him in the carriage a laborious task which put both the young priest and gerard into a perspiration the ex-professor who looked disconsolate though very calm at once settled himself in his corner thank you gentlemen said he that's over thank goodness and now they'll only have to take me out at paris 
after wrapping a rug round his legs madame sabatier who was also there got out of the carriage and remained standing near the open door she was talking to pierre when all at once she broke off to say ah here's madame mars coming to take her seat she confided in me the other day you know she's a very unhappy little woman then in an obliging spirit she called to her and offered to watch over her things but madame mars shook her head laughed and gesticulated as though she were out of her senses no no i'm not going said she what you are not going back no no i am not going that is i am but not with you not with you she wore such an extraordinary air she looked so bright that pierre and madame sabatier found it difficult to recognize her her fair prematurely faded face was radiant she seemed to be ten years younger suddenly aroused from the infinite sadness into which desertion had plunged her and at last her joy overflowing she raised a cry i am going off with him yes he has come to fetch me he is taking me with him yes yes we are going to luchon together together then with a rapturous glance she pointed out a dark sturdy-looking young man with gay eyes and bright red lips who was purchasing some newspapers there that's my husband said she that handsome man who's laughing over there with the newspaper girl he turned up here early this morning and he's carrying me off we shall take the toulouse train in a couple of minutes ah oh, dear madame i told you of all my worries and you can understand my happiness can't you however she could not remain silent but again spoke of the frightful letter which she had received on sunday a letter in which he had declared to her that if she should take advantage of her sojourn at lourdes and come to luchon after him he would not open the door to her and think of it theirs had been a love match but for ten years he had neglected her profiting by his continual journeys as a commercial traveller to take friends about with him from one to the other end of france ah that time she had thought it all over she had asked the blessed virgin to let her die for she knew that the faithless one was at that very moment at luchon with two friends what was it then that had happened a thunderbolt must certainly have fallen from heaven those two friends must have received a warning from on high perhaps they had dreamt that they were already condemned to everlasting punishment at all events they had fled one evening without a word of explanation and he unable to live alone had suddenly been seized with the desire to fetch his forsaken wife and keep her with him for a week grace must certainly have fallen on him though he did not say it for he was so kind and pleasant that she could not do otherwise than believe in a real beginning of conversion ah how grateful i am to the blessed virgin she continued she alone can have acted and i well understood her last evening it seemed to me that she made a little sign just at the very moment when my husband was making up his mind to come here to fetch me i asked him at what time it was that the idea occurred to him and the hours fit in exactly ah there has been no greater miracle the others make me smile with their mended legs and their vanished sores blessed be our lady of lourdes who has healed my heart just then the sturdy young man turned round and she darted away to join him so full of delight that she forgot to bid the others good-bye and it was at this moment amidst the growing crowd of patients whom the bearers were bringing that the toulouse train at last came in the tumult increased the confusion became extraordinary bells rang and signals worked whilst the station-master was seen rushing up shouting with all the strength of his lungs be careful there clear the line at once a railway employé had to rush from the platform to push a little vehicle which had been forgotten on the line with an old woman in it out of harm's way however yet another scared band of pilgrims ran across when the steaming growling engine was only thirty yards distant others losing their heads would have been crushed by the wheels if porters had not roughly caught them by the shoulders then without having pounded anybody the train at last stopped alongside the mattresses pillows and cushions lying hither and thither and the bewildered whirling groups of people the carriage doors opened and a torrent of travellers alighted whilst another torrent climbed in these two obstinately contending currents bringing the tumult to a climax faces first wearing an inquisitive expression and then overcome by stupefaction at the astonishing sight showed themselves at the windows of the doors which remained closed and among them one especially noticed the faces of two remarkably pretty girls whose large candid eyes ended by expressing the most dolorous compassion followed by her husband however madame mars had climbed into one of the carriages feeling as happy and buoyant as if she were in her twentieth year again as on the already distant evening of her honeymoon journey and the doors having been slammed the engine gave a loud whistle and began to move 
going off slowly and heavily between the throng which in the rear of the train flowed on to the lines again like an invading torrent whose floodgates have been swept away bar the platform shouted the station master to his men keep watch when the engine comes up the belated pilgrims and patients had arrived amidst this alert la grivotte passed by with her feverish eyes and excited dancing gait followed by elise rouquet and sophie couteau who were very gay and quite out of breath through running all three hastened to their carriage where sister hyacinthe scolded them they had almost been left behind at the grotto where at times the pilgrims lingered forgetfully unable to tear themselves away still imploring and entreating the blessed virgin when the train was waiting for them at the railway station all at once pierre who likewise was anxious no longer knowing what to think perceived monsieur de guersin and marie quietly talking with abbe Juden on the covered platform he hastened to join them and told them of his impatience what have you been doing he asked i was losing all hope what have we been doing responded monsieur de guersin with quiet astonishment we were at the grotto as you know very well there was a priest there preaching in a most remarkable manner and we should still be there if i hadn't remembered that we had to leave and we took a fly here as we promised you we would do he broke off to look at the clock but hang it all he added there's no hurry the train won't start for another quarter of an hour this was true then marie smiling with divine joy exclaimed oh if you only knew pierre what happiness i have brought away from that last visit to the blessed virgin i saw her smile at me i felt her giving me strength to live really that farewell was delightful and you must not scold us pierre he himself had begun to smile somewhat ill at ease however as he thought of his nervous fidgeting had he then experienced so keen a desire to get far away from lourdes had he feared that the grotto might keep marie that she might never come away from it again now that she was there beside him he was astonished at having indulged such thoughts and felt himself to be very calm however whilst he was advising them to go and take their seats in the carriage he recognized dr chassaigne hastily approaching ah my dear doctor he said i was waiting for you i should have been sorry indeed to have gone away without embracing you but the old doctor who was trembling with emotion interrupted him yes yes i am late but ten minutes ago just as i arrived i caught sight of that eccentric fellow the commander and had a talk with him over yonder he was sneering at the sight of your people taking the train again to go and die at home when said he they ought to have done so before coming to lourdes well all at once while he was talking like this he fell on the ground before me it was his third attack of paralysis the one he had long been expecting oh mon dieu murmured abbe Juden, who heard the doctor he was blaspheming heaven has punished him monsieur de guersin and marie were listening greatly interested and deeply moved i had him carried yonder into that shed continued the doctor it is all over i can do nothing he will doubtless be dead before a quarter of an hour has gone by but i thought of a priest and hastened up to you then turning towards abbe Juden, monsieur chassaigne added come with me monsieur le cure you know him we cannot let a christian depart unsuccored perhaps he will be moved recognize his error and become reconciled with god abbe Juden quickly followed the doctor and in the rear went monsieur de guersin leading marie and pierre whom the thought of this tragedy impassioned all five entered the good shed at twenty paces from the crowd which was still bustling and buzzing without a soul in it suspecting that there was a man dying so near by in a solitary corner of the shed between two piles of sacks filled with oats lay the commander on a mattress borrowed from the hospitality's reserve supply he wore his everlasting frock coat with its buttonhole decked with a broad red riband and somebody who had taken the precaution to pick up his silver knobbed walking stick had carefully placed it on the ground beside the mattress abbe Juden at once leant over him you recognize us you can hear us my poor friend can't you answered the priest only the commander's eyes now appeared to be alive but they were alive still glittering brightly with a stubborn flame of energy the attack had this time fallen on his right side almost entirely depriving him of the power of speech he could only stammer a few words by which he succeeded in making them understand that he wished to die there without being moved or worried any further he had no relative at lourdes where nobody knew anything either of his former life or his family for three years he had lived there happily on the salary attached to his little post at the station and now he at last beheld his ardent his only desire approaching fulfilment the desire that he might depart and fall into the eternal sleep 
his eyes expressed the great joy he felt at being so near his end have you any wish to make known to us resumed abbe Jeden. cannot we be useful to you in any way no no his eyes replied that he was all right well pleased for three years past he had never got up in the morning without hoping that by night-time he would be sleeping in the cemetery whenever he saw the sunshine he was wont to say in an envious tone what a beautiful day for departure and now that death was at last at hand ready to deliver him from his hateful existence it was indeed welcome i can do nothing science is powerless he is condemned said dr chassaigne in a low bitter tone to the old priest who begged him to attempt some effort however at the same moment it chanced that an aged woman a pilgrim of fourscore years who had lost her way and knew not whither she was going entered the shed lame and humpbacked reduced to the stature of childhood's days afflicted with all the ailments of extreme old age she was dragging herself along with the assistance of a stick and at her side was slung a can full of lured water which she was taking away with her in the hope of yet prolonging her old age in spite of all its frightful decay for a moment her senile imbecile mind was quite scared she stood looking at that outstretched stiffened man who was dying then a gleam of grandmotherly kindliness appeared in the depths of her dim vague eyes and with the sisterly feelings of one who was very aged and suffered very grievously she drew nearer and taking hold of her can with her hands which never ceased shaking she offered it to the man to abbe Juden this seemed like a sudden flash of light an inspiration from on high he who had prayed so fervently and so often for the cure of madame de la fee without being heard by the blessed virgin now glowed with fresh faith in the conviction that if the commander would only drink that water he would be cured the old priest fell upon his knees beside the mattress o oh, brother he said it is god who has sent you this woman reconcile yourself with god drink and pray whilst we ourselves implore the divine mercy with our whole souls god will prove his power to you god will work the great miracle of setting you erect once more so that you may yet spend many years upon this earth loving him and glorifying him no no the commander's sparkling eyes cried no he indeed show himself as cowardly as those flocks of pilgrims who came from afar through so many fatigues in order to drag themselves on the ground and sob and beg heaven to let them live a month a year ten years longer it was so pleasant so simple to die quietly in your bed you turned your face to the wall and you died drink oh my brother i implore you continued the old priest it is life that you will drink it is strength and health the very joy of living drink that you may become young again that you may begin a new and pious life drink that you may sing the praises of the divine mother who will have saved both your body and your soul she is speaking to me your resurrection is certain but no but no the eyes refused declined the offer of life with growing obstinacy and in their expression now appeared a covert fear of the miraculous the commander did not believe for three years he had been shrugging his shoulders at the pretended cases of cure but could one ever tell in this strange world of ours such extraordinary things did sometimes happen and if by chance their water should really have a supernatural power and if by force they should make him drink some of it it would be terrible to have to live again to endure once more the punishment of a galley slave existence that abomination which lazarus the pitiable object of the great miracle had suffered twice no no he would not drink he would not incur the fearful risk of resurrection drink drink my brother repeated abbe Juden, who was now in tears do not harden your heart to refuse the favours of heaven and then a terrible thing was seen this man already half dead raised himself shaking off the stifling bonds of paralysis loosening for a second his tied tongue and stammering growling in a hoarse voice no 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 pierre had to lead the stupefied old woman away and put her in the right direction again she had failed to understand that refusal of the water which she herself was taking home with her like an inestimable treasure the very gift of god's eternity to the poor who did not wish to die lame of one leg humpbacked, dragging the sorry remnants of her fourscore years along by the assistance of her stick she disappeared among the tramping crowd consumed by the passion of being eager for space air sunshine and noise marie and her father had shuddered in presence of that appetite for death that greedy hungering for the end which the commander showed 
ah to sleep to sleep without a dream in the infinite darkness forever and forever nothing in the world could have seemed so sweet to him he did not hope in a better life he had no desire to become happy at last in a paradise where equality and justice would reign his sole longing was for black night and endless sleep the joy of being no more of never never being again and dr chassaigne also had shuddered for he also nourished but one thought the thought of the happy moment when he would depart but in his case on the other side of this earthly existence he would find his dear lost ones awaiting him at the spot where eternal life began and how icy cold all would have seemed had he but for a single moment thought that he might not meet them there abbe Judaine painfully rose up it had seemed to him that the commander was now fixing his bright eyes upon marie deeply grieved that his entreaties should have been of no avail the priest wished to show the dying man an example of that goodness of god which he repulsed you recognize her do you not he asked yes it is the young lady who arrived here on saturday so ill with both legs paralyzed and you see her now so full of health so strong so beautiful heaven has taken pity on her and now she is reviving to youth to the long life she was born to live do you feel no regret in seeing her would you also like her to be dead would you have advised her not to drink the water the commander could not answer but his eyes no longer strayed from marie's young face on which one read such great happiness at having resuscitated such vast hopes in countless morrows and tears appeared in those fixed eyes of his gathered under their lids and rolled down his cheeks which were already cold he was certainly weeping for her he must have been thinking of that other miracle which he had wished her that if she should be cured she might be happy it was the tenderness of an old man who knows the miseries of this world stirred to pity by the thought of all the sorrows which await this young creature ah poor woman how many times perhaps might she regret that she had not died in her twentieth year then the commander's eyes grew very dim as though those last pitiful tears had dissolved them it was the end coma was coming the mind was departing with the breath he slightly turned and died dr chassaigne at once drew marie aside the train's starting he said make haste make haste indeed the loud ringing of a bell was clearly resounding above the growing tumult of the crowd and the doctor having requested two bearers to watch the body which would be removed later on when the train had gone desired to accompany his friends to their carriage they hastened their steps abbe juden who was in despair joined them after saying a short prayer for the repose of that rebellious soul however while marie followed by pierre and monsieur de garcin was running along the platform she was stopped once more and this time by dr bonamy who triumphantly presented her to father fourcade here is mademoiselle de garcin your reverence the young lady who was healed so marvellously yesterday the radiant smile of a general who was reminded of his most decisive victory appeared on father fourcade's face i know i know i was there he replied god has blessed you among all women my dear daughter go and cause his name to be worshipped then he congratulated monsieur de garcin whose paternal pride savoured divine enjoyment it was the ovation beginning afresh the concert of loving words and enraptured glances which had followed the girl through the streets of lourdes that morning and which again surrounded her at the moment of departure the bell might go on ringing a circle of delighted pilgrims still lingered around her it seemed as if she were carrying away in her person all the glory of the pilgrimage the triumph of religion which would echo and echo to the four corners of the earth and pierre was moved as he noticed the dolorous group which madame jousseur and monsieur dieu le fay formed near by their eyes were fixed upon marie like the others they were astonished by the resurrection of this beautiful girl whom they had seen lying inert emaciated with ashen face why should that child have been healed why not the young woman the dear woman whom they were taking home in a dying state their confusion their sense of shame seemed to increase they drew back uneasy like pariahs burdened with too much wealth and it was a great relief for them when three bearers having with difficulty placed madame de la fay in the first class compartment they themselves were able to vanish into it in company with abbe juden the employés were already shouting take your seats take your seats and father macias the spiritual director of the train had returned to his compartment leaving father fourcade on the platform leaning on dr bonamy's shoulder 
in all haste gerard and berteau again saluted the ladies while raymonde got in to join madame des agneaux and madame volmar in their corner and madame de jonquiere at last ran off to her carriage which she reached at the same time as the gersins there was hustling and shouting and wild running from one to the other end of the long train to which the engine a copper engine glittering like a star had just been coupled pierre was helping marie into the carriage when monsieur vigneron coming back at a gallop shouted to him it'll be good to-morrow it'll be good to-morrow very red in the face he showed and waved his ticket and then galloped off to the compartment where his wife and son had their seats in order to announce the good news to them when marie and her father were installed in their places pierre lingered for another moment on the platform with dr chassaigne who embraced him paternally the young man wished to induce the doctor to return to paris and take some little interest in life again but m chassaigne shook his head no no my dear child he replied i shall remain here they are here they keep me here he was speaking of his dear lost ones then very gently and lovingly he said farewell not farewell my dear doctor till we meet again yes yes farewell the commander was right you know nothing can be so sweet as to die but to die in order to live again baron Swier was now giving orders for the removal of the white flags on the foremost and hindmost carriages of the train the shouts of the railway employés were ringing out in more and more imperious tones take your seats take your seats and now came the supreme scramble the torrent of belated pilgrims rushing up distracted breathless and covered with perspiration madame de jonquiere and sister hyacinthe were counting their party in the carriage la grivotte elise rouquet and sophie Couteau were all three there madame sabatier too had taken her seat in front of her husband who with his eyes half closed was patiently awaiting the departure however a voice inquired and madame vincent isn't she going back with us thereupon sister hyacinthe who was leaning out of the window exchanging a last smile with ferron who stood at the door of the cantine van exclaimed here she comes madame vincent crossed the lines rushed up the last of all breathless and haggard and at once by an involuntary impulse pierre glanced at her arms they carried nothing now all the doors were being closed slammed one after the other the carriages were full and only the signal for departure was awaited panting and smoking the engine gave vent to a first loud whistle shrill and joyous and at that moment the sun hitherto veiled from sight dissipated the light cloudlets and made the whole train resplendent gilding the engine which seemed on the point of starting for the legendary paradise no bitterness but a divine infantile gaiety attended the departure all the sick appeared to be healed though most of them were being taken away in the same condition as they had been brought they went off relieved and happy at all events for an hour and not the slightest jealousy tainted their brotherly and sisterly feelings those who were not cured waxed quite gay triumphant at the cure of the others their own turns would surely come yesterday's miracle was the formal promise of tomorrow's even after those three days of burning entreaty their fever of desire remained within them the faith of the forgotten ones continued as keen as ever in the conviction that the blessed virgin had simply deferred a cure for their soul's benefit inextinguishable love invincible hope glowed within all those wretched ones thirsting for life and so a last outburst of joy a turbulent display of happiness laughter and shouts overflowed from all the crowded carriages till next year we'll come back we'll come back again was the cry and then the gay little sisters of the assumption clapped their hands and the hymn of gratitude the magnificat began sung by all the eight hundred pilgrims magnificat anima mea dominum my soul doth magnify the lord thereupon the station-master his mind at last at ease his arms hanging beside him caused the signal to be given the engine whistled once again and then set out rolling along in the dazzling sunlight as amidst a glory although his leg was causing him great suffering father fourcade had remained on the platform leaning upon dr bonamy's shoulders and in spite of everything saluting the departure of his dear children with a smile berteau gerard and baron suir formed another group and near them were dr chassaigne and monsieur vigneron waving their handkerchiefs heads were looking joyously out of the windows of the fleeing carriages whence other handkerchiefs were streaming in the current of air produced by the motion of the train madame vigneron compelled gustave to show his pale little face and for a long time raymonde's small hand could be seen waving good wishes but marie remained the last looking back on lourdes as it grew smaller and smaller amidst the trees 
across the bright countryside the train triumphantly disappeared resplendent growling chanting at the full pitch of its eight hundred voices et exultavit spiritus meus in deo salutari meo and my spirit hath rejoiced in god my saviour end of section twenty three Section 24 of Lourdes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Lourdes by Emil Zola. Translated by Ernest Visitelli. The Fifth Day. 4. Marie's Vow. Once more was the white train rolling, rolling towards Paris on its way home and the third-class carriage where the shrill voices singing the magnificat at full pitch rose above the growling of the wheels had again become a common room a travelling hospital ward full of disorder littered like an improvised ambulance basins and brooms and sponges lay about under the seats which half concealed them articles of luggage all the wretched mass of poor worn-out things were heaped together a little bit everywhere and up above the litter began again what with the parcels the baskets and the bags hanging from the brass pegs and swinging to and fro without a moment's rest the same sisters of the assumption and the same lady hospitallers were there with their patients amidst the contingent of healthy pilgrims who were already suffering from the overpowering heat and unbearable odour and at the far end there was again the compartment full of women the ten close-packed female pilgrims some young some old and all looking pitifully ugly as they violently chanted the canticle in cracked and woeful voices at what time shall we reach paris monsieur de garcin inquired of pierre to-morrow at about two in the afternoon i think the priest replied since starting marie had been looking at the latter with an air of anxious preoccupation as though haunted by a sudden sorrow which she could not reveal however she found her gay healthful smile again to say twenty-two hours journey ah it won't be so long and trying as it was coming besides resumed her father we have left some of our people behind we have plenty of room now in fact, Madame Maz's absence left a corner free at the end of the seat which Marie, now sitting up like any other passenger, no longer encumbered with her box. Moreover, little Sophie had this time been placed in the next compartment, where there was neither brother Isidore nor his sister Marthe. The latter, it was said, had remained at Lourdes in service with a pious lady. On the other side, Madame de Jonquière and sister Hyacinthe also had the benefit of a vacant seat, that of Madame Vétu and it had further occurred to them to get rid of elise rouquet by placing her with sophie so that only la grivotte and the sabatier couple were with them in their compartment thanks to these new arrangements they were better able to breathe and perhaps they might manage to sleep a little the last verse of the magnificat having been sung the ladies finished installing themselves as comfortably as possible by setting their little household in order one of the most important matters was to put the zinc water can which interfered with their legs out of the way all the blinds of the left-hand windows had been pulled down for the oblique sun-rays were falling on the train and had poured into it in sheets of fire the last storms however must have laid the dust and the night would certainly be cool moreover there was less suffering death had carried off the most afflicted ones and only stupefied ailments numbed by fatigue and lapsing into a slow torpor remained the overpowering reaction which always follows great moral shocks was about to declare itself the souls had made the efforts required of them the miracles had been worked and now the relaxing was beginning amidst a hebitude tinged with profound relief until they got to tarbes they were all very much occupied in setting things in order and making themselves comfortable but as they left that station sister hyacinthe rose up and clapped her hands my children said she we must not forget the blessed virgin who has been so kind to us let us begin the rosary then the whole carriage repeated the first chaplet the five joyful mysteries the annunciation the visitation the nativity the purification and the finding of jesus in the temple and afterwards they intoned the canticle let us contemplate the heavenly archangel in such loud voices that the peasants working in the fields raised their heads to look at this singing train as it rushed past them at full speed marie was at the window gazing with admiration at the vast landscape and the immense stretch of sky which had gradually freed itself of its mist and was now of a dazzling blue it was the delicious close of a fine day however she at last looked back into the carriage and her eyes were fixing themselves on pierre with that mute sadness which had previously dimmed them when all at once a sound of furious sobbing burst forth in front of her 
the canticle was finished and it was madame vincent who was crying stammering confused words half choked by her tears ah my poor little one she gasped ah my jewel my treasure my life she had previously remained in her corner shrinking back into it as though anxious to disappear with a fierce face her lips tightly set and her eyes closed as though to isolate herself in the depths of her cruel grief she had hitherto not said a word but chancing to open her eyes she had espied the leathern window strap hanging down beside the door and the sight of that strap which her daughter had touched almost played with at one moment during the previous journey had overwhelmed her with a frantic despair which swept away her resolution to remain silent ah my poor little rose she continued her little hand touched that strap she turned it and looked at it ah it was her last plaything and we were there both together then she was still alive i still had her on my lap in my arms it was still so nice so nice but now i no longer have her i shall never never have her again my poor little rose my poor little rose distracted sobbing bitterly she looked at her knees and her arms on which nothing now rested and which she was at a loss how to employ she had so long rocked her daughter on her knees so long carried her in her arms that it now seemed to her as if some portion of her being had been amputated as if her body had been deprived of one of its functions leaving her diminished unoccupied distracted at being unable to fulfil that function any more those useless arms and knees of hers quite embarrassed her pierre and marie who were deeply moved had drawn near uttering kind words and striving to console the unhappy mother and little by little from the disconnected sentences which mingled with her sobs they learned what a calvary she had ascended since her daughter's death on the morning of the previous day when she had carried the body off in her arms amidst the storm she must have long continued walking blind and deaf to everything whilst the torrential rain beat down upon her she no longer remembered what squares she had crossed what streets she had traversed as she roamed through that infamous lord that lord which killed little children that lord which she cursed ah i can't remember i can't remember she faltered but some people took me in had pity upon me some people whom i don't know but who live somewhere ah i can't remember where but it was somewhere high up far away at the other end of the town and they were certainly very poor folk for i can still see myself in a poor-looking room with my dear little one who was quite cold and whom they laid upon their bed at this recollection a fresh attack of sobbing shook her in fact almost stifled her no no she at last resumed i would not part with her dear little body by leaving it in that abominable town and i can't tell exactly how it happened but it must have been those poor people who took me with them we did a great deal of walking oh a great deal of walking we saw all those gentlemen of the pilgrimage and the railway what can it matter to you i repeated to them let me take her back to paris in my arms i brought her here like that when she was alive i may surely take her back dead nobody will notice anything people will think that she is asleep and all of them all those officials began shouting and driving me away as though i were asking them to let me do something wicked then i ended by telling them my mind when people make so much fuss and bring so many agonizing sick to a place like that they surely ought to send the dead ones home again ought they not and do you know how much money they ended by asking of me at the station three hundred francs yes it appears it is the price three hundred francs good lord of me who came here with thirty sous in my pocket and have only five left why i don't earn that amount of money by six months sewing they ought to have asked me for my life i would have given it so willingly three hundred francs three hundred francs for that poor little bird-like body which it would have consoled me so much to have brought away on my knees then she began stammering and complaining in a confused husky voice ah if you only knew how sensibly those poor people talked to me to induce me to go back a workwoman like myself with work waiting ought to return to paris they said and besides i couldn't afford to sacrifice my return ticket i must take the three forty train and they told me too that people are compelled to put up with things when they are not rich only the rich can keep their dead do what they like with them eh and i can't remember no again i can't remember i didn't even know the time i should never have been able to find my way back to the station after the funeral over there at a place where there were two trees it must have been those poor people who led me away half out of my senses and brought me to the station and pushed me into the carriage just at the moment when the train was starting but what a rending it was as if my heart had remained there underground and it is frightful that it is frightful my god poor woman murmured marie 
take courage and pray to the blessed virgin for the succour which she never refuses to the afflicted but at this madame vincent shook with rage it isn't true she cried the blessed virgin doesn't care a rap about me she doesn't tell the truth why did she deceive me i should never have gone to lourdes if i hadn't heard that voice in a church my little girl would still be alive and perhaps the doctors would have saved her i who would never set my foot among the priests formerly ah i was right i was right there's no blessed virgin at all and in this wise without resignation without illusion without hope she continued blaspheming with the coarse fury of a woman of the people shrieking the sufferings of her heart aloud in such rough fashion that sister hyacinthe had to intervene be quiet you unhappy woman it is god who is making you suffer to punish you the scene had already lasted a long time and as they passed riscle at full speed the sister again clapped her hands and gave the signal for the chanting of the laudate mariam come come my children she exclaimed all together and with all your hearts in heaven on earth all voices raise in concert sing my mother's praise laudate 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 mariam madame vincent whose voice was drowned by this canticle of love now only sobbed with her hands pressed to her face her revolt was over she was again strengthless weak like a suffering woman whom grief and weariness have stupefied after the canticle fatigue fell more or less heavily upon all the occupants of the carriage only sister hyacinthe so quick and active and sister claire des anges so gentle serious and slight retained as on their departure from paris and during their sojourn at lourdes the professional serenity of women accustomed to everything and wont to triumph over everything amidst the bright gaiety of their white coifs and wimples madame de jonquiere who had scarcely slept for five days past had to make an effort to keep her poor eyes open and yet she was delighted with the journey for her heart was full of joy at having arranged her daughter's marriage and at bringing back with her the greatest of all the miracles a miraculé whom everybody was talking of she decided in her own mind that she would get to sleep that night however bad the jolting might be though on the other hand she could not shake off a covert fear with regard to la grivotte who looked very strange excited and haggard with dull eyes and cheeks glowing with patches of violet colour madame de jonquiere had tried a dozen times to keep her from fidgeting but had not been able to induce her to remain still with joined hands and closed eyes fortunately the other patients gave her no anxiety most of them were either so relieved or so weary that they were already dozing off elise rouquet however had bought herself a pocket mirror a large round one in which she did not weary of contemplating herself finding herself quite pretty and verifying from minute to minute the progress of her cure with a coquetry which now that her monstrous face was becoming human again made her purse her lips and try a variety of smiles as for sophie couteau she was playing very prettily for finding that nobody now asked to examine her foot she had taken off her shoe and stocking of her own accord repeating that she must surely have a pebble in one or the other of them and as her companion still paid no attention to that little foot which the blessed virgin had been pleased to visit she kept it in her hands caressing it seemingly delighted to touch it and turn it into a plaything m de guersin had meantime risen from his seat and leaning on the low partition between the compartments he was glancing at m sabatier when all of a sudden marie called oh father father look at this notch in the seat it was the ironwork of my box that made it the discovery of this trace rendered her so happy that for a moment she forgot the secret sorrow which she seemed anxious to keep to herself and in the same way as madame vincent had burst out sobbing on perceiving the leather strap which her little girl had touched so she burst into joy at the sight of this scratch which reminded her of her long martyrdom in this same carriage all the abomination which had now disappeared vanished like a nightmare to think that four days have scarcely gone by she said i was lying there i could not stir and now now i come and go and feel so comfortable pierre and m de guersin were smiling at her and m sabatier who had heard her slowly said it is quite true we leave a little of ourselves in things a little of our sufferings and our hopes and when we find them again they speak to us and once more tell us the things which sadden us or make us gay he had remained in his corner silent with an air of resignation ever since their departure from lourdes even his wife whilst wrapping up his legs had only been able to obtain sundry shakes of the head from him in response to her inquiries whether he was suffering in point of fact he was not suffering but extreme dejection was overcoming him thus for my own part he continued during our long journey from paris i tried to divert my thoughts by counting the bands in the roofing up there there were thirteen from the lamp to the door 
well i have just been counting them again and naturally enough there are still thirteen it's like that brass knob beside me you can't imagine what dreams i had whilst i watched it shining at night-time when monsieur l'abbé was reading the story of bernadette to us yes i saw myself cured i was making that journey to rome which i have been talking of for twenty years past i walked and travelled the world briefly i had all manner of wild and delightful dreams and now here we are on our way back to paris and there are thirteen bands across the roofing there and the knob is still shining all of which tells me that i'm again on the same seat with my legs lifeless well well it's understood i'm a poor old used-up animal and such i shall remain two big tears appeared in his eyes he must have been passing through an hour of frightful bitterness however he raised his big square head with its jaw typical of patient obstinacy and added this is the seventh year that i have been to lourdes and the blessed virgin has not listened to me no matter it won't prevent me from going back next year perhaps she will at last deign to hear me for his part he did not revolt and pierre whilst chatting with him was stupefied to find persistent tenacious credulity springing up once more in spite of everything in the cultivated brain of this man of intellect what ardent desire of cure and life was it that had led to this refusal to accept evidence this determination to remain blind he stubbornly clung to the resolution to be saved when all human probabilities were against him when the experiment of the miracle itself had failed so many times already and he had reached such a point that he wished to explain his fresh rebuff urging moments of inattention at the grotto a lack of sufficient contrition and all sorts of little transgressions which must have displeased the blessed virgin moreover he was already deciding in his mind that he would perform a novena somewhere next year before again repairing to lourdes ah by the way he resumed do you know of the good luck which my substitute has had yes you must remember my telling you about that poor fellow suffering from tuberculosis for whom i paid fifty francs when i obtained hospitalisation for myself well he has been thoroughly cured really and he was suffering from tuberculosis exclaimed m de garcin certainly monsieur perfectly cured i had seen him looking so low so yellow so emaciated when we started but when he came to pay me a visit at the hospital he was quite a new man and dear me i gave him five francs pierre had to restrain a smile for he had heard the story from dr chassaigne this miraculously healed individual was a feigner who had eventually been recognized at the medical verification office it was apparently the third year that he had presented himself there the first time alleging paralysis and the second time a tumour both of which had been as completely healed as his pretended tuberculosis on each occasion he obtained an outing lodging and food and returned home loaded with arms it appeared that he had formerly been a hospital nurse and that he transformed himself made up a face suited to his pretended ailment in such an extremely artistic manner that it was only by chance that dr bonamy had detected the imposition moreover the fathers had immediately required that the incident should be kept secret what was the use of stirring up a scandal which would only have led to jocular remarks in the newspapers whenever any fraudulent miracles of this kind were discovered the fathers contented themselves with forcing the guilty parties to go away moreover these feigners were far from numerous despite all that was related of them in the amusing stories concocted by voltairian humorists apart from faith human stupidity and ignorance alas were quite sufficient to account for the miracles m sabatier however was greatly stirred by the idea that heaven had healed this man who had gone to lourdes at his expense whereas he himself was returning home still helpless still in the same woeful state he sighed and despite all his resignation could not help saying with a touch of envy what would you however the blessed virgin must know very well what she's about neither you nor myself can call her to account to us for her actions whenever it may please her to cast her eyes on me she will find me at her feet after the angelus when they got to mont de marson sister hyacinthe made them repeat the second chaplet the five sorrowful mysteries jesus in the garden of olives jesus scourged jesus crowned with thorns and jesus carrying his cross then they took dinner in the carriage for there would be no stopping until they reached bordeaux where they would only arrive at eleven o'clock at night all the pilgrims baskets were crammed with provisions to say nothing of the milk broth chocolate and fruit which sister saint francois had sent from the cantine then too there was fraternal sharing they sat with their food on their laps and drew closer together every compartment becoming as it were the scene of a picnic to which each contributed his share and they had finished their meal and were packing up the remaining bread again when the train passed morsens my children now said sister hyacinthe rising up 
the evening prayer thereupon came a confused murmuring made up of parters and aves self-examinations acts of contrition and vows of trustful reliance in god the blessed virgin and the saints with thanksgiving for that happy day and at last a prayer for the living and for the faithful departed i warn you then resumed the sister that when we get to la motte at ten o'clock i shall order silence however i think you will all be very good and won't require any rocking to get to sleep this made them laugh it was now half past eight o'clock and the night had slowly covered the countryside the hills alone retained a vague trace of the twilight's farewell whilst a dense sheet of darkness blotted out all the low ground rushing on at full speed the train entered an immense plain and then there was nothing but a sea of darkness through which they ever and ever rolled under a blackish sky studded with stars for a moment or so pierre had been astonished by the demeanour of la grivotte while the other pilgrims and patients were already dozing off sinking down amidst the luggage which the constant jolting shook she had risen to her feet and was clinging to the partition in a sudden spasm of agony and under the pale yellow dancing gleam of the lamp she once more looked emaciated with a livid tortured face take care madame she will fall the priest called to madame de jonquiere who with eyelids lowered was at last giving way to sleep she made all haste to intervene but sister hyacinthe had turned more quickly and caught la grivotte in her arms a frightful fit of coughing however prostrated the unhappy creature upon the seat and for five minutes she continued stifling shaken by such an attack that her poor body seemed to be actually cracking and rending then a red thread oozed from between her lips and at last she spat up blood by the throatful good heavens good heavens it's coming on her again repeated madame de jonquiere in despair i had a fear of it i was not at ease seeing her looking so strange wait a moment i will sit down beside her but the sister would not consent no no madame sleep a little i'll watch over her you are not accustomed to it you would end by making yourself ill as well then she settled herself beside la grivotte made her rest her head against her shoulder and wiped the blood from her lips the attack subsided but weakness was coming back so extreme that the wretched woman was scarcely able to stammer oh it is nothing nothing at all i am cured i am cured completely cured pierre was thoroughly upset this sudden overwhelming relapse had sent an icy chill through the whole carriage many of the passengers raised themselves up and looked at la grivotte with terror in their eyes then they dived down into their corners again and nobody spoke nobody stirred any further pierre for his part reflected on the curious medical aspect of this girl's case her strength had come back to her over yonder she had displayed a ravenous appetite she had walked long distances with a dancing gait her face quite radiant the while and now she had spat blood her cough had broken out afresh she again had the heavy ashen face of one in the last agony her ailment had returned to her with brutal force victorious over everything was this then some special case of thysis complicated by neurosis or was it some other malady some unknown disease quietly continuing its work in the midst of contradictory diagnoses the sea of error and ignorance the darkness amidst which human science is still struggling again appeared to pierre and he once more saw dr chassaigne shrugging his shoulders with disdain whilst dr bonamy full of serenity quietly continued his verification work absolutely convinced that nobody would be able to prove to him the impossibility of his miracles any more than he himself could have proved their possibility oh i am not frightened la grivotte continued stammering i am cured completely cured they all told me so over yonder meantime the carriage was rolling rolling along through the black night each of its occupants was making preparations stretching himself out in order to sleep more comfortably they compelled madame vincent to lie down on the seat and gave her a pillow on which to rest her poor pain-racked head and then as docile as a child quite stupefied she fell asleep in a nightmare-like torpor with big silent tears still flowing from her closed eyes elise rouquet who had a whole seat to herself was also getting ready to lie down but first of all she made quite an elaborate toilet tying the black wrap which had served to hide her sore about her head and then again peering into her glass to see if this headgear became her now that the swelling of her lip had subsided and again did pierre feel astonished at the sight of that sore which was certainly healing if not already healed that face so lately a monster's face which one could now look at without feeling horrified the sea of incertitude stretched before him once more was it even a real lupus might it not rather be some unknown form of ulcer of hysterical origin 
or ought one to admit that certain forms of lupus as yet but imperfectly studied and arising from faulty nutrition of the skin might be benefited by a great moral shock at all events there here seemed to be a miracle unless indeed the sore should reappear again in three weeks three months or three years time like la grivaud's thysis it was ten o'clock and the people in the carriage were falling asleep when they left la motte sister hyacinthe upon whose knees la grivaud was now drowsily resting her head was unable to rise and for form's sake merely said silence silence my children in a low voice which died away amidst the growling rumble of the wheels however something continued stirring in an adjoining compartment she heard a noise which irritated her nerves and the course of which she at last fancied she could understand why do you keep on kicking the seat sophie she asked you must get to sleep my child i'm not kicking sister it's a key that was rolling about under my foot a key how is that pass it to me then she examined it a very old poor-looking key it was blackened worn away and polished by long use its ring bearing the mark of where it had been broken and resoldered however they all searched their pockets and none of them it seemed had lost a key i found it in the corner now resumed sophie it must have belonged to the man what man asked sister hyacinthe the man who died there they had already forgotten him but it had surely been his for sister hyacinthe recollected that she had heard something fall while she was wiping his forehead and she turned the key over and continued looking at it as it lay in her hand poor ugly wretched key that it was no longer of any use never again to open the lock it belonged to some unknown lock hidden far away in the depths of the world for a moment she was minded to put it in her pocket as though by a kind of compassion for this little bit of iron so humble and so mysterious since it was all that remained of that unknown man but then the pious thought came to her that it is wrong to show attachment to any earthly thing and the window being half lowered she threw out the key which fell into the black night you must not play any more sophie she resumed come come my children silence it was only after the brief stay at bordeaux however at about half past eleven o'clock that sleep came back again and overpowered all in the carriage madame de jonquiere had been unable to contend against it any longer and her head was now resting against the partition her face wearing an expression of happiness amidst all her fatigue the sabatiers were in a like fashion calmly sleeping and not a sound now came from the compartment which sophie couteau and elise rouquet occupied stretched in front of each other on the seats from time to time a low plaint would rise a strangled cry of grief or fright escaping from the lips of madame vincent who amidst her prostration was being tortured by evil dreams sister hyacinthe was one of the very few who still had their eyes open anxious as she was respecting la grivotte who now lay quite motionless like a felled animal breathing painfully with a continuous wheezing sound from one to the other end of this travelling dormitory shaken by the rumbling of the train rolling on at full speed the pilgrims and the sick surrendered themselves to sleep and limbs dangled and heads swayed under the pale dancing gleams from the lamps at the far end in the compartment occupied by the ten female pilgrims there was a woeful jumbling of poor ugly faces old and young and all open-mouthed as though sleep had suddenly fallen upon them at the moment they were finishing some hymn great pity came to the heart at the sight of all those mournful weary beings prostrated by five days of wild hope and infinite ecstasy and destined to awaken on the very morrow to the stern realities of life and now pierre once more felt himself to be alone with marie she had not consented to stretch herself on the seat she had been lying down too long she said for seven years alas and in order that monsieur de guersin who on leaving bordeaux had again fallen into his childlike slumber might be more at ease pierre came and sat down beside the girl as the light of the lamp annoyed her he drew the little screen and they thus found themselves in the shade a soft and transparent shade the train must now have been crossing a plain for it glided through the night as in an endless flight with a sound like the regular flapping of huge wings through the window which they had opened a delicious coolness came from the black fields the fathomless fields where not even any lonely little village lights could be seen gleaming for a moment pierre had turned towards marie and had noticed that her eyes were closed but he could divine that she was not sleeping that she was savouring the deep peacefulness which prevailed around them amidst the thundering roar of their rush through the darkness and like her he closed his eyelids and began dreaming yet once again did the past arise before him the little house at neuilly 
the embrace which they had exchanged near the flowering hedge under the trees flecked with sunlight how far away all that already was and with what perfume had it not filled his life then bitter thoughts returned to him at the memory of the day when he had become a priest since she would never be a woman he had consented to be a man no more and that was to prove their eternal misfortune for her ironical nature was to make her a wife and a mother after all had he only been able to retain his faith he might have found eternal consolation in it but all his attempts to regain it had been in vain he had gone to lourdes he had striven his utmost at the grotto he had hoped for a moment that he would end by believing should marie be miraculously healed but total and irremediable ruin had come when the predicted cure had taken place even as science had foretold and their ideal so pure and so painful the long story of their affection bathed in tears likewise spread out before him she having penetrated his sad secret had come to lourdes to pray to heaven for the miracle of his conversion when they had remained alone under the trees amidst the perfume of the invisible roses during the night procession they had prayed one for the other mingling one in the other with an ardent desire for their mutual happiness before the grotto too she had entreated the blessed virgin to forget her and to save him if she could obtain but one favour from her divine son then healed beside herself transported with love and gratitude whirled with her little car up the inclined ways to the basilica she had thought her prayers granted and had cried aloud the joy she felt that they should have both been saved together together ah that lie which he prompted by affection and charity had told that error in which he had from that moment suffered her to remain with what a weight did it oppress his heart it was the heavy slab which walled him in his voluntary chosen sepulchre he remembered the frightful attack of grief which had almost killed him in the gloom of the crypt his sobs his brutal revolt his longing to keep her for himself alone to possess her since he knew her to be his own all that rising passion of his awakened manhood which little by little had fallen asleep again drowned by the rushing river of his tears and in order that he might not destroy the divine illusion which possessed her yielding to brotherly compassion he had taken that heroic vow to lie to her that vow which now filled him with such anguish pierre shuddered amidst his reverie would he have the strength to keep that vow for ever had he not detected a feeling of impatience in his heart even whilst he was waiting for her at the railway station a jealous longing to leave that lourdes which she loved too well in the vague hope that she might again become his own somewhere far away if he had not been a priest he would have married her and what rapture what felicity would then have been his he would have given himself wholly unto her she would have been wholly his own and he and she would have lived again in the dear child that would doubtless have been born to them ah surely that alone was divine the life which is complete the life which creates life and then his reverie strayed he pictured himself married and the thought filled him with such delight that he asked why such a dream should be unrealizable she knew no more than a child of ten he would educate her form her mind she would then understand that this cure for which she thought herself indebted to the blessed virgin had in reality come to her from the only mother serene and impassive nature but even whilst he was thus settling things in his mind a kind of terror born of his religious education arose within him could he tell if that human happiness with which he desired to endow her would ever be worth as much as the holy ignorance the infantile candour in which she now lived how bitterly he would reproach himself afterwards if she should not be happy then too what a drama it would all be he to throw off the cassock and marry this girl healed by an alleged miracle ravage her faith sufficiently to induce her to consent to such sacrilege yet therein lay the brave course there lay reason life real manhood real womanhood why then did he not dare horrible sadness was breaking upon his reverie he became conscious of nothing beyond the sufferings of his poor heart the train was still rolling along with its great noise of flapping wings beside pierre and marie only sister hyacinthe was still awake amidst the weary slumber of the carriage and just then marie leant towards pierre and softly said to him it's strange my friend i am so sleepy and yet i can't sleep then with a light laugh she added i've got paris in my head how is that paris yes yes i'm thinking that it's waiting for me that i am about to return to it that paris which i know nothing of and where i shall have to live these words brought fresh anguish to pierre's heart he had well foreseen it she could no longer belong to him she would belong to others if lord had restored her to him paris was about to take her from him again and he pictured this ignorant little being fatally acquiring all the education of woman 
that little spotless soul which had remained so candid in the frame of a big girl of three and twenty that soul which illness had kept apart from others far from life far even from novels would soon ripen now that it could fly freely once more he beheld her a gay healthy young girl running everywhere looking and learning and some day meeting the husband who would finish her education and so said he you propose to amuse yourself in paris oh what are you saying my friend are we rich enough to amuse ourselves she replied no i was thinking of my poor sister blanche and wondering what i should be able to do in paris to help her a little she is so good she works so hard i don't wish that she should have to continue earning all the money and after a fresh pause as he deeply moved remained silent she added formerly before i suffered so dreadfully i painted miniatures rather nicely you remember don't you that i painted a portrait of papa which was very like him and which everybody praised you will help me won't you you will find me customers then she began talking of the new life which she was about to live she wanted to arrange her room and hang it with croton something pretty with a pattern of little blue flowers she would buy it out of the first money she could save blanche had spoken to her of the big shops where things could be bought so cheaply to go out with blanche and run about a little would be so amusing for her who confined to her bed since childhood had never seen anything then pierre who for a moment had been calmer again began to suffer for he could divine all her glowing desire to live her ardour to see everything know everything and taste everything it was at last the awakening of the woman whom she was destined to be whom he had divined in childhood's days a dear creature of gaiety and passion with blooming lips starry eyes a milky complexion golden hair all resplendent with the joy of being oh i shall work i shall work she resumed but you are right pierre i shall also amuse myself because it cannot be a sin to be gay can it no surely not marie on sundays we will go into the country oh very far away into the woods where there are beautiful trees and we will sometimes go to the theatre too if papa will take us i have been told that there are many plays that one may see but after all it's not all that provided i can go out and walk in the streets and see things i shall be so happy i shall come home so gay it is so nice to live is it not pierre yes yes marie it is very nice a chill like that of death was coming over him his regret that he was no longer a man was filling him with agony but since she tempted him like this with her irritating candour why should he not confess to her the truth which was ravaging his being he would have won her have conquered her never had a more frightful struggle arisen between his heart and his will for a moment he was on the point of uttering irrevocable words but with the voice of a joyous child she was already resuming oh look at poor papa how pleased he must be to sleep so soundly on the seat in front of them monsieur de guersin was indeed slumbering with a comfortable expression on his face as though he were in his bed and had no consciousness of the continual jolting of the train this monotonous rolling and heaving seemed in fact a lullaby rocking the whole carriage to sleep all surrendered themselves to it sinking powerless onto the piles of bags and parcels many of which had also fallen and the rhythmical growling of the wheels never ceased in the unknown darkness through which the train was still rolling now and again as they passed through a station or under a bridge there would be a loud rush of wind a tempest would suddenly sweep by and then the lulling growling sound would begin again ever the same for hours together marie gently took hold of pierre's hands he and she were so lost so completely alone among all those prostrated beings in the deep rumbling peacefulness of the train flying across the black night and sadness the sadness which she had hitherto hidden had again come back to her casting a shadow over her large blue eyes you will often come with us my good pierre won't you she asked he had started on feeling her little hand pressing his own his heart was on his lips he was making up his mind to speak however he once again restrained himself and stammered i am not always at liberty marie a priest cannot go everywhere a priest she repeated yes yes a priest i understand then it was she who spoke who confessed the mortal secret which had been oppressing her heart ever since they had started she leant nearer and in a lower voice resumed listen my good pierre i am fearfully sad i may look pleased but there is death in my soul you did not tell me the truth yesterday he became quite scared but did not at first understand her i did not tell you the truth about what he asked a kind of shame restrained her and she again hesitated at the moment of descending into the depths of another conscience than her own then like a friend a sister she continued 
no you let me believe that you had been saved with me and it was not true pierre you have not found your lost faith again good lord she knew for him this was desolation such a catastrophe that he forgot his torments and at first he obstinately clung to the falsehood born of his fraternal charity but i assure you marie how can you have formed such a wicked idea oh be quiet my friend for pity's sake it would grieve me too deeply if you were to speak to me falsely again it was yonder at the station at the moment when we were starting and that unhappy man had died good abbe Juden had knelt down to pray for the repose of that rebellious soul and i divined everything i understood everything when i saw that you did not kneel as well that prayer did not rise to your lips as to his but really i assure you marie no no you did not pray for the dead you no longer believe and besides there is something else something i can guess something which comes to me from you a despair which you can't hide from me a melancholy look which comes into your poor eyes directly they meet mine the blessed virgin did not grant my prayer she did not restore your faith and i am very very wretched she was weeping a hot tear fell upon the priest's hand which she was still holding it quite upset him and he ceased struggling confessing in his turn letting his tears flow whilst in a very low voice he stammered ah marie i am very wretched also oh so very wretched for a moment they remained silent in their cruel grief at feeling that the abyss which parts different beliefs was yawning between them they would never belong to one another again and they were in despair at being so utterly unable to bring themselves nearer to one another but the severance was henceforth definitive since heaven itself had been unable to reconnect the bond and thus side by side they wept over their separation i who prayed so fervently for your conversion she said in a dolorous voice i who was so happy it had seemed to me that your soul was mingling with mine and it was so delightful to have been saved together together i felt such strength for life or strength enough to raise the world he did not answer his tears were still flowing flowing without end and to think she resumed that i was saved all alone that this great happiness fell upon me without you having any share in it and to see you so forsaken so desolate when i am loaded with grace and joy rends my heart ah how severe the blessed virgin has been why did she not heal your soul at the same time as she healed my body the last opportunity was presenting itself he ought to have illumined this innocent creature's mind with the light of reason have explained the miracle to her in order that life after accomplishing its healthful work in her body might complete its triumph by throwing them into one another's arms he also was healed his mind was healthy now and it was not for the loss of faith but for the loss of herself that he was weeping however invincible compassion was taking possession of him amidst all his grief no no he would not trouble that dear soul he would not rob her of her belief which some day might prove her only stay amidst the sorrows of this world one cannot yet require of children and women the bitter heroism of reason he had not the strength to do it he even thought that he had not the right it would have seemed to him violation abominable murder and he did not speak out but his tears flowed hotter and hotter in this immolation of his love this despairing sacrifice of his own happiness in order that she might remain candid and ignorant and gay at heart oh marie how wretched i am nowhere on the roads nowhere at the galleys even is there a man more wretched than myself oh marie if you only knew if you only knew how wretched i am she was distracted and caught him in her trembling arms wishing to console him with a sisterly embrace and at that moment the woman awaking within her understood everything and she herself sobbed with sorrow that both human and divine will should thus part them she had never yet reflected on such things but suddenly she caught a glimpse of life with its passions its struggles and its sufferings and then seeking for what she might say to soothe in some degree that broken heart she stammered very faintly distressed that she could find nothing sweet enough i know i know then the words it was needful she should speak came to her and as though that which she had to say ought only to be heard by the angels she became anxious and looked around her but the slumber which reigned in the carriage seemed more heavy even than before her father was still sleeping with the innocent look of a big child not one of the pilgrims not one of the ailing ones had stirred amidst the rough rocking which bore them onward even sister hyacinthe giving way to the overpowering weariness had just closed her eyes after drawing the lamp screen in her own compartment and now there were only vague shadows there ill-defined bodies amidst nameless things ghostly forms scarce visible 
which a tempest blast a furious rush was carrying on and on through the darkness and she likewise distrusted that black countryside whose unknown depths went by on either side of the train without one even being able to tell what forests what rivers what hills one was crossing a short time back some bright sparks of light had appeared possibly the lights of some distant forges or the woeful lamps of workers or sufferers now however the night again streamed deeply all round the obscure infinite nameless sea farther and farther through which they ever went not knowing where they were then with a chaste confusion blushing amidst her tears marie placed her lips near pierre's ears listen my friend there is a great secret between the blessed virgin and myself i had sworn that i would never tell it to anybody but you are too unhappy you are suffering too bitterly she will forgive me i will confide it to you and in a faint breath she went on during that night of love you know the night of burning ecstasy which i spent before the grotto i engaged myself by a vow i promised the blessed virgin the gift of my chastity if she would but heal me she has healed me and never you hear me pierre never will i marry anybody ah oh, what unhoped-for sweetness he thought that a balmy dew was falling on his poor wounded heart it was a divine enchantment a delicious relief if she belonged to none other she would always be a little bit his own and how well she had known his torment and what it was needful she should say in order that life might yet be possible for him in his turn he wished to find happy words and promised that he also would ever be hers ever love her as he had loved her since childhood like the dear creature she was whose one kiss long long ago had sufficed to perfume his entire life but she made him stop already anxious fearing to spoil that pure moment no no my friend she murmured let us say nothing more it would be wrong perhaps i am very weary i shall sleep quietly now and with her head against his shoulder she fell asleep at once like a sister who is all confidence he for a moment kept himself awake in that painful happiness of renunciation which they had just tasted together it was all over quite over now the sacrifice was consummated he would live a solitary life apart from the life of other men never would he know woman never would any child be born to him and there remained to him only the consoling pride of that accepted and desired suicide with the desolate grandeur that attaches to lives which are beyond the pale of nature but fatigue overpowered him also his eyes closed and in his turn he fell asleep and afterwards his head slipped down and his cheek touched the cheek of his dear friend who was sleeping very gently with her brow against his shoulder then their hair mingled she had her golden hair her royal hair half unbound and it streamed over his face and he dreamed amidst its perfume doubtless the same blissful dream fell upon them both for their loving faces assumed the same expression of rapture they both seemed to be smiling to the angels it was chaste and passionate abandon the innocence of chance slumber placing them in one another's arms with warm close lips so that their breath mingled like the breath of two babes lying in the same cradle and such was their bridal night the consummation of the spiritual marriage in which they were to live a delicious annihilation born of extreme fatigue with scarcely a fleeting dream of mystical possession amidst this carriage of wretchedness and suffering which still and ever rolled along through the dense night hours and hours slipped by the wheels growled the bags and baskets swung from the brass hooks whilst from the piled up crushed bodies there only arose a sense of terrible fatigue the great physical exhaustion brought back from the land of miracles when the overworked souls returned home at last at five o'clock whilst the sun was rising there was a sudden awakening a resounding entry into a large station with porters calling doors opening and people scrambling together they were at poitiers and at once the whole carriage was on foot amidst a chorus of laughter and exclamations little sophie couteau alighted here and was bidding everybody farewell she embraced all the ladies even passing over the partition to take leave of sister claire des anges whom nobody had seen since the previous evening for silent and slight of build with eyes full of mystery she had vanished into her corner then the child came back again took her little parcel and showed herself particularly amiable towards sister hyacinthe and madame de jonquiere au revoir sister au revoir madame i thank you for all your kindness you must come back again next year my child oh i shan't fail sister it's my duty and be good my dear child and take care of your health so that the blessed virgin may be proud of you to be sure madame she was so good to me and it amuses me so much to go to see her when she was on the platform all the pilgrims in the carriage leaned out and with happy faces watched her go off till next year they called to her till next year 
yes yes thank you kindly till next year the morning prayer was only to be said at Châtellerault. after the stoppage at poitiers when the train was once more rolling on in the fresh breeze of morning monsieur de gersin gaily declared that he had slept delightfully in spite of the hardness of the seat madame de jonquiere also congratulated herself on the good rest which she had had and of which she had been in so much need though at the same time she was somewhat annoyed at having left sister hyacinthe all alone to watch over la grivotte who was now shivering with intense fever again attacked by her horrible cough meanwhile the other female pilgrims were tidying themselves the ten women at the far end of the carriage were fastening their fichus and tying their cap strings with a kind of modest nervousness displayed on their mournfully ugly faces and elise rouquet all attention with her face close to her pocket glass did not cease examining her nose mouth and cheeks admiring herself with the thought that she was really and truly becoming nice looking and it was then that pierre and marie again experienced a feeling of deep compassion on glancing at madame vincent whom nothing had been able to rouse from a state of torpor neither the tumultuous stoppage at poitiers nor the noise of voices which had continued ever since they had started off again prostrate on the seat she had not opened her eyes but still and ever slumbered tortured by atrocious dreams and with big tears still streaming from her closed eyes she had caught hold of the pillow which had been forced upon her and was closely pressing it to her breast in some nightmare born of her suffering her poor arms which had so long carried her dying daughter her arms now unoccupied for ever empty had found this cushion whilst she slept and had coiled around them as around a phantom with a blind and frantic embrace on the other hand monsieur sabatier had woke up feeling quite joyous whilst his wife was pulling up his rug carefully wrapping it round his lifeless legs he began to chat with sparkling eyes once more basking in illusion he had dreamt of lourdes said he and had seen the blessed virgin leaning towards him with a smile of kindly promise and then although he had before him both madame vincent that mother whose daughter the virgin had allowed to die and la grivotte the wretched woman whom she had healed and who had so cruelly relapsed into her mortal disease he nevertheless rejoiced and made merry repeating to monsieur de gersin with an air of perfect conviction oh i shall return home quite easy in mind monsieur i shall be cured next year yes yes as that dear little girl said just now till next year till next year it was indestructible illusion victorious even over certainty eternal hope determined not to die but shooting up with more life than ever after each defeat upon the ruins of everything at chatelot sister hyacinthe made them say the morning prayer the pater the ave the credo and an appeal to god begging him for the happiness of a glorious day o oh god grant me sufficient strength that i may avoid all that is evil do all that is good and suffer without complaint every pain End of section twenty four Section twenty five of Lourdes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Lourdes by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Visitelli. The Fifth Day. Five. The Death of Bernadette, the New Religion. And the journey continued. The train rolled, still rolled along at saint maur the prayers of the mass were said and at saint pierre des corps the credo was chanted however the religious exercises no longer proved so welcome the pilgrim's zeal was flagging somewhat in the increasing fatigue of this return journey after such prolonged mental excitement it occurred to sister hyacinthe that the happiest way of entertaining these poor worn-out folks would be for someone to read aloud and she promised that she would allow monsieur l'abbé to read them the finish of bernadette's life some of the marvellous episodes of which he had already on two occasions related to them however they must wait until they arrived at les aubrais there would be nearly two hours between les aubrais and etampes ample time to finish the story without being disturbed then the various religious exercises followed one after the other in a monotonous repetition of the order which had been observed whilst they crossed the same plains on their way to lourdes they again began the rosary at amboise where they said the first chaplet the five joyful mysteries then after singing the canticle o loving mother bless at blois they recited the second chaplet the five sorrowful mysteries at beaugency 
some little fleecy clouds had veiled the sun since morning and the landscapes very sweet and somewhat sad flew by with a continuous fan-like motion the trees and houses on either side of the line disappeared in the grey light with the fleetness of vague visions whilst the distant hills enveloped in mist vanished more slowly with the gentle rise and fall of a swelling sea between beaugency and les aubrais the train seemed to slacken speed though it still kept up the rhythmical persistent rumbling of its wheels which the deafened pilgrims no longer even heard at length when les aubrais had been left behind they began to lunch in the carriage it was then a quarter to twelve and when they had said the angelus and the three aves had been thrice repeated pierre took from marie's bag the little book whose blue cover was ornamented with an artless picture of our lady of lourdes sister hyacinthe clapped her hands as a signal for silence and amidst the wakefulness of one and all the ardent curiosity of those big children who were so impassioned by the marvellous story the priest was able to begin reading in his fine penetrating voice now came the narrative of bernadette's sojourn at nevers and then her death there pierre however as on the two previous occasions soon ceased following the exact text of the little book and added charming anecdotes of his own both what he knew and what he could divine and for himself alone he again evolved the true story the human pitiful story that which none had ever told and which he felt so deeply it was on the eighth of july eighteen sixty six that bernadette left lourdes she went to take the veil at nevers in the convent of saint gildard the chief habitation of the sisters on duty at the asylum where she had learnt to read and had been living for eight years she was then twenty-two years of age and it was eight years since the blessed virgin had appeared to her and her farewells to the grotto to the basilica to the whole town which she loved were watered with tears but she could no longer remain there owing to the continuous persecution of public curiosity the visits the homage and the adoration paid to her from which on account of her delicate health she suffered cruelly her sincere humility her timid love of shade and silence had at last produced in her an ardent desire to disappear to hide her resounding glory the glory of one whom heaven had chosen and whom the world would not leave in peace in the depths of some unknown darkness and she longed only for simple-mindedness for a quiet humdrum life devoted to prayer and petty daily occupations her departure was therefore a relief both to her and to the grotto which she was beginning to embarrass with her excessive innocence and burdensome complaints at nevers saint gildard ought to have proved a paradise she there found fresh air sunshine spacious apartments and an extensive garden planted with fine trees yet she did not enjoy peace that utter forgetfulness of the world for which one flees to the faraway desert scarcely twenty days after her arrival she donned the garb of the order and assumed the name of sister marie bernard for the time being simply engaging herself by partial vows however the world still flocked around her the persecution of the multitude began afresh she was pursued even into the cloister through an irresistible desire to obtain favours from her saintly person ah to see her touch her become lucky by gazing on her or surreptitiously rubbing some medal against her dress it was the credulous passion of fetishism a rush of believers pursuing this poor beatified being in the desire which each felt to secure a share of hope and divine illusion she wept at it with very weariness with impatient revolt and often repeated why did they torment me like this what more is there in me than in others and at last she felt real grief at thus becoming the rare show as she ended by terming herself with a sad suffering smile she defended herself as far as she could refusing to see any one her companions defended her also and sometimes very sternly showing her only to such visitors as were authorized by the bishop the doors of the convent remained closed and ecclesiastics almost alone succeeded in effecting an entrance still even this was too much for her desire for solitude and she often had to be obstinate to request that the priests who had called might be sent away weary as she was of always telling the same story of ever answering the same questions she was incensed wounded on behalf of the blessed virgin herself still she sometimes had to yield for the bishop in person would bring great personages dignitaries and prelates and she would then appear with her grave air answering politely and as briefly as possible only feeling at ease when she was allowed to return to her shadowy corner never indeed had distinction weighed more heavily on a mortal one day when she was asked if she was not proud of the continual visits paid her by the bishop she answered simply monseigneur does not come to see me he comes to show me 
on another occasion some princes of the church great militant catholics who wished to see her were overcome with emotion and sobbed before her but in her horror of being shown in the vexation they caused her simple mind she left them without comprehending merely feeling very weary and very sad at length however she grew accustomed to saint gildard and spent a peaceful existence there engaged in avocations of which she became very fond she was so delicate so frequently ill that she was employed in the infirmary in addition to the little assistance she rendered there she worked with her needle with which she became rather skilful embroidering albs and altar cloths in a delicate manner but at times she would lose all strength and be unable to do even this light work when she was not confined to her bed she spent long days in an easy chair her only diversion being to recite her rosary or to read some pious work now that she had learnt to read books interested her especially the beautiful stories of conversion the delightful legends in which saints of both sexes appear and the splendid and terrible dramas in which the devil is baffled and cast back into hell but her great favourite the book at which she continually marvelled was the bible that wonderful new testament of whose perpetual miracle she never wearied she remembered the bible at bautres that old book which had been in the family a hundred years and whose pages had turned yellow she could again see her foster father slip a pin between the leaves to open the book at random and then read aloud from the top of the right-hand page and even at that time she had already known those beautiful stories so well that she could have continued repeating the narrative by heart whatever might be the passage at which the perusal had ceased and now that she read the book herself she found in it a constant source of surprise an ever-increasing delight the story of the passion particularly upset her as though it were some extraordinary tragical event that had happened only the day before she sobbed with pity it made her poor suffering body quiver for hours mingled with her tears perhaps there was the unconscious dolour of her own passion the desolate calvary which she also had been ascending ever since her childhood when bernadette was well and able to perform her duties in the infirmary she bustled about filling the building with her childish liveliness until her death she remained an innocent infantile being fond of laughing romping and play she was very little the smallest sister of the community so that her companions always treated her somewhat like a child her face grew long and hollow and lost its bloom of youth but she retained the pure divine brightness of her eyes the beautiful eyes of a visionary in which as in a limpid sky you detected the flight of her dreams as she grew older and her sufferings increased she became somewhat sour-tempered and violent cross-grained anxious and at times rough little imperfections which after each attack filled her with remorse she would humble herself think herself damned and beg pardon of everyone but more frequently what a good little daughter of providence she was she became lively alert quick at repartee full of mirth-provoking remarks with a grace quite her own which made her beloved in spite of her great devotion although she spent days in prayer she was not at all bigoted or over-exacting with regard to others but tolerant and compassionate in fact no nun was ever so much a woman with distinct features a decided personality charming even in its puerility and this gift of childishness which she had retained the simple innocence of the child she still was also made children love her as though they recognized in her one of themselves they all ran to her jumped upon her lap and passed their tiny arms round her neck and the garden would then fill with the noise of joyous games races and cries and it was not she who ran or cried the least so happy was she at once more feeling herself a poor unknown little girl as in the far-away days of bartres later on it was related that a mother had one day brought her paralyzed child to the convent for the saint to touch and cure it the woman sobbed so much that the superior ended by consenting to make the attempt however as bernadette indignantly protested whenever she was asked to perform a miracle she was not forewarned but simply called to take the sick child to the infirmary and she did so and when she stood the child on the ground it walked it was cured ah how many times must bartres and her free childhood spent watching her lambs the years passed among the hills in the long grass in the leafy woods have returned to her during the hours she gave to her dreams when weary of praying for sinners no one then fathomed her soul no one could say if involuntary regrets did not rend her wounded heart one day she spoke some words which her historians have preserved with the view of making her passion more touching cloistered far away from her mountains confined to a bed of sickness she exclaimed it seems to me that i was made to live to act to be ever on the move and yet the lord will have me remain motionless what a revelation full of a terrible testimony and immense sadness 
why should the lord wish that dear being all grace and gaiety to remain motionless could she not have honoured him equally well by living the free healthy life that she had been born to live and would she not have done more to increase the world's happiness and her own if instead of praying for sinners her constant occupation she had given her love to the husband who might have been wedded to her and the children who might have been born to her she so gay and so active would on certain evenings become extremely depressed she turned gloomy and remained wrapped in herself as though overcome by excess of pain no doubt the cup was becoming too bitter the thought of her life's perpetual renunciation was killing her did bernadette often think of lourdes while she was at saint gildard what knew she of the triumph of the grotto of the prodigies which were daily transforming that land of miracles these questions were never thoroughly elucidated her companions were forbidden to talk to her of such matters which remained enveloped in absolute continual silence she herself did not care to speak of them she kept silent with regard to the mysterious past and evinced no desire to know the present however triumphant it might be but all the same did not her heart in imagination fly away to the enchanted country of her childhood where lived her kith and kin where all her life ties had been formed where she had left the most extraordinary dream that ever human being dreamt surely she must have sometimes travelled the beautiful journey of memory she must have known the main features of the great events that had taken place at lourdes what she most dreaded was to go there herself and she always refused to do so knowing full well that she could not remain unrecognized and fearful of meeting the crowds whose adoration awaited her what glory would have been hers had she been headstrong ambitious domineering she would have returned to the holy spot of her visions have worked miracles there have become a priestess a female pope with the infallibility and sovereignty of one of the elect a friend of the blessed virgin but the fathers never really feared this although express orders had been given to withdraw her from the world for her salvation's sake in reality they were easy for they knew her so gentle and so humble in her fear of becoming divine in her ignorance of the colossal machine which she had put in motion and the working of which would have made her recoil with affright had she understood it no no that was no longer her land that place of crowds of violence and trafficking she would have suffered too much there she would have been out of her element bewildered ashamed and so when pilgrims bound thither asked her with a smile will you come with us she shivered slightly and then hastily replied no no but how i should like to were i a little bird her reverie alone was that little travelling bird with rapid flight and noiseless wings which continually went on pilgrimage to the grotto in her dreams indeed she must have continually lived at lourdes though in the flesh she had not even gone there for either her father's or her mother's funeral yet she loved her kin she was anxious to procure work for her relations who had remained poor and she had insisted on seeing her eldest brother who coming to nevers to complain had been refused admission to the convent however he found her weary and resigned and she did not ask him a single question about new lourdes as though that rising town were no longer her own the year of the crowning of the virgin a priest whom she had deputed to pray for her before the grotto came back and told her of the never-to-be-forgotten wonders of the ceremony the hundred thousand pilgrims who had flocked to it and the five-and-thirty bishops in golden vestments who had assembled in the resplendent basilica whilst listening she trembled with her customary little quiver of desire and anxiety and when the priest exclaimed ah if you had only seen that pomp she answered me i was much better here in my little corner in the infirmary they had robbed her of her glory her work shone forth resplendently amidst a continuous hosanna and she only tasted joy in forgetfulness in the gloom of the cloister where the opulent farmers of the grotto forgot her it was never the re-echoing solemnities that prompted her mysterious journeys the little bird of her soul only winged its lonesome flight to lourdes on days of solitude in the peaceful hours when no one could there disturb its devotions it was before the wild primitive grotto that she returned to kneel amongst the bushy eglantine as on the days when the garve was not walled in by a monumental quay and it was the old town that she visited at twilight when the cool perfumed breezes came down from the mountains the old painted and gilded semi-spanish church where she had made her first communion the old asylum so full of suffering where during eight years she had grown accustomed to solitude all that poor innocent old town whose every paving stone awoke old affections in her memory's depth and did bernadette ever extend the pilgrimage of her dreams as far as bartres 
probably at times when she sat in her invalid chair and let some pious book slip from her tired hands and closed her eyes bartres did appear to her lighting up the darkness of her view the little antique romanesque church with sky-blue nave and blood-red altar screens stood there amidst the tombs of the narrow cemetery then she would find herself once more in the house of the laguse in the large room on the left where the fire was burning and where in winter time such wonderful stories were told whilst the big clock gravely ticked the hours away at times the whole countryside spread out before her meadows without end giant chestnut trees beneath which you lost yourself deserted table-lands whence you descried the distant mountains the peak du midi and the peak de viscos soaring aloft as airy and as rose-coloured as dreams in a paradise such as the legends have depicted and afterwards afterwards came her free childhood when she scampered off whither she listed in the open air her lonely dreamy thirteenth year when with all the joy of living she wandered through the immensity of nature and now too perhaps she again beheld herself roaming in the tall grass among the hawthorn bushes beside the streams on a warm sunny day in june did she not picture herself grown with a lover of her own age whom she would have loved with all the simplicity and affection of her heart ah to be a child again to be free unknown happy once more to love afresh and to love differently the vision must have passed confusedly before her a husband who worshipped her children gaily growing up around her the life that everybody led the joys and sorrows that her own parents had known and which her children would have had to know in their turn but little by little all vanished and she again found herself in her chair of suffering imprisoned between four cold walls with no other desire than a longing one for a speedy death since she had been denied a share of the poor common happiness of this world bernadette's ailments increased each year it was in fact the commencement of her passion the passion of this new child messiah who had come to bring relief to the unhappy to announce to mankind the religion of divine justice and equality in the face of miracles which flouted the laws of impassable nature if she now rose it was only to drag herself from chair to chair for a few days at a time and then she would have a relapse and be again forced to take to her bed her sufferings became terrible her hereditary nervousness her asthma aggravated by cloister life had probably turned into phthisis she coughed frightfully each fit rending her burning chest and leaving her half dead to complete her misery caries of the right kneecap supervened a gnawing disease the shooting pains of which caused her to cry aloud her poor body to which dressings were continually being applied became one great sore which was irritated by the warmth of her bed by her prolonged sojourn between sheets whose friction ended by breaking her skin one and all pitied her those who beheld her martyrdom said that it was impossible to suffer more or with greater fortitude she tried some of the lured water but it brought her no relief lord almighty king why cure others and not cure her to save her soul then dost thou not save the souls of the others what an inexplicable selection how absurd that in the eternal evolution of worlds it should be necessary for this poor being to be tortured she sobbed and again and again said in order to keep up her courage heaven is at the end but how long is the end in coming there was ever the idea that suffering is the test that it is necessary to suffer upon earth if one would triumph elsewhere that suffering is indispensable enviable and blessed but is this not blasphemous o lord hast thou not created youth and joy is it thy wish that thy creatures should enjoy neither the sun nor the smiling nature which thou hast created nor the human affections with which thou hast endowed their flesh she dreaded the feeling of revolt which maddened her at times and wished also to strengthen herself against the disease which made her groan and she crucified herself in thought extending her arms so as to form a cross and unite herself to jesus her limbs against his limbs her mouth against his mouth streaming the while with blood like him and steeped like him in bitterness jesus died in three days but a longer agony fell to her who again brought redemption by pain who died to give others life when her bones ached with agony she would sometimes utter complaints but she reproached herself with them immediately oh how i suffer oh how i suffer but what happiness it is to bear this pain there can be no more frightful words words pregnant with a blacker pessimism happy to suffer o lord but why and to what unknown and senseless end where is the reason in this useless cruelty in this revolting glorification of suffering when from the whole of humanity there ascends but one desperate longing for health and happiness in the midst of her frightful sufferings however sister marie bernard took the final vows on september twenty two eighteen seventy eight 
twenty years had gone by since the blessed virgin had appeared to her visiting her as the angel had visited the virgin choosing her as the virgin had been chosen amongst the most lowly and the most candid that she might hide within her the secret of king jesus such was the mystical explanation of that election of suffering the raison d'etre of that being who was so harshly separated from her fellows weighed down by disease transformed into the pitiable field of every human affliction she was the garden enclosed that brings such pleasure to the gaze of the spouse he had chosen her then buried her in the death of her hidden life and even when the unhappy creature staggered beneath the weight of her cross her companions would say to her do you forget that the blessed virgin promised you that you should be happy not in this world but in the next and with renewed strength and striking her forehead she would answer forget no no it is here she only recovered temporary energy by means of this illusion of a paradise of glory into which she would enter escorted by seraphims to be forever and ever happy the three personal secrets which the blessed virgin had confided to her to arm her against evil must have been promises of beauty felicity and immortality in heaven what monstrous dupery if there were only the darkness of the earth beyond the grave if the blessed virgin of her dream were not there to meet her with the prodigious guerdons she had promised but bernadette had not a doubt she willingly undertook all the little commissions with which her companions naively entrusted her for heaven sister marie bernard you'll say this you'll say that to the almighty sister marie bernard you'll kiss my brother if you meet him in paradise sister marie bernard give me a little place beside you when i die and she obligingly answered each one have no fear i will do it ah all-powerful illusion delicious repose power ever reviving and consolatory and then came the last agony then came death on friday march twenty eighth eighteen seventy nine it was thought that she would not last the night she had a despairing longing for the tomb in order that she might suffer no more and live again in heaven and thus she obstinately refused to receive extreme unction saying that twice already it had cured her she wished in short that god would let her die for it was more than she could bear it would have been unreasonable to require that she should suffer longer yet she ended by consenting to receive the sacraments and her last agony was thereby prolonged for nearly three weeks the priest who attended her frequently said my daughter you must make the sacrifice of your life and one day quite out of patience she sharply answered him but father it is no sacrifice a terrible saying that also for it implied disgust at being furious contempt for existence and an immediate ending of her humanity had she had the power to suppress herself by a gesture it is true that the poor girl had nothing to regret that she had been compelled to banish everything from her life health joy and love so that she might leave it as one casts off a soiled worn tattered garment and she was right she condemned her useless cruel life when she said my passion will finish only at my death it will not cease until i enter into eternity and this idea of her passion pursued her attaching her more closely to the cross with her divine master she had induced them to give her a large crucifix she pressed it vehemently against her poor maidenly breast exclaiming that she would like to thrust it into her bosom and leave it there towards the end her strength completely forsook her and she could no longer grasp the crucifix with her trembling hands let it be tightly tied to me she prayed that i may feel it until my last breath the redeemer upon that crucifix was the only spouse that she was destined to know his bleeding kiss was to be the only one bestowed upon her womanhood diverted from nature's course the nuns took cords passed them under her aching back and fastened the crucifix so roughly to her bosom that it did indeed penetrate it at last death took pity upon her on easter monday she was seized with a great fit of shivering hallucinations perturbed her she trembled with fright she beheld the devil jeering and prowling around her be off be off satan she gasped do not touch me do not carry me away and amidst her delirium she related that the fiend had sought to throw himself upon her that she had felt his mouth scorching her with all the flames of hell the devil in a life so pure in a soul without sin what for o lord and again i ask it why this relentless suffering intense to the very last why this nightmare-like ending this death troubled by such frightful fancies after so beautiful a life of candour purity and innocence could she not fall asleep serenely in the peacefulness of her chaste soul but doubtless so long as breath remained in her body it was necessary to leave her the hatred and dread of life which is the devil it was life which menaced her and it was life which she cast out 
in the same way as she denied life when she reserved to the celestial bridegroom her tortured crucified womanhood that dogma of the immaculate conception which her dream had come to strengthen was a blow dealt by the church to woman both wife and mother to decree that woman is only worthy of worship on condition that she be a virgin to imagine this virgin to be herself born without sin is not this an insult to nature the condemnation of life the denial of womanhood whose true greatness consists in perpetuating life be off be off satan let me die without fulfilling nature's law and she drove the sunshine from the room and the free air that entered by the window the air that was sweet with the scent of flowers laden with all the floating germs which transmit love throughout the whole vast world on the wednesday after easter april sixteenth the death agony commenced it is related that on the morning of that day one of bernadette's companions a nun attacked with a mortal illness and lying in the infirmary in an adjoining bed was suddenly healed upon drinking a glass of lured water but she the privileged one had drunk of it in vain god at last granted her the signal favour which she desired by sending her into the good sound sleep of the earth in which there is no more suffering she asked pardon of every one her passion was consummated like the saviour she had the nails and the crown of thorns the scourged limbs the pierced side like him she raised her eyes to heaven extended her arms in the form of a cross and uttered a loud cry my god and like him she said towards three o'clock i thirst she moistened her lips in the glass then bowed her head and expired thus very glorious and very holy died the visionary of lourdes bernadette soubirou sister marie bernard one of the sisters of charity of nevers during three days her body remained exposed to view and vast crowds passed before it a whole people hastened to the convent an interminable procession of devotees hungering after hope who rubbed medals chaplets pictures and missals against the dead woman's dress to obtain from her one more favour a fetish bringing happiness even in death her dream of solitude was denied her a mob of the wretched ones of this world rushed to the spot drinking in illusion around her coffin and it was noticed that her left eye the eye which at the time of the apparitions had been nearest the blessed virgin remained obstinately open then a last miracle amazed the convent the body underwent no change but was interred on the third day still supple warm with red lips and a very white skin rejuvenated as it were and smelling sweet and to-day bernadette soubirou exiled from lourdes obscurely sleeps her last sleep at saint gildard beneath a stone slab in a little chapel amidst the shade and silence of the old trees of the garden whilst yonder the grotto shines resplendently in all its triumph pierre ceased speaking the beautiful marvellous story was ended and yet the whole carriage was still listening deeply impressed by that death at once so tragic and so touching compassionate tears fell from marie's eyes while the others elise rouquet la grivotte herself now calmer clasped their hands and prayed to her who was in heaven to intercede with the divinity to complete their cure monsieur sabatier made a big sign of the cross and then ate a cake which his wife had bought him at poitiers monsieur de guersin whom sad things always upset had fallen asleep again in the middle of the story and there was only madame vincent with her face buried in her pillow who had not stirred like a deaf and blind creature determined to see and hear nothing more meanwhile the train rolled still rolled along madame de jonquiere after putting her head out of the window informed them that they were approaching etampes and when they had left that station behind them sister hyacinthe gave the signal and they recited the third chaplet of the rosary the five glorious mysteries the resurrection of our lord the ascension of our lord the mission of the holy ghost the assumption of the most blessed virgin and the crowning of the most blessed virgin and afterwards they sang the canticle o virgin in thy help i put my trust then pierre fell into a deep reverie his glance had turned towards the now sunlit landscape the continual flight of which seemed to lull his thoughts the noise of the wheels was making him dizzy and he ended by no longer recognizing the familiar horizon of this vast suburban expanse with which he had once been acquainted they still had to pass bretigny and juvisy and then in an hour and a half at the utmost they would at last be at paris so the great journey was finished the inquiry which he had so much desired to make the experiment which he had attempted with so much passion were over he had wished to acquire certainty to study bernadette's case on the spot and see if grace would not come back to him in a lightning flash restoring him his faith and now he had settled the point 
bernadette had dreamed through the continual torments of her flesh and he himself would never believe again and this forced itself upon his mind like a brutal fact the simple faith of the child who kneels and prays the primitive faith of young people bowed down by an awe born of their ignorance was dead though thousands of pilgrims might each year go to lourdes the nations were no longer with them this attempt to bring about the resurrection of absolute faith the faith of dead and gone centuries without revolt or examination was fatally doomed to fail history never retraces its steps humanity cannot return to childhood times have too much changed too many new inspirations have sown new harvests for the men of today to become once more like the men of olden time it was decisive lourdes was only an explainable accident whose reactionary violence was even a proof of the extreme agony in which belief under the antique form of catholicism was struggling never again as in the cathedrals of the twelfth century would the entire nation kneel like a docile flock in the hands of the master to blindly obstinately cling to the attempt to bring that to pass would mean to dash oneself against the impossible to rush perhaps towards great moral catastrophes and of his journey there already only remained to pierre an immense feeling of compassion ah his heart was overflowing with pity his poor heart was returning wrung by all that he had seen he recalled the words of worthy abbe Juden, and he had seen those thousands of unhappy beings praying weeping and imploring god to take pity on their suffering and he had wept with them and felt within himself like an open wound a sorrowful fraternal feeling for all their ailments he could not think of those poor people without burning with a desire to relieve them if the faith of the simple-minded no longer sufficed if one ran the risk of going astray in wishing to turn back would it become necessary to close the grotto and preach other efforts other sufferings however his compassion revolted at that thought no no it would be a crime to snatch their dream of heaven from those poor creatures who suffered either in body or in mind and who only found relief in kneeling yonder amidst the splendour of tapers and the soothing repetition of hymns he had not taken the murderous course of undeceiving marie but had sacrificed himself in order to leave her the joy of her fancy the divine consolation of having been healed by the virgin where was the man hard enough cruel enough to prevent the lowly from believing to rob them of the consolation of the supernatural the hope that god troubled himself about them that he held a better life in his paradise in reserve for them all humanity was weeping desperate with anguish like some despairing invalid irrevocably condemned and whom only a miracle could save he felt mankind to be unhappy indeed and he shuddered with fraternal affection in the presence of such pitiable humility ignorance poverty in its rags disease with its sores and evil odour all the lowly sufferers in hospital convent and slums amidst vermin and dirt with ugliness and imbecility written on their faces an immense protest against health life and nature in the triumphal name of justice equality and benevolence no no it would never do to drive the wretched to despair lourdes must be tolerated in the same way that you tolerate a falsehood which makes life possible and as he had already said in bernadette's chamber she remained the martyr she it was who revealed to him the only religion which still filled his heart the religion of human suffering ah to be good and kindly to alleviate all ills to lull pain to sleep in a dream to lie even so that no one might suffer any more the train passed at full speed through a village and pierre vaguely caught sight of a church nestling amidst some large apple trees all the pilgrims in the carriage crossed themselves but he was now becoming uneasy scruples were tinging his reverie with anxiety this religion of human suffering this redemption by pain was not this yet another lure a continual aggravation of pain and misery it is cowardly and dangerous to allow superstition to live to tolerate it and accept it is to revive the dark evil ages afresh it weakens and stupefies the sanctimoniousness bequeathed by heredity produces humiliated timorous generations decadent and docile nations who are an easy prey to the powerful of the earth whole peoples are imposed upon robbed devoured when they have devoted the whole effort of their will to the mere conquest of a future existence would it not therefore be better to boldly cure humanity at once by closing the miraculous grottos whither it goes to weep and thus restore to it the courage to live the real life even in the midst of tears and it was the same with prayer that incessant flood of prayer which ascended from lourdes the endless supplication in which he had been immersed and softened was it not after all but puerile lullaby a debasement of one's energies it benumbed the will 
one's very being became dissolved in it and acquired disgust for life and action of what use could it be to will anything do anything when you totally resigned yourself to the caprices of an unknown almighty power and in another respect what a strange thing was this mad desire for prodigies this anxiety to drive the divinity to transgress the laws of nature established by himself in his infinite wisdom therein evidently lay peril and unreasonableness at the risk even of losing illusion that divine comforter only the habit of personal effort and the courage of truth should have been developed in man and especially in the child then a great brightness arose in pierre's mind and dazzled him it was reason protesting against the glorification of the absurd and the deposition of common sense ah reason it was through her that he had suffered through her alone that he was happy as he had told dr chassaigne his one consuming longing was to satisfy reason ever more and more although it might cost him happiness to do so it was reason he now well understood it whose continual revolt at the grotto at the basilica throughout entire lourdes had prevented him from believing unlike his old friend that stricken old man who was afflicted with such dolorous senility who had fallen into second childhood since the shipwreck of his affections he had been unable to kill reason and humiliate and annihilate himself reason remained his sovereign mistress and she it was who buoyed him up even amidst the obscurities and failures of science whenever he met with a thing which he could not understand it was she who whispered to him there is certainly a natural explanation which escapes me he repeated that there could be no healthy ideal outside the march towards the discovery of the unknown the slow victory of reason amidst all the wretchedness of body and mind in the clashing of the twofold heredity which he had derived from his father all brain and his mother all faith he a priest found it possible to ravage his life in order that he might keep his vows he had acquired strength enough to master his flesh but he felt that his paternal heredity had now definitely gained the upper hand for henceforth the sacrifice of his reason had become an impossibility this he would not renounce and would not master no no even human suffering the hallowed suffering of the poor ought not to prove an obstacle enjoining the necessity of ignorance and folly reason before all in her alone lay salvation if at lord whilst bathed in tears softened by the sight of so much affliction he had said that it was sufficient to weep and love he had made a dangerous mistake pity was but a convenient expedient one must live one must act reason must combat suffering unless it be desired that the latter should last for ever however as the train rolled on and the landscape flew by a church once more appeared this time on the fringe of heaven some votive chapel perched upon a hill and surmounted by a lofty statue of the virgin and once more all the pilgrims made the sign of the cross and once more pierre's reverie strayed a fresh stream of reflections bringing his anguish back to him what was this imperious need of the things beyond which tortured suffering humanity whence came it why should equality and justice be desired when they did not seem to exist in impassive nature man had set them in the unknown spheres of the mysterious in the supernatural realms of religious paradises and there contented his ardent thirst that unquenchable thirst for happiness had ever consumed him and would consume him always if the fathers of the grotto drove such a glorious trade it was simply because they made money out of what was divine that thirst for the divine which nothing had quenched through the long long ages seemed to have returned with increased violence at the close of our century of science lourdes was a resounding and undeniable proof that man could never live without the dream of a sovereign divinity re-establishing equality and recreating happiness by dint of miracles when man has descended to the depths of life's misfortunes he returns to the divine illusion and the origin of all religions lies there man weak and bare lacks the strength to live his terrestrial misery without the everlasting lie of a paradise today thought pierre the experiment had been made it seemed that science alone could not suffice and that one would be obliged to leave a door open on the mysterious all at once in the depths of his deeply absorbed mind the words rang out a new religion the door which must be left open on the mysterious was indeed a new religion to subject mankind to brutal amputation lop off its dream and forcibly deprive it of the marvellous which it needed to live as much as it needed bread would possibly kill it would it ever have the philosophical courage to take life as it is and live it for its own sake without any idea of future rewards and penalties it certainly seemed that centuries must elapse before the advent of a society wise enough to lead a life of rectitude 
without the moral control of some cultus and the consolation of superhuman equality and justice yes a new religion the call burst forth resounded within pierre's brain like the call of the nations the eager despairing desire of the modern soul the consolation and hope which catholicism had brought the world seemed exhausted after eighteen hundred years full of so many tears so much blood so much vain and barbarous agitation it was an illusion departing and it was at least necessary that the illusion should be changed if mankind had long ago darted for refuge into the christian paradise it was because that paradise then opened before it like a fresh hope but now a new religion a new hope a new paradise yes that was what the world thirsted for in the discomfort in which it was struggling and father fourcade for his part fully felt such to be the case he had not meant to imply anything else when he had given rein to his anxiety entreating that the people of the great towns the dense mass of the humble which forms the nation might be brought to lourdes one hundred thousand two hundred thousand pilgrims at lourdes each year that was after all but a grain of sand it was the people the whole people that was required but the people has forever deserted the churches it no longer puts any soul in the blessed virgins which it manufactures and nothing nowadays could restore its lost faith a catholic democracy yes history would then begin afresh only were it possible to create a new christian people would not the advent of a new saviour the mighty breath of a new messiah have been needed for such a task however the words still sounded still rang out in pierre's mind with the growing clamour of pealing bells a new religion a new religion doubtless it must be a religion nearer to life giving a larger place to the things of the world and taking the acquired truths into due account and above all it must be a religion which was not an appetite for death bernadette living solely in order that she might die dr chassaigne aspiring to the tomb as to the only happiness for all that spiritualistic abandonment was so much continuous disorganization of the will to live at bottom of it was hatred of life disgust with and cessation of action every religion it is true is but a promise of immortality an embellishment of the spheres beyond an enchanted garden to be entered on the morrow of death could a new religion ever place that garden of eternal happiness on earth where was the formula the dogma that would satisfy the hopes of the mankind of to-day what belief could be sown to blossom forth in a harvest of strength and peace how could one fecundate the universal doubt so that it should give birth to a new faith and what sort of illusion what divine falsehood of any kind could be made to germinate in the contemporary world ravaged as it has been upon all sides broken up by a century of science at that moment without any apparent transition pierre saw the face of his brother guillaume arise in the troublous depths of his mind still he was not surprised some secret link must have brought that vision there ah how fond they had been of one another long ago and what a good brother that elder brother so upright and gentle had been henceforth alas the rupture was complete pierre no longer saw guillaume since the latter had cloistered himself in his chemical studies living like a savage in a little suburban house with a mistress and two big dogs then pierre's reverie again diverged and he thought of that trial in which guillaume had been mentioned like one suspected of having compromising friendships amongst the most violent revolutionaries it was related too that the young man had after long researches discovered the formula of a terrible explosive one pound of which would suffice to blow up a cathedral and pierre then thought of those anarchists who wished to renew and save the world by destroying it they were but dreamers horrible dreamers yet dreamers in the same way as those innocent pilgrims whom he had seen kneeling at the grotto in an enraptured flock if the anarchists if the extreme socialists demanded with violence the equality of wealth the sharing of all the enjoyments of the world the pilgrims on their side demanded with tears equality of health and an equitable sharing of moral and physical peace the latter relied on miracles the former appealed to brute force at bottom however it was but the same exasperated dream of fraternity and justice the eternal desire for happiness neither poor nor sick left but bliss for one and all and in fact had not the primitive christians been terrible revolutionaries for the pagan world which they threatened and did indeed destroy they who were persecuted whom the others sought to exterminate are today inoffensive because they have become the past the frightful future is ever the man who dreams of a future society even as today it is the madman so wildly bent on social renovation that he harbours the great black dream of purifying everything by the flame of conflagrations this seemed monstrous to pierre yet who could tell therein perchance lay the rejuvenated world of tomorrow 
astray full of doubts he nevertheless in his horror of violence made common cause with old society now reduced to defend itself unable though he was to say whence would come the new messiah of gentleness in whose hands he would have liked to place poor ailing mankind a new religion yes a new religion but it is not easy to invent one and he knew not to what conclusion to come between the ancient faith which was dead and the young faith of to-morrow as yet unborn for his part in his desolation he was only sure of keeping his vow like an unbelieving priest watching over the belief of others chastely and honestly discharging his duties with the proud sadness that he had been unable to renounce his reason as he had renounced his flesh and for the rest he would wait however the train rolled on between large parks and the engine gave a prolonged whistle a joyful flourish which drew pierre from his reflections the others were stirring displaying emotion around him the train had just left juvisy and paris was at last near at hand within a short half hour's journey one and all were getting their things together the sabatiers were remaking their little parcels elise rouquet was giving a last glance at her mirror for a moment madame de jonquiere again became anxious concerning la grivotte and decided that as the girl was in such a pitiful condition she would have her taken straight to a hospital on arriving whilst marie endeavoured to rouse madame vincent from the torpor in which she seemed determined to remain Monsieur de Gersin, who had been indulging in a little siesta, also had to be awakened. And at last, when Sister Hyacinthe had clapped her hands, the whole carriage intonated the Te Deum, the hymn of praise and thanksgiving. Te Deum laudamus, te Dominum confitemur. The voices rose amidst a last burst of fervour. All those glowing souls returned thanks to God for the beautiful journey, the marvellous favours that he had already bestowed on them, and would bestow on them yet again at last came the fortifications the two o'clock sun was slowly descending the vast pure heavens so serenely warm distant smoke a ruddy smoke was rising in light clouds above the immensity of paris like the scattered flying breath of that toiling colossus it was paris in her forge paris with her passions her battles her ever growling thunder her ardent life ever engendering the life of to-morrow and the white train the woeful train of every misery and every dolor was returning into it all at full speed sounding in higher and higher strains the piercing flourishes of its whistle calls the five hundred pilgrims the three hundred patients were about to disappear in the vast city fall again upon the hard pavement of life after the prodigious dream in which they had just indulged until the day should come when their need of the consolation of a fresh dream would impel them to start once more on the everlasting pilgrimage to mystery and forgetfulness ah oh, unhappy mankind poor ailing humanity hungering for illusion and in the weariness of this waning century distracted and sore from having too greedily acquired science it fancies itself abandoned by the physicians of both the mind and the body and in great danger of succumbing to incurable disease retraces its steps and asks the miracle of its cure of the mystical lourdes of a past for ever dead yonder however bernadette the new messiah of suffering so touching in her human reality constitutes the terrible lesson the sacrifice cut off from the world the victim condemned to abandonment solitude and death smitten with the penalty of being neither woman nor wife nor mother because she beheld the blessed virgin end of section twenty five end of lourdes by emil zola translated by ernest visitelli